Welcome, everyone. Thank you to my guest, Jay Nightmares, for joining me this episode. I hope you're ready for this. I was once canoeing the boundary waters between Minnesota and Canada. These aren't your normal backyard ponds. The boundary waters are thousands of enormous lakes interconnected with each other. Think many great lakes. We'd been canoeing and camping along the lakes for about a week at this point. We didn't really have an itinerary, just planned a boat and camp, fish, and live off the land for two weeks. We had a GPS and sat phone to call a helicopter for pickup whenever we were done. Anyway, about a week in and we were set to canoe for a few hours to the next lake. An hour or so in, and we're in the center of an extremely long and narrow lake. Unfortunately, a storm started to blow in, and the waves on the lake swelled to two plus feet. Too much for our dinky canoes. We pull off to a random clearing on the shore, and set up camp in a rush to avoid being totally thrashed by a rainstorm. We just set up camp and hunkered down for the night. By the next morning, it had cleared up. We started walking up the coast of the lake, about 200 feet from our camp, looking for a good fishing spot. What we actually found was another campsite. However, it was absolutely wrecked. Trash strewn everywhere, tent collapsed and torn, clothes on the ground. At first, we were just like disgusted. What asshole did this or left their stuff out to be barefoot? The more we looked around though, the weirder things seemed. For one, their garbage was still hoisted into a tree to keep it safe from bears, but the whole bag was ripped open despite it being 30 feet in the air. Second, literally everything except the canoes was still at the campsite. Clothes, packs, food, rope, pans. Like a serious set of hiking equipment. Enough for two or three people. Half of it was trashed and torn open. Mostly the packs, tent and clothes. The other half was totally untouched but thrown on the ground like somebody noped the hell out of there in nothing but their long johns, ditching hundreds of dollars of gear in the process. We waited a couple of hours and eventually called it back to our helicopter crew, but they hadn't been aware of anybody else or gotten any distress calls. We eventually just left everything and moved camp. Everybody was pretty upset by it, and a day or two later, we ended the whole trip early because it seemed like nobody wanted to be out there anymore. It was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen. First thought was a bear attack, but there was food left uneaten, and I've seen bear attacks on camps before, but nothing like this. Bears rip open packs and go after food, and are generally pretty easy to scare away. What still sticks with me is why all their clothes and packs were still there with half being totally destroyed and the other half being untouched. I still don't get it. I've done a lot of other camping and hiking, rafting and biking, all around the country, and I've never had any other weird experiences like that. I experienced my creepy, middle-of-nowhere story while driving a bus in the desert of central Australia. I was over 500 kilometers from the nearest town, so yeah, middle-of-nowhere stuff. I was out on a five-day charter to pick up a bunch of Aboriginal elder women to go and get their women's business health checks done. On the day, we went via a place called Mintabi so they could shop in the clothing store and whatever store that's randomly in this little opal mining area of South Australia. We left from there quite late to make the three or so hour journey back to where we were all staying overnight. The next day, I take them back to their respective desert communities. The passengers all fell asleep as it had a very long day. Even the nurse who was traveling with us fell asleep. So there's me all alone in the cab of the Mercedes truck derived bus, 
My thirty passengers, all sleeping in the darkness of the passenger pod behind the cab, and it was around 9pm. Up ahead in the distance, I see a headlight coming towards me along the lonely desert dirt road. So I dip my lights so the spotlights go off and adjust to see only what low beam will show me. I drive down into a slight dip of a dry creek bed, expecting to see the car with only one headlight any time shortly. It's nothing unusual to see a car with only one headlight out there, so I'm not even remotely bothered. As I come out of the dip, I put my spotlights and high beams back on, and there is no car. No nothing. Just the empty dirt road. There's no dust in the air, and I can see a good distance in front of me and out to each side. There was nothing there. Just the empty desert. The dirt road and me alone in the cab. I keep the lights on until we come to a stop about an hour later. I didn't see any cars or anything the rest of the journey. Before I let the passengers out, I ask any of them if they saw the light, and they all go dead silent. And after a short while, they start talking in their own language hurriedly, and then they all get off the bus. A few minutes later, a couple of ladies come up to me and ask me to tell them exactly what I saw, without leaving anything out, and to describe exactly where I saw it. Now, I'm a big guy, I lived on three continents. I've been a police officer, a teacher, bus and coach driver, truck driver, all sorts of things. Let's just say that I'm pretty skeptical, but I do have an open mind. I'm not scared by much in this world. After I told the ladies everything from start to finish and describe in minute detail exactly where it happened, the two ladies looked at me with their eyes wide. They looked spooked and they said, and I'll never forget the way they said it. Driver, we're so lucky that you did not stop, because if you did, no one would have ever seen us ever again. We'd all be gone. I asked why, and they just shook their heads and said not to talk about it, because it had scared all the ladies. I'm sure many people have heard about the Min Min Lights in western Queensland, Whatever these ladies knew about whatever I saw in our location, they were convinced that it wasn't something you wanted to meet in a desert at night. I only ever saw this once. I only saw it for maybe a minute, and it just looked like a car headlight a couple of kilometers away up the road. But I'll tell you what, if the ladies that come from this area, and whose people have survived in this desolate, remote part of the continent, for 60,000 years are worried to the point of all being scared. I certainly don't want to mess with whatever it is. My cousin is with the Forest Service in the Montana, Wyoming area and I decided to go up there with her to literally test the waters. She does hydrology and has to ride out to the middle of nowhere to test streams and snow runoff to ensure no contaminants. So I thought that sounded fun and wanted to do a bit of a tour with her. We were going to have to camp out there for two nights, so we packed up all of our gear in saddlebags and started out. The first day and night was amazing beautiful scenery and amazing air quality. It really is so peaceful out there. I love that area and wish I got to go up there more often. Anyway, we started out on the second day and my cousin said, you want to see something weird? Of course I said yes. So she led me to a bit of a side journey into this tiny little ravine. We ended up traveling two hours away from our actual path we'd laid out. At the very end of this fold in the land, she dismounts and tells me to get off my horse too. We tie them up in this gorgeous little clearing and she tells me to follow this tiny wildlife path and to bring our little rechargeable radio. It's one of those you can plug in or wind up 
and it also acts as a lantern if you really need it to, but that kills the batteries quickly. I do, and out in the middle of nowhere, there's a huge coil of wire sticking out of the ground. The wire itself was not weirdly large, like some buried transmission wire, but small, like 10 or 12 gauge wiring for a house. They trailed off into the brush and trees, so naturally, I decided to follow the damn thing out of curiosity. My cousin trails behind me as I do, and this wire, after coming straight up from the ground, is strung across the limbs of trees, then back to the ground. Then it snakes around rocks and finally deadens into an outlet. That outlet is mounted on the side of a desk. It looks like a school teacher's desk from when I was growing up with a metal base and a pseudo wood plastic top thing. No chair, no building, no nothing. Just this outlet and this desk. I'm staring, confused as hell, at this desk in the middle of the forest. When my cousin takes the radio, pulls out the cord, and plugs it into the outlet, it lit up and started blaring static. The wire was being fed from somewhere, now, the place where we were had no road access, no buildings for many miles, and no other people around. And yet, there was a live outlet. It was weird. I live in Kansas and have driven that west stretch many times on my way to Colorado. It's absolutely nothing for so long, and the few tiny towns you do pass are mostly run down nothings as well. I've never had to drive it in the dark, but I would easily get spooked, and for whatever reason, we seem to have a lot of people in this stupid state that like to mess with you late at night on the interstate if you're the only two cars around. Three significant times I remember where one of those assholes would pass me, slow down in front of me until I had to pass them, for them to then speed back up, stay beside me for long, get back in front of me, and repeat until we came across another car, and they started on them while I fly forward to get away. I had someone once follow me into a toll line where several others were open and empty, I had a K-Tag and the worker waved me through, but I stopped and told her the vehicle behind me had been following me for miles and miles, how they were passing and slowing down, and now followed me into this lane. She told me they didn't have a K-Tag, so she would make sure to take her time in getting their money to give me time to get ahead. Well, they then come back up and go into another lane. She tells me to sit and wait for them to drive on, and turned on the red X so no other cars would come behind me. The other car waited about two minutes, just sitting there. The lady called the other worker in the stand and told them to get them out because they'd been following me, and they were being really sketchy. They finally pulled off and drove slowly down the highway. I sat at her toll for about five more minutes. I got off on the very first exit and went through town to get to a road that led to my home a few miles outside of town, because I was afraid that car may have pulled over on the highway ahead to wait for me. This was about two in the morning also. Fuck people who do that shit. It's extremely creepy and unsettling. I used to deliver hotshot freight across the Great Plains, Minnesota area. One night around 2 a.m., I was hauling across North Dakota trying to reach Montana by morning. I was delivering a particularly valuable tractor part that a farm desperately needed for the following day. I began to notice some highway hypnosis sneaking up on me, but it didn't really bother me because I'd been through it a hundred times before. Anyone who's driven across North Dakota knows that it's incredibly flat, like really flat. There also tends to be very straight and long roads, 
it's somewhat easy to see things on the road that are far away, even at night. I noticed something large on the road, spanning my entire lane, approximately half a mile in front of me. I slowed down a bit and prepared to move in the opposite lane, thinking it was some retread off a blown tire. As I got closer, I noticed it was two people, laying head to toe across the entire lane. I swerved into the other lane, successfully avoiding them, and came to an almost complete stop but they didn't move. Not an inch. I was just about to back up and check on them when I remembered a story that an old graybeard colleague of mine told me. He told me that in certain remote areas, people will lie down in the middle of the road and wait for a car or truck to stop and see what's going on. And at that point, the road layers along with whoever else is hiding in the nearby bushes will beat the shit out of the driver and steal his vehicle, leaving him in the middle of nowhere. I decided not to back up, and when the two people in the road saw me put my truck back in gear and drive away, they both got up and walked toward the shoulder. I called the police and explained what had happened, but we were so far away from civilization that I doubt anything came of it. Thanks to that old grey beard, I got to keep my truck, my job, and my teeth. I was driving on a cross-country road trip through the middle of nowhere, Kansas, when one of my tires blew out. I pulled over and went to call AAA but I had no service on my phone. So I got out and started the process of trying to change the tire myself. After a very short while, a cop pulled up and asked if I needed help. I said, yes, thank you, officer. And he said, cause you're in luck. It just so happens I know the best tow truck driver. He could take you into town and get you all fixed up, no problem. The mosquitoes were eating me alive. And frankly, I only had a donut-style replacement tire and no clue how to properly change it. So I said, yes please, and the officer gave the tow truck a call. After another short while, the tow truck arrived and the officer left. The driver asked, where am I towing you to? So I said, I'm not sure, to town I guess, somewhere where I can get my tire fixed. He said, well you're in luck, cause I know the guy at the only place that's open right now who can fix that for you. I said, okay, sounds good, and he towed us to the auto repair place. This was basically a ghost town, if you could even call it a town. The tow truck driver and the repair guy sat around and bullshitted for a couple of hours while my tire was being fixed. Bear in mind, there was nobody else there but me and my passengers. There was nobody else anywhere within sight. The town was empty, except for the gas station connected to the repair place. Finally, they came out and said I was all set and gave me both my bills. $1,200 in total, for one tire and a five-mile tow. For a 1991 Grand Am that wasn't even worth that much. I was furious, but had no options. So I gave him my credit card and he said, Sorry guy, we're a cash only kind of town. I said, Okay then, well I don't have any cash on me, so how are we going to settle this up? Well, you're in luck, because there's an ATM next door at the gas station my buddy owns he said. So I went to the gas station and took out the maximum I could on four different cards, each with a $20 withdrawal fee. I looked behind the counter and in addition to the gas station attendant, there stood the cop, the tow truck driver, and the repair guy, all munching on Doritos and having a good laugh. I'm pretty sure I got hosed and potentially maybe even sabotaged. Looking back, that cop sure arrived really quickly, 
and my other three tires were all still relatively new. I had to cut my trip short and invest in cortisone cream for the million mosquito bites. So back when I was younger, I was kind of a terrible kid to deal with. Being totally unmanageable, as well as being a child of two narcissists, the decision was made that I would work on a huge ranch deep into the sticks of Arizona. There were some actually really good things to come of this, but I digress. On cattle drives, it was not unusual to stumble upon horses, encampments, and even whole towns, also in the middle of nowhere. These all had their own movie-like situations that came out of them, but one in particular I will never forget. Here we are on another cattle drive, this time pretty far into it. We've been out in the desert, if I remember correctly, easily three or more weeks, when we stumble upon this town in the middle of the canyon. That is picture perfect, and in addition there's a diner. It's like an old, totally chromed out East Coast diner. We had not eaten anything of real substance for a while, and the head wrangler promised me a milkshake for my birthday. I was beyond stoked, if not a little weirded out. But honestly, after you spend enough time in the wilderness of the US, nothing really surprises me. So we leave behind some of our mates to watch the cattle who are resting in the shade after getting over this rocky wash and a hike into the canyon to go to the diner. The second we set foot in the diner, the head guy, this older cowboy who's the head of all of us, grabs my arm. This place is packed and everyone is wearing odd clothing, like stuff from maybe the 40s or 50s. My head wrangler is a really tough guy who's been ranching for his entire life and he's definitely seen some stuff. T grabs my arm when I realize everyone is just staring at us, and there's a really strange feeling in the air. Now, we were used to getting looks all the time from being smelly and dirty, but these people looked almost in fear and shock. T and two others with us slowly back out of the diner, dragging me in tow, and we immediately go back to our site and leave without a word. I was so confused, I just went along with all of it. To this day, I have no idea what that place was, or if we stumbled through a time warp or what, but my wrangler told me later that night, when we were away from them, that he felt like we stepped back in time. Like truly stepped back in time. And that place was stuck in some sort of loop. And if we stayed, we would get stuck too. T never really spoke a lot, nor was he to be messed with. He also had a mean sweet tooth despite having almost no teeth, so for him to have reacted that way really shook me. I have no idea if what he told me was true, but I will never forget the look of all those people and that immaculate diner. I'm an airline pilot and I have two stories to share. In the air, probably the creepiest thing I've heard was the distress call of a small general aviation aircraft going down. This was around 2014 in the Pacific Northwest. He'd just blown a cylinder head and oil was shooting out all over his windshield. You could hear the panic in his voice as he radioed out that he couldn't see and was trying to report his position to a few airliners so they could relay it to ATC. I checked the news that night, and he actually died in the crash. It was a pretty eerie feeling that we'd heard the last words of a pilot fighting for his life, while we were just cruising along above the clouds at 35,000 feet, completely powerless to do anything other than to reach out to him over the radio. For my second story, one of the creepiest destinations I've flown to was Ciudad Juarez. 
Me and two flight attendants were bored on an El Paso layover, so we decided to get drinks around 11pm. We drank until the bars closed at 2, and on the way out, we asked the bartender if anything else was still open. Not unless you want to go to Ciudad Juarez, he joked. I looked at the flight attendants. We shrugged, nodded, and said, Okay. He was shocked that we took him seriously. We walked the short distance back to the hotel, grabbed our passports, and set out for Mexico. Before we left, I asked the flight attendants, who were both women, if they were sure they were okay with this. Yes, yeah, sure, as long as you're coming too. Liquid courage had finally overruled any fears of being kidnapped or beheaded. And off we went. So we walked 20 minutes south to the border. El Paso was completely dead quiet, aside from a few homeless people. Some of them were stumbling around and clearly under the influence of drugs. But none of them bothered us. We reached the Mexican border, and the guards took an extra second to look at the three crazy gringos before waving us through. It was close to 3 a.m. at this point, and we were three twenty-somethings wandering around the streets of Ciudad Juarez at night. I'm not sure how much you know about this place, but it isn't exactly safe at night, especially for non-locals. The streets were pretty empty, and not a single bar was open. But everyone we passed stopped mid-conversation and stared at us as we walked by. The flight attendants were getting nervous and they were walking so close to me that we were brushing up against each other. After determining that everything within realistic distance of the border was closed, we turned around to head back to the US. We'd probably been in Ciudad Juarez for around an hour and somehow managed to navigate down the dark and deserted streets onto the same strip that we entered on. By this point, we were close enough to the border that there were a few street lights that were still on. All of a sudden, two locals stumbled out from the dark sidewalks into the street, which we were walking down the middle of. As they came into the light, all three of us jumped at what we saw. A man and a woman, both with scarred faces, hunched backs, Excessive sweat, ripped clothing, and missing teeth were grinning as they approached us. The man was half speaking Spanish, half laughing. The startle factor of their approach, combined with their appearance, stands out as one of the biggest jump scares of my life. After realizing they weren't trying to kill us, yet, I figured, screw it, we'd come this far why not throw a Hail Mary? To my own disbelief, I actually tried to communicate with the man and asked if he knew of any bars that were open. By this point, the flight attendants were so terrified that each one latched themselves onto one of my arms. In any situation other than the one we were currently in, I'd have looked pretty cool. The man simply smiled, pointed behind him, and said, over there. There was a motel with the lights turned off, except for a steady red light on the front balcony and a light flickering from inside a room on the second floor. One of the flight attendants turned and said into my ear, No. Fuck no. We need to leave now. I thanked the man and woman for their time and we hightailed it to the US border. They gave us a thorough questioning, and rightfully so, as one man and two women crossing into the US at around 4am reeks of human trafficking. Weirdly, the number of people huddled on the streets of El Paso had doubled, and we sped walked back to our hotel. That layover definitely takes the cake for creepiest thing to happen in the middle of nowhere. I'm a biologist that has to do field work surveying unmaintained private properties in the middle of nowhere. Long story short, we find a body face up in a stream, deep in a thickly wooded wetland. 
The body looked several months old at least. No clothes, no tools, no shelter. Nothing nearby to suggest who he is or how he got there. We couldn't even tell race or gender from what we saw. We call the police and they immediately tell us it's probably the missing person who ditched his car nearby. They apparently searched for weeks with dogs, horses, and ATVs, but didn't find any sign of the guy. All they found was his family car loaded with cash and a handgun. They also tell us he seemed to be running from someone or something. Real or imagined, they weren't sure. Apparently, the man didn't even close his car door, just ditched it at the rail crossing and took off running into the woods in a tremendous hurry. I find his clothes about 30 yards up the stream bank from where the body was found. His pants were neatly folded and placed on top of his nice brown loafers, underpants and socks on top of those. He placed his glasses atop his socks, very orderly and in a nice pile. His shirt and undershirt were hanging from a tree branch right above those as if to dry. I mean, the whole thing creeps me out even a year on, but what unsettles me is the fact that he ran from his family, drove several hours from his home, ditched his car, and fought a mile through briars and thick woods, only to stop and carefully fold and hang his clothes before meeting his end. I look him up every now and then, and still can't find any more information about what happened or why. Trucker here. I think the best, creepy thing that has ever happened to me was when I was heading from Tucson, Arizona, up into Salt Lake City, Utah. Well, this was a few years ago, and the main highway had been taken out in a flash flood. It was under construction, so I had to take a weird detour through the mountains in lower Utah. It was getting late, and I was getting tired, so I pulled off onto the shoulder and went to sleep in my bunk. Now, this was in the middle of nowhere. The closest town was like 40 miles away, so it's completely pitch black outside once I turned the lights off. Anyway... Around 4 a.m. I wake up, because I'm hearing something messing with my trunk. It's like playing with the air and power cables between my cab and the trailer, which is literally six inches from where my head is at, but on the outside of the cab. Then I feel something climb onto the landing that's on the back of my truck, and it shakes my whole truck, so I'm guessing something around two to three hundred pounds was climbing around back there. I'm thinking like a mountain lion or a bear. At this point I'm wide the fuck awake, and I want to get this thing away from me. So I slam my hand into my cab wall, trying to scare whatever is out there. I slam hard enough to really make it loud. I then hear someone, a male, scream bloody murder. I hear them fall off the back of my truck. I then hear about 15 other people all around my truck yelling. I climb up front, turn on my lights, and illuminate a squad of army reserves doing their midnight rock march and capture drills. Turns out, these guys were supposed to find an abandoned truck and secure it for their midnight drills. That truck was three miles back down the road. They were not expecting me to be sleeping there and thought I was part of the drill. I'm ex-military so after explaining I was not part of their test, and legit was just out there out of coincidence, we laughed it off. They had to radio their CO and tell them I was there, and not have the other squads bother me. I'm not necessarily a trucker, but I'm a commercial delivery driver in a rural area in the Midwestern US. Randomly one day as I'm leaving our home store, the radio just stopped working in the store. We thought nothing of it and I left to start the day. 
and they just turned off the radio in the store and continued their day. I start the car, and boom, the radio wasn't working. But it wasn't working in every single station. So I thought that was weird and decided to go back into the store and ask them to see if it was that way on their radio. Same thing. I go out to my personal car. No radio. I call my fiancé and best friend, who are on the complete opposite side of the country, where it's not rural. No radio. I call my mom. Nothing on her end. Everyone I worked with called surrounding stores and customers, and they had nothing. It was a weird blackout. So I finally ended up leaving for the day's deliveries. I left the radio on in the background, even though it was static, just for some sort of noise. The volume was really low, but out of nowhere, a faint talking can be heard, and it was going in and out. It was a language I didn't recognize at all, and I honestly don't even know what to compare it to. It sounded like a female computerized voice. Oddly though, my store's radio caught it as well as they later told me they heard it too. After that, it was static again for a few hours. Then slowly, one by one, stations came back up. Now, this is so easy to probably have an explanation to, but the weirdest thing about it was that there was no media attention to it, and no radio station mentioned anything about the hours-long blackout. It was like it never happened. What freaks me out about this was the complete silence about it and how no one was given an explanation. This happened about two years ago. I just moved about an hour and a half away from home, the first time I'd lived away from home. I was working on a kid's activity camp all the staff lived in two massive cabins in the woods. There were about 40 people in each, two or three to a room, so you can't imagine how big this cabin was. Anyway, everybody became really close. Some people knew each other from previous years working at this particular camp. None of us really locked our doors because we all knew each other and everybody hung out in different friends' rooms all the time. On this camp, my job was working with the kids during the day and doing evening shifts on the bar, which was there for the staff and the teachers and the parents that had come with the children. One night, my roommate and I were both working an evening shift on the bar. She was finishing a couple of hours earlier as she was on a different shift. My roommate, Debs, decided that she was just going back to the room to read and wait for me to finish so we could watch a movie together. She'd been gone for about five minutes when my phone started ringing with her caller ID. I picked up the call, as the bar was pretty dead that night. The only people in there were staff. When I picked up the phone call, nobody was saying anything on the other end. I put this down to her just butt-dialing me by accident and hung up. About a minute later, I get another phone call from a friend that lived across the hallway from us. She told me that I needed to come back to the room now, so I asked the guy I was working with to cover while I popped back to the room quickly. I walked down the hallway and there were about five people just standing outside of my room. I walk inside and Debs is just standing there crying, which isn't at all like her. Our stuff is all over our room. Please note this is very weird because I'm pretty sure I have OCD. I often tidied my side and her side of the room, even if she didn't want me to. She went on to tell me that her phone had gone missing. I then asked her about phoning me before I came back to the room, and she had no idea what I was talking about. This meant someone had taken her phone and knew who to call straight away. Also, when she left work, there would be no point in stealing her phone as it was literally worthless. It was a $10 mobile at the most. A few days later, we started noticing that things had gone missing, but it wasn't normal things people would steal. They could have taken laptops, Kindles, a PlayStation and some games. Instead, 
All they took were my bra and knickers, some clean and some from the dirty washing. This made me feel sick, especially because we knew everyone that worked and lived there. For a few days, I kept getting these phone calls from Debs' phone with just silence on the other end. We obviously went and reported it, and our bosses said they would look into it. We kind of got blamed for leaving our door unlocked which I understand is being really stupid now. The creepy thing was, a few days later, I walked into the staff lounge, and Debs' phone was just placed on the windowsill. Nobody was in there, and nobody seemed to be around. Well, at that point, I noped out of there as fast as I could, and locked myself in my room until Debs came back. Nothing ever came out of it, and we never found out who it was but I definitely have a feeling it was someone that knew us quite well, and they knew when we would both be out of our room. For the life of me, I still don't know who stole my underwear, my roommate's phone, and who trashed our room, but I have definitely learned a lesson, and that's not to leave my door unlocked, because there are gross creepers out there. This happened one summer when I was 12 to 13. It was before cell phones were common. My mother rented a cabin that we would stay at four hours north of our home. My father could not attend due to the fact that he was working, but that was fine with him. We drove up to the cabin. It was cute enough from the outside. There were several cookie cutter cabins you could rent that all arched around in a C-shape with parking spots in front and at the front of the line of cabins was where the owner of the cabin stayed. In the front desk area, if you will. Anyway, when we first arrived, we were the only people there. No other cabins had been rented out, even though it was August, and this area, although semi-remote, is a tourist destination. The gentleman that worked at the front desk came out to greet us. I didn't pay too much attention, due to the fact I was 12 and excited for the fun outdoors adventure that my mother and I were going to have. Well, I remember him giving my mom the keys and saying, the bathroom window is broken and does not close all the way or lock. We thought it was strange, but kind of shrugged it off. After a day of adventure, we went out, came back in at dusk, and we went to bed. The next morning, Saturday, we woke up and went to get in the truck. It would not start. Strange. I will admit, at the time, it was a newer SUV. I don't recall what was wrong with it, but I remember the owner of the cabins coming out and saying, Oh, your truck is broke. Too bad. Let me call someone. My mom insisted she could call someone and went into his office and used the phone. She called someone to come and fix it. As we were waiting for someone to get there, the owner came out and said, Did you guys have any problems with the power last night? My mom and I shook our heads, confused. Oh, well, sometimes in that cabin, the power will randomly go out. All you have to do is come out here and flip the breaker. He then proceeded to show my mom where the breaker was. After getting the truck fixed, having another day of adventure, we came back, ready to settle in for the night. As we were sitting in bed watching television, the power went out. It didn't flicker, just boom, out. My mom grabbed a flashlight she'd packed, and we went out there and turned the breaker back on. At this point, we were feeling incredibly uneasy, like anyone would be. We got back in bed, and about ten minutes later, the power went out again. My mom jumped up and ran outside, only to see a man running away from the fuse box. We hightailed it out of there so fast. Luckily, everything had been packed because we were leaving the next day.
So I've been on Grinder for about 10 years, five of which were illegal and I'm not proud of it. I've had plenty of messed up experiences. This one in particular reminds me of a story when I was at a party without my car. My phone was on 10%, but a decently hot grinder guy said he could pick me up and that we could hang at his place before he drove me home. So of course I jumped on the opportunity. Anyway, we got to his place and he got me pretty drunk, but he never tried to make a move. I assumed he was going to wait and just convince me to stay the night later. Finally, my phone died after like two hours. I didn't even have to say anything before he noticed it was dead. Then he stood up and said, Well, let's go to the car then. When I asked if he had a charger I could use, he just said, No. After we got in the car, he got kind of quiet and less flirty. I spaced out, just enjoying his music and looking out of the window. I didn't even notice that he never asked where I lived, until I realized we'd been driving for over an hour. Not even towards my town, but into the canyons. It was Greater Salt Lake City, Utah area. I asked where he was going, and he just said, I thought we could just go for a drive. And my drunk ass was like, oh, okay. So anyway, to make a long story shorter, he ended up taking us four or five miles down a dirt road with no signs or houses until it dead-ended into this cabin with no lights on or cars outside. He parked and turned the car off. That's when the dread started to creep in as I sobered up. I said I drank too much and should probably head home, but he didn't even respond. He just sat there, staring at the cabin. Then he said, You said you like being kinky. You were pretty submissive, correct? Uh, sure. But I just meant like, normal rough kind of stuff. Nothing wild, I replied. He started sounding a bit annoyed, and his sentences seemed a little less carefully worded. Kind of like he was just spitting out the bare minimum of each thought. He said something about how some of his favorite people are those who can find pleasure in pain, and if someone goes into shock enough times, eventually it becomes like a drug and they crave more. And something about how pushing a person into the deep end is the fastest way to teach them to swim. At that point, I was scared enough to assert myself, and I said firmly, Okay, well, that sounds fun, but just not tonight. I just want to go home now. This place is creepy. And he just sighed and gripped his keys tighter. Then right as I glanced at his phone sitting in the cup holder, right before it occurred to me to grab it, he snatched it up so fast and held it in his left hand, kind of behind his head, to make it clear he wasn't going to let me near it. I made kind of this, what, sound. And he just gave me this almost. I'm proud of you, son. Half smile like dads do when they pat your shoulder or something. It was quiet and he kept looking me up and down for a minute or so. And then got a little more gruff and said, Let's go inside. I have these friends you'll really like once you meet them. You'll feel a lot better. Or something to that extent. But he wasn't even trying to sound genuine or comforting like he'd been doing so well earlier in the night. Finally, I lied and spoke up a bit. I told my roommates and my friend I was meeting up with you before you picked me up. I sent screenshots of your face and some of the conversation. They're gonna freak out if I don't charge my phone and reply to them in the next few hours. I lied. I tried to not make it sound accusatory, but more like I was just worried about my friends going crazy but it was clear he knew what I was implying. At that point, he let out an exasperated grunty sigh and started the car and drove away. Driving back, I got nervous about him stalking me and coming after me in the future, so I tried to apologize and tell him I'd be down to hang out another time maybe, but tonight just wasn't great for me. Blah, blah, blah. He didn't say a single word the whole drive back, 
He didn't ask where I lived, but he dropped me off at a McDonald's about 40 miles from my apartment, and when I was stepping out of the car, he suddenly leaned over and gave me a hard shove. I almost fell out the rest of the way. He grabbed my backpack off the floor and flung it out of his window across the parking lot. He peeled out with the passenger door still open. He broke my laptop and cracked my phone, and I had to ask a stranger to use her charger and call an Uber. But at that point, I was just so anxious to get home. I didn't give a shit. What's so weird is how, while it was happening, even though I was terrified, I guess I wasn't thinking about exactly what he was planning to do with me. I just knew I needed to get away. So it wasn't until I got home and got in the shower that I realized how messed up it all was and what might have happened if I'd let him walk me into the cabin and all that stuff. I remember just being so shaken and smacked by the reality of it. It almost felt like a panic attack. So I sat down in the shower with my head between my knees and I cried until it ran cold. I got out and woke up my roommate to tell him all about it. He calmed me down a bit. So while I still have an active grinder account, I really just use it as an ego boost. I'm reluctant to meet up with anyone from it now. Anyway, girls and gays, I suppose the moral of the story is that we gotta be damn careful out there. In high school, I had to write a paper which summarized my life story, starting from birth. I reflected on my earliest memories, and when I remembered this, I had to sit down. My heart pounded as I realized what had actually happened, and what my four-year-old self couldn't understand. When I was a kid, my family often vacationed with their friends' families, and we'd all lived together in a giant beach house or cabin for a week. This must have been one of the first of those vacations. I wanted to hang out with the rest of the kids, but since they were all at least one year older than me, they thought I was uncool. I followed my sister around the house, but since she didn't want to play with me, I mostly just eavesdropped on everybody's conversations. One day, all the kids happened to be in one room, no adults, plenty of toys, hella fun. Off to the side was this tiny door, the tiniest I'd ever seen, which led to a dark, empty room. I remember we were absolutely fascinated by that tiny door, and the older kids would make up stories about it. Jennifer was the eldest, and in my memories she's a teenager but that might have been skewed since I thought everyone in the double digits was super mature. She even knew how to use her mom's cell phone. All the kids were playing, having fun, enjoying their childhood. Then Jennifer got a call. She had to ask us to be quiet several times, and she sounded really serious. I thought this request was silly and a little annoying, since I really wanted to play. When the call ended, Jennifer told us, my dad is coming back here soon. Jennifer's dad had driven away for a few hours, but now was driving back. Someone asked questions about where he went and what he was doing. I think she said something about drinking. At some point, Jennifer addressed all of us and said something like, my dad looks at kids and takes them on drives. You all have to be really careful when he comes back. I couldn't grasp anything else, she said. Then she talked to a girl and a boy. I noticed he was looking at you two a lot, so both of you have to be really, really careful. I think he wants to take each of you on a drive, but don't go with him if he asks. Their conversation went on for a while, and I felt jealous that they talked so much with Jennifer and that her dad was looking at them instead of me. Why wasn't I so special? I grew bored of listening to them and went back to playing. The car pulled up and Jennifer told us to go in the tiny door room. We brought some toys along. I was psyched to go through the tiny door. 
but it ended up being a dark, empty room without any fairies or hobbits. After a while, we left. As far as I know, nothing bad happened on that trip. I grew up with the two kids Jennifer talked to, and they seemed pretty well adjusted. But Jennifer and her family never vacationed with us again. I told my family this story, and they thought it was an imaginary memory that my four-year-old brain concocted. My parents are positive that there weren't any weird, creepy, or alcoholic dads there, just their good friends. My sister didn't remember any of it. I can't rationalize how or why I would have imagined it. My childhood was great. I had no concept of anything bad until I was like 11. Luckily, this experience did not ruin tiny doors for me in the slightest. I love me some tiny doors. So me, my boyfriend, his best friend and his girlfriend drove up to Big Bear. Then a day later, another friend of ours drove up. He was supposed to sleep downstairs and couples sleep upstairs, since there's only two bedrooms. The first night we stayed there, it was kind of creepy because the cabin was pretty remote, and of course there's absolutely no lights outside. It's the woods with coyotes howling and bears, but nonetheless completely normal activity. On the night that our friend drove up at around 12am, my boyfriend and I were in bed when suddenly our friend sleeping downstairs comes banging on the door, freaking out, saying he saw shadows in the woods, and that the motion light came on and that there was thumping outside. We got a little freaked out, but my boyfriend gets out of bed and checks the entire cabin. He even goes outside. Nothing. We go up to the other couple's room where there's a porch with a sliding glass door that looks out into the woods. It's important to note that I'm a naturally very anxious and scared person, while my boyfriend is a rock. He's calm and logical, while I tend to jump to the worst case scenario. My boyfriend goes over to check the last place in the cabin, so he pulls the curtain and jumps and yells, Oh my god. At this point, I'm terrified. My boyfriend is a 180 pound CrossFit coach. And to see a big guy like that scared is nauseating. He locked the door and backed away slowly. He quietly says, There's a large man standing outside staring at us. He's just standing in the woods looking at us. At this point, I'm thinking he's messing with me. He looks at me and says, Go lock the door. That's when I knew he was serious. Everyone is freaking out. I run and lock the door behind us, and we all decide to stay in the room to keep an eye out. It's the middle of summer, and it's really hot, but we refuse to open the window. I'm so scared, but trying not to show it, as everyone else seemed to have calmed down. About 30 minutes go by, nothing happens. I get annoyed with the heat and the fact that there's five people in a tiny room, and three of them are men, so my boyfriend and I go back to our room. I'm still pretty spooked, so my boyfriend tries to cheer me up. At this point, it's about 1.30am. I told him I was too scared to sleep with the lights off. He tells me that it's totally fine and he understands, so we just lay with the lights completely on. Finally, I start drifting to sleep when I hear a thud. I sit up and look at my boyfriend. He looks at me and then the power cuts. I immediately start sobbing. I'm trembling and I can't see anything because it's pitch black. I try to get out of bed and run, but my legs get tangled in the sheets and I fall. My boyfriend picks me up and we grab our phone and run to the other room where everyone else was staying. I'm hysterical at this point. I try to contact our host, but nothing will go through. I try to call my dad, but all of our phones say no service. We are alone out there. Thank God the friend who drove up after us had a different carrier, because his phone had one bar. So he calls the local sheriff. He's on the phone with them, and they transfer us to the utilities company. 
We give the address and they tell us we're too far in the woods and they don't cover that area. At this point, we're wondering if the entire area has no power or if the man outside had just cut our power. I cry more and we call 911 to report suspicious activity and a power outage. They send the fire department. A few hours go by and it's 3 a.m. and suddenly the power comes back on. We fall asleep, and the next day we talked to some of the locals of the area. We told them our power went out, and he said that was strange and shouldn't have happened. He told us the only reason that happens out there is because of a snowstorm. He said he couldn't explain it. So, to the man in the woods who might have cut our power, let's not meet. This story starts out with four of my friends who are Adam, Frank, Randy, and Jay. Adam booked an Airbnb for his birthday, and we were planning to just relax and drop some acid. Me, Adam, and Randy have done acid in the past, and it was a great experience. For background purposes, I've experimented heavily with acid for the past three years, dropping upwards to almost five tabs at once so I know what to expect when doing acid. However, this trip caught me completely off guard. Frank and Jay have always been curious about acid and wanted to drop it with us for their first time. We're all close friends, so we thought it'd be a nice experience to try. So, we get to our Airbnb, which is a cozy two-story wooded cabin. We all decided to take one tab each, Frank and Jay were hesitant on taking one full tab, but eventually agreed to it since we were all going to take one full tab. This is where I should have realized that maybe we should have taken half or even a quarter since I didn't know the dosage of each tab. However, I've always got acid from this dealer and knew he was a reliable source, as my previous trips were always safe regarding the doses and legitimacy of the LSD. Okay. Now we all take the tab at 3 p.m. For the first 45 minutes, it was all going well. We were watching the Garden of Words and talking about life and our relationships and such. About another 45 minutes pass, and this is where the red flags start popping up. We all decide to go downstairs and just chill while I make food. Frank, Adam, and Randy are starting to lose themselves. Their sentences become incoherent and are unable to understand what me and Jay are saying. Even though it was Jay's first time taking acid, he held himself together quite well and was taking care of Frank, Adam, and Randy. Adam then stubs his toe on a chair and starts bleeding. This is when the nightmare starts. Adam is in pain and he starts to say, security check, about every 20 seconds. I believe the injury towards Adam's toe started making him paranoid about the whole cabin as he rented it in his name and wanted to make sure it's safe and such. So, for about 30 to 40 minutes, he's repeating the phrase, security check. During this time frame, Frank and Randy are tripping out hard. They're starting to lose themselves completely. Frank is talking incoherent gibberish with Adam while Adam is in pain and repeating security check. Randy is sitting down by himself, completely out of his mind. He couldn't understand a word I said or what was going on. So me and Jay help the three of them upstairs to relax and lay down a bit. I bring up the food I made while Adam is still saying security check over and over. This is when Randy and Frank fall asleep. We had some nice lo-fi beats playing to lighten the mood. However, I don't think this helped. Me and Jay are still in our right mind and just chilling until Frank wakes up and starts acting strange. He tried doing a judo move on Jay. Jay thought this was normal behavior because we're into combat sports and spar a lot. This was the first big red flag. Frank then goes to me to try a judo flip on me, but I counter it and we end up in bed. I asked him if he's good, then he quickly replied, yeah, I'm good. 
it was awkwardly fast. Every time he talked, it was like he was rapping like Eminem. This is when stuff gets weird. Frank then goes to Randy, who is sleeping, and proceeds to gouge his face out while asking Randy if he's okay. Frank keeps his fingernails really long for some reason, so if he goes to Randy's eyes, it would have been bad. We move Randy away from Frank and try to get him to relax a bit because right now, me and Jay start to realize that Frank is not okay. Frank then starts to flip out. He falls onto the floor, then slams his leg onto Randy's head, who is sleeping on the floor. Frank is still out of control, rolling on the floor back and forth and getting into weird, contorted positions. It was like his body was from the movie The Exorcist. He was also chanting and mumbling random stuff while flipping out on the floor, like a psychotic crackhead. At this point, Adam is coming back to his senses. He looks at Frank in confusion. Now this is when it really hits the fan. Upon seeing this, I go to the speaker to turn down the music. This is when Frank stands up and walks towards me, asking me what I'm doing. I say, just turning the music down bro, as I'm still a bit freaked out by him. He pushes me violently aside and proceeds to grab the speaker. He smashes it on the ground. He then grabs the cord that was attached to the speaker and pulls on it while screaming. What does it all mean? At the top of his lungs. This scares the life out of me, Adam and Jay. All while Randy is still asleep through all of this. At this point, we're all freaked out by what Frank does. Frank proceeds to walk to the staircase, but along the way, he palm strikes Randy, who's starting to sit up. This causes Randy to fall back to the ground and go to sleep again. I'm not sure if it knocked him out or what. Frank also strikes me in the jaw right after hitting Randy, causing my jaw to slightly dislocate. While this is happening, Adam tells him to chill out, and I kid you not, Frank responds in the most demonic voice. Chill out. No, you chill out. He sounded like a legit satanic demon saying that. After Frank hit my jaw, my first instinct is to clinch and take him to the ground. We hit the ground and I pin him with the help of Jay. Remember, this is Jay's first time taking acid as well, so he's freaking out by whatever was happening to Frank. Frank is violent and he's strong as hell on the ground. He's struggling and chanting random stuff to himself like he's possessed or something. He breaks free a couple of times and attacks everyone. He smashed Adam's face in with a closed fist repeatedly until I got him off him. He was kicking anyone in front of him as we tried to pin him, even trying to bite us. He would scratch, hit, bite, or do anything he could do to harm us. Every time we pin him, he arched his back like that one scene from The Exorcist where the girl is walking down the stairs like a spider. Thank God I knew Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because Frank looked like he was set on killing all of us. This was a nightmare. His pupils were dilated to the point where his whole eye was just black. He would glare at me and Jay as we pinned him down and this was so creepy I thought he was a demon. Frank is screaming gibberish and making weird noises while trying to contort his body like the girl from The Exorcist. At times he would arch his back and stick his tongue out while trying to throw up, while making the most demonic noises I've ever heard. What he was doing was straight up from a horror movie, and it creeped me out. At 8pm, this is when Randy wakes up. He couldn't believe what was happening. He thought that he had died during the acid trip and he was now in hell. Reason being is that Randy sees that I'm bleeding and my face is swollen while pinning down Frank with Jay, all while Adam is having a mental breakdown witnessing this. Randy says to himself, Frank would never hurt us like this. This isn't real. It's just a dream. He then proceeds to scream, Jesus Christ, at the top of his lungs repeatedly. The screaming triggers Frank to fight us even harder. Randy screams Jesus Christ and recites Bible verses for at least three hours while Frank was trying to fight us. During those three hours, me and Jay are pinning down Frank, who's tripping out harder and harder as Randy keeps screaming Jesus Christ repeatedly. 
Frank then screams and makes demonic throw-up noises while trying to get loose as a response to Randy's religious babble. Imagine this, one guy screaming Jesus Christ repeatedly and saying Bible verses at the top of his lungs, while another guy is actively trying to harm you as you pin him down, all while you're tripping on acid still. It was a nightmare to say the least. The screaming, chanting, and constant fear of being maimed was all that me, Adam, and Jay could think of at the time. Adam recollects himself and begins watching Randy and calming him down while trying to get him to be quiet, as the neighbors around our Airbnb are still awake. 11pm hits and Randy snaps out of it. A few minutes later, Frank then snaps out of it. I didn't know for sure if he was back to normal, as he asked us for water and stopped fighting us. Me and Jay cautiously let him up. However, Frank has his back turned toward me. In case he went apeshit again, I could quickly get to his back and choke him out so we could restrain him. However, he was normal again. Me, Adam, and Jay experienced the chaos and destruction done by Frank and Randy, who weren't aware of what they were doing during their psychotic trip. This trip made me realize acid is not for everyone and that we should have taken some precautions beforehand. Psychedelics can either be a heavenly experience or a hellish nightmare that won't end. Frank and Randy didn't realize how serious the situation was until we told them afterwards. To be honest, I'm not sure if they realize the severity of what me, Jay, and Adam experienced that night. I thought I knew what I was getting into but I will think twice the next time I try LSD with anyone. We all remain friends to this day, but me, Adam, and Jay will remember the nightmare hell of a trip that we experienced. This trip will forever be ingrained in my mind as the worst LSD trip I've ever experienced in my life. I needed to get this one off my chest. This is a story of my first encounter with the paranormal that I can remember. I was about eight or nine years old, playing with my little cousins at their parents' house during a family gathering. Behind their house is a large forest located in northeast Florida. My cousins, their neighbor, and I were playing hide-and-seek in the forest, and the only rule their parents had was to stay within sight of the house. Of course we didn't listen. I was getting bored of the game and wanted to do some exploring. I convinced the other kids to join me as we headed deeper into the forest. I noticed this ball of light floating in midair. I thought I was seeing things. I remember rubbing my eyes just to make sure it wasn't in my head. I asked my cousins if they saw it too, and when I pointed it out, they confirmed it was there. It was bright and bobbed back and forth changing from a yellowish color to a transparent green hue. We followed it, and I can't remember how long we did, but we reached a small cabin, and the orb disappeared. It was dusk at this point, and curiosity got the best of me. My cousins and the neighbor kid were too scared to go up to it, but I peeked inside the window. I saw a dim light inside through a window, and what I thought was a human skull sitting on a table next to some jars, and a shadow from within moved across the far wall. I got chills and signaled for the other kids to run back the way we came, and I took off immediately behind them. We ran as fast as we could and didn't stop until we were inside the house. I locked the door behind us. I remember getting into trouble because our parents couldn't see us from the kitchen window. I didn't tell my mom or anyone else what I saw because I didn't want to scare my cousins or worry our parents. To be frank, I'm not sure if even what I think I saw was there. Later that night, I woke up to the sound of helicopters and dogs barking outside. It was well past midnight and I asked my mom who was standing in the kitchen with the rest of the adults that stayed over after a party that was going on. 
They all had their eyes glued to whatever was happening in the backyard through the kitchen window. She said they found the body of a woman in the forest, in a cabin where her killer was staying, and there was a manhunt going on. I remember not being able to sleep for the rest of the night and the glaring white lights that shine through the folds of the blinds from the helicopters above. I'm still not sure what that orb was. Maybe it was the spirit of the woman who was trying to lead someone to her killer. I'm not even sure if one of the other kids told anyone about the cabin and what we saw. Maybe one of their parents called the police. I just remember us not being allowed to go anywhere near that tree line anymore whenever we visited after that night. I never wanted to anyway. So for a bit of background, I am from Spain with family from Italy. This story is 100% true. My dad, my brother and I are all familiar with camping and nature and all that stuff. We don't get scared easily and we aren't really superstitious or whatever. This happened in 2010 I believe. I was 8 years old then and we were on summer vacation in Italy in the region of Tuscany where some of our family is from. We were hiking in the country, far away from any towns or any other form of big civilization. We were not very familiar with this route though. All of a sudden, we stumble across what looks like an abandoned Tuscan farmhouse. Not very big though. We all look around and yell, asking whether there was someone. It looked very abandoned. The door was missing, plants growing all over the place. Safe to say, no one lived there. So, since we love adventure, and it didn't seem like a bad plan to do with two children, we decide to take a look at the place. As we're going to enter the house, out of nowhere comes a barn owl flying out of the house. So we had a quick scare, but nothing too bad. It's just an owl, right? We enter the house, and we just find the typical stuff you would imagine to find when you're in an abandoned house. Cutlery and plates on the ground, a candle, some old paintings, nothing really valuable though. We see an old wooden ladder that leads up to a hole in the ceiling. It was not a very big hole, my father couldn't fit, and so since I was the oldest of the two kids, I would go up and tell them what I saw upstairs. I went up the ladder and was in a room where I could barely see because the windows were covered with wooden boards. I could make out some things by a few sun rays that would get in through the gaps. I could see graffiti signs, and I saw another room, so I told my father and brother that I would advance and see what was up. As I opened the rotten wooden door, I immediately stood still. A disgusting, rotten smell penetrated my nose. I almost had to throw up. I wanted to know what caused this bad smell. Then, in the corner of the room, I could make out a silhouette. I got closer to investigate what it could be, and I could barely make out that it was the lifeless body of a dog. A big dog. And, spicy detail, the body was skinned. No fur, nothing. Just pure, rotting flesh in the shape of a big dog. I don't remember how long I just stood there, frozen, but I woke up from my shock with the screams of my brother because apparently the barn owl had gotten back inside the house and it almost hit him. So my dad yelled at me to come back and I gladly obeyed. When I got back downstairs, I told him what I had seen and the look he gave me was that of a man who is scared shitless but doesn't want to admit it in order to not scare his young kids. He just got close to my ear and whispered to run. We ran out of that place and never got back or even close to the route leading to it. I was hiking in the Catskills. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but I come up to the Catskills fairly regularly throughout the year, 
because sometimes the Poconos just get a little boring. I started at the trailhead parking lot where I parked my car and began walking up the same trail that I've walked up a thousand times. About an hour later, I started to feel kind of weird. It felt like the woods were a little bit quieter than they usually were when I'd come up here before, but I wasn't initially very concerned about it. After I sat down to have breakfast, I started hearing rustling above me, and some sticks fell right down behind me. I wasn't really worried about this either, as I just assumed it was some squirrels running around or some chipmunks throwing things at me. This has happened to me before. I finished my breakfast without incident and kept walking towards the summit. This was fairly early in the morning, so I would think there would be a lot of birds chirping and a lot of other activity, but things just kept getting quieter and quieter as I ascended. This definitely creeped me out, but I tried to push it out of my mind because I've already been hiking for a while at this point, and I'm definitely not turning around. Eventually, more sticks fell to my right, somewhat close to me, and they sounded heavier. These were not the kind of small twigs that would generally fall from squirrel activity. I went over and checked them, and these were fairly substantial. This continued to happen in a higher frequency until I finally reached the end of the trail. On my way back, it happened continuously increasing in frequency as I descended, until suddenly it just kind of stopped when I was about a mile from the car. When I finally returned to my car, I found all of the doors open, and it seemed like a lot of my stuff had been violently rummaged through. I had a bag in there with some of my clothes in it, and this had been torn up. A lot of my clothes were outside of the car, leading back into the woods. I thought about calling the police, but I live in Philadelphia, so I knew there wasn't really anything that was going to happen. To this day, I still get freaked out when I think about it. I don't necessarily think it was connected, but I do feel really uneasy about both of these things happening at the same time. Then again, maybe I was just wrong. This story happened recently, and for some context, me and my friends are teens that like to explore and do stupid stuff, like normal teenagers do. We found this tunnel that was a drain under a busy road. We had to crouch and sit on our skateboards to explore it, since the height of the tunnel was short. As we were going deeper into the tunnel, it gets pitch black, and the flashlights from our phones can only reach about 5 feet in front of us so we were blind to what we could come across until we were very close to it. In the tunnel, I remember the wall was painted in all red and had sheets of metal with white handprints connected to clothespins. We decided to keep going until we reached what we thought was a dead end. It was not. On the left was a more square tunnel compared to the rectangle shape we were in. In the distance of the connected tunnel, there was a bright light coming from the outside, shining from above onto a red shopping cart with belongings in it. We slowly inched towards the light where the shopping cart was. The light turned out to be a big hole in the ground that we could crawl out of if we needed an escape. As we were about to pass the shopping cart, my friend who was in the lead was too afraid to go forward anymore. It was pitch black five feet from where we were. I decided to take the lead and keep going. I stepped past the shopping cart and stopped. I don't know what it was, but I was afraid. I had a gut feeling something was back there. I slowly moved back. I stopped. I swear I saw something move from the deep dark of the tunnel. Before I could put everything together, a loud echo of someone pounding an object on the walls of the tunnel struck me back, causing everybody to freak out and crawl out of the escape hole. Once we got out, a homeless man ran to us asking what we were doing in there. We told him we were just exploring. He explained to us that there's a man that lives underground in that tunnel, and he would have killed us if we went further. The man was apparently crazy, 
and threw a rock at the poor guy's head before. Luckily nobody was hurt, but even though it was scary and dangerous, it was fun, and I'm glad I experienced it. Now this is something I really want to talk about to be sure that everyone is cautious and stays level-headed at all times. Now for context, I lived in the middle of nowhere in Canada. It was an old town that had quite a few abandoned buildings due to absence of residents. Me and many friends were tired of the lack of entertainment options for us, so what we did was explore these abandoned buildings. Prior to the experience I'm about to talk about, we never had anything too crazy happen to us. Occasionally we'd see a small bit of blood-like liquid, and we did see a pentagram on the ground from someone who went to a house previously, but nothing too bad. Until the last time I'd gone exploring abandoned buildings. Now, when I was younger, I used to go to a daycare that was part mental hospital. Weird combination, I know. It closed down due to lack of patients and lack of children at the daycare. I decided to go back there with my friends a few years ago. For context, I was 15 when this happened. Most of my friends were the same age. When we did get there, it was rather cliche. There was fog, it was rather dark, and there was a light drizzle of rain. We went to the main gate, which was padlocked shut. We decided to help each other hop over it and made a ton of noise. We were laughing and giggling the whole time unsuspecting of what was to come. We looked around the small play place slash park with flashlights we had on our persons. Even with our somewhat powerful flashlights, our visibility was rather limited. We decided to enter the decaying building. Glass and dirt crunched under our feet as we stepped into the daycare section of the complex. There were still old Legos, wood chips from previous furniture, old torn dolls and toys strewn about. The further we walked around the daycare section, we naturally became more and more silent, until all we could hear was the crunch of the dirt under our feet. I found some crayons in a plastic container in the corner of the room. I walked over to pick them up, when all of a sudden we heard a loud crash coming from behind a metal door, leading to the psych ward part of the building. My friends and I all looked at each other. As a whole, we were a group of five. Most of them were very bold and cocky. We all looked at each other when my friend Brian suggested we go and look to see where the sound came from. Personally, I was not fond of the idea, but with my group of friends, there was no way anyone was going to decline such a thing. We all stacked up on the door and opened it. It was rusted to the floor and we heaved to get it open. As we walked in, the metallic smells and must became stronger, with a hint of something else which I couldn't put my finger on at that moment. We walked in, our flashlights pointed in every direction with Brian leading the group. The hallways were tight, and to the left and right were the occasional metal doorway, some with doors open. I felt slightly claustrophobic, and it felt a little hard to breathe. As we continued, Brian shone his flashlight into a room and recoiled. We all stopped walking as Brian slowly entered the room. What is it? I asked him. I thought I saw someone here. It seems all fine now. To be honest, I thought he was just messing with us to increase our anxiety, but looking back, I think he was completely honest. He backed out of the room and we continued walking deeper into the psych ward when another friend swiftly told us to stop. We came to a halt and all listened. In the distance ahead of us, we heard the subtle pitter-patter of footsteps echo through the hallway. We all looked at each other, fear in each of our eyes. Brian continued walking towards the sounds. We considered turning back for a second without Brian, wondering if some ghost or something was in the building, but we couldn't do that to him. The closer we got, the more I felt like I was being watched. When finally we entered a room on the right, which had the smell of rotting meat, 
In front of us was a dead deer. Its innards were spilled all over the floor, staining the concrete. A friend of mine had a very weak stomach and vomited all over the floor. That's when we heard whispering from somewhere. Brian shone his flashlight to the corner of the room, where a man with short hair was standing with his head down. He wore a bright green t-shirt stained with what I assume was blood and torn beige pants. He did not have any socks on and his feet seemed damaged. He was twitching sporadically and continued to mumble even after we saw him. We stared at him for a solid 30 seconds before he made his first true movement. He looked up at us with a haunting grin that sent shivers down our spine. You guys here for the feast, he said, each word with varying inflection and energy. This kicked us over the edge and we bolted out of that room, all the way back to the daycare center. The door was still open and we decided to try and slam it shut, but the rust and pure weight of the door almost kept it open. It took three of us pulling with all of our strength to close it, and just before we did, I could see the silhouette of the man watching us, his white teeth being the only other human feature I could see. As we sat behind the metal door, catching our breath for a second, all looking at each other for confirmation that we all saw the same thing. After a little bit of labored breathing from each of us, we heard a light tapping on the door. That's when we decided that it was time to leave. We booked it out of the vicinity completely and ran home. A year after we visited that spot, police went to do a routine search of the area and found the man. It was stated that this guy used to go to the psych ward before it closed down. He escaped the facility he was transferred to and lived off of the wildlife around the complex. When the cops brought him in, he had a series of diseases and sicknesses from eating raw meat. His mental condition was much worse than before. There were rumors that he did kill someone in the forest while searching for food, but nothing has been confirmed. In the end, guys, be careful, especially in dangerous areas such as abandoned buildings. And creepy guy, let's not meet. This took place last year at the beginning of summer. I was with my mom headed down to my Nana's farm to visit for a weekend. For some context, she lives on a farm way back in the country right at the foot of a mountain in rural South Carolina. It's a very rural, secluded area, so the roads are badly maintained and barely wide enough for two cars to pass one another. The houses are also spread out and set far back into the tree line from the road so there's very little ambient light besides the headlights of a car. So my mom and I are driving along, her in the driver's seat and me in the passengers. It was around 11pm and we're 15 minutes out from Nana's, deep in the woods with the radio down almost to silent. We come onto this straight stretch of the road in a heavily wooded area, and suddenly this blur of a creature darts out across the road, right at the edge of our headlights. It was moving pretty good, but both me and my mom were able to get a good look at it and both agreed on what we saw. It was a fairly large creature, roughly the size of a person or maybe larger. Neither of us could make out the head, but we both remember it appearing to have a segmented body, as if it were emaciated and its ribcage was poking out. The reflection of light made it hard for me to tell color, but my mom said she remembered it to be dark and she didn't see fur or hair. It had long limbs, and as it moved across the road, it didn't run the way a dog or horse would, with all four legs. The best word to describe it would be lopping, using its front limbs to pull itself along, and it was moving considerably fast. We both said something along the lines of, What the hell is that? as it crossed in front of us. As we got up to where it had crossed, I turned to look at it just as it reached the other side of the road and out of our headlights, and I swear on my life, 
It stood up and ran, not like a dog rearing on its hind legs. It was definitely bipedal. I immediately yelled that it had stood up, and we both started getting nervous. I honestly would have thought I was going insane had I not had another person in the car with me. My mom has always been a pretty level-headed person and not superstitious, but she was very nervous and made me agree to not tell my nana about it to avoid scaring her, which made me recognize how serious this was. I should also mention that there had apparently been a series of attacks on livestock and horses in the area around the time this happened. People were saying they found wire fences ripped through and their animals attacked. There have been a few other strange instances in the area, but that was my personal experience. I wanted to share an experience I had back in the spring of 2018. I have had a few of what could be considered paranormal experiences in my life, but this was the most recent and unnerving. I am an avid outdoorsman and love to hunt and camp around the Francis Marion and Sumter National Forest. Back in 2018, I took my young son and dog out to a remote area in the National Forest to test out a new camper shell on my recently purchased truck. We found a secluded area off a dirt road, made dinner, and then packed it in for the night as soon as it got dark. Around 11pm at night, I sat up and looked out the back of the truck due to my dog growling. In the distance, I saw what looked like hundreds of small white balls of light darting around, then hovering for a few seconds and slowly converging on our campsite. They looked just like the dust orbs you see on videos but these were producing light in a completely dark forest. They soon surrounded my truck. It seemed like there were hundreds of them. They were a soft white light, and they didn't blink. After 30 minutes of them floating around and concentrating around us, I finally worked up the nerve to open the truck and lit a lantern, and they promptly disappeared. After turning off the lights and locking back up, they came back. My son was fast asleep, thank goodness. I watched them until I finally fell asleep at around 1am. The next morning, when we tried to leave, the battery was dead on the new truck. There weren't any lights in the back cab where we would have used any power. A week later, I had to replace the electric control module, but I'm not sure if it's connected. Has anyone had a similar experience? Just thinking about them again makes the hair stand up on my neck. About five years ago, I was taking a solo motorcycle trip from Utah to Wisconsin and back. Two days riding there, two days back, with about a week between. When I left on the very first day, my plan was to get somewhere in Nebraska, grab a hotel room, and continue on the next day. I didn't make any hotel reservations or anything, more of a, I'll figure it out when I'm tired kind of deal. First mistake right there. By the time I was actually tired, every highway adjacent hotel I could find was booked full. I guess this was because Sturgis had just ended and people were heading home. This is what one of the desk managers at one hotel claimed so who knows. To give you an idea, I was just barely over the Wyoming-Nebraska border when I got tired. I had waited out a storm in Wyoming for a few hours. Going on about 1.30am, I'm still riding through Nebraska, just taking every exit with a hotel to find an open one and stopping at a bunch of gas stations to stay awake. It was really only me and semi-trucks on the road. I leave a fairly large truck stop at the same time as some car that I wasn't really paying attention to. We both got on the highway, the car behind me. I get up to cruising speed, right around 7 over the speed limit, and this car just stays behind me. Cut to about 20 miles later, this car is still behind me, but uncomfortably close, 
Had I needed to hit the brakes for anything major, deer running across the road for example, he'd hit me for sure. So I let off the gas, figuring he'll just go around me and go on his way. No dice. I slowed all the way down to about 60 miles per hour, and he just held it there for a while. He stayed right behind me. At this point, I wasn't really sure what to do about it, so I just sped back up to highway speed and kept going. It was at this time I figured he might just be a cop. Being as nervous as I was, I really wanted to find out. I decided I could afford a speeding ticket, so I got up to about 12 to 15 over the limit for a few miles. Still nothing. Just a car staying right behind me. Maybe 50 feet back on a more or less deserted highway. We were still passing the occasional truck. Sometime later, I'm down to about a half a tank. And at almost 3am, I decide that at the next gas station, I'll take a long break. I see a sign for gas and take the exit. Guys... This gas station, no joke, has two pumps and one overhead light. It's like straight out of a horror movie. The car followed me to the gas station. I noped out of there back to the highway. Less than a quarter of a mile. That car followed me the whole time, into the parking lot and then right back out. The next gas station wasn't too far away, maybe 10 to 15 miles. A big truck stop type of deal. The car follows me off the exit and goes around to the other side of the main building somewhere. I stop there anyway, go into the small diner, and sit in a spot on the other side of the window as my bike. I grab a bit of food. I call ahead to the next few hotels available, and luckily one had a room. I reserved it, went back out to the bike, and went on toward the highway. No car in sight. I got to the hotel around 4am with no other problems and finally got some sleep. I still have absolutely no idea who was in the car or what they were doing, but it sure had freaked me out. This just happened. So my boyfriend and I are currently hiking the Pacific Crest Trail in California. It's extremely common to get hitches along the trail, and most people who live in towns bordering the trail are fairly kind, self-seeming folk. Emphasis on seeming. Well, today, we found ourselves a bit lost after trying to take a less traveled alternative trail. After lots of struggling and practically bushwhacking, we made our way down the hill and ended up accidentally on someone's property. This property is big. It's a large ranch with a few different buildings. We tried to skedaddle as fast as possible off the property, but one of the ranch dogs saw us and the owner came up in a golf cart. I explained that we accidentally got lost hiking and apologized, and he said it happens often and he was really understanding. He asked if we wanted a ride into town since he was about to leave anyway. Given how common hitchhiking is on trail and how nice he was, we accepted and he drove us to town. On the ride there, he told us he used to be in the DEA and had participated in more shootouts than people fighting in the army. Weird, but okay. I didn't think much of it. I noticed my boyfriend was really quiet though and I thought it was odd. As soon as we hop out of the car, my boyfriend grabs our backpacks and tells me to check my phone. He had sent me an article about the guy we just got a ride from and how this guy was involved in his girlfriend's disappearance and a suspicious death on the ranch property not too long after. Apparently, his girlfriend went missing after signing property transfers of her ranch over to him. She was never found and the suspicious death on the ranch was a worker who got killed by an ATV. But toxicology showed a meth overdose. Given his DEA background, I found that part specifically suspicious. Also, he's on the sex offender registry for groping two women on a snowmobile tour. My boyfriend and I are 100% okay, but we're just shaken up that we got a hitch from a possible murderer. 
Be careful who you get hitches from, even if they're friendly. I came here hoping anyone could share similar experiences or give insight. I took a trip to stay in a cabin in the middle of the woods, high up in the mountains of the city of Ranger, Georgia, USA. This neighborhood was 30 minutes up in the mountains, away from civilization, and even the cabins were spread far apart. The front deck of the cabin was completely exposed to the woods, so I acknowledged that any animals could stroll along if they pleased, but I stayed there for about a week and me and my boyfriend sat outside on the front deck every night, very late, and at no point felt in danger. It was peaceful with fireflies out and sounds of crickets every night. Until the fifth night. It was eerily dark too. The moon was covered heavily. It was about midnight, and all of a sudden, I didn't feel peace like I did those other nights. The forest went completely quiet, and I felt a horrible sense of dread. I genuinely feared for my life. I sat there in my chair, looking out into the dark forest, trying to rationalize and calm myself down that it was my mind playing tricks. But all of a sudden, my boyfriend said out loud that he felt unsafe. I told him I felt the same, and we ran inside. The cabin has three floors, and we were able to climb out the window and sit on the roof because we still wanted to be outside and relax. It didn't matter how high up I was, I felt something truly evil and stayed inside. The only other time I felt something so evil or like someone was watching was when I had a few paranormal experiences at a haunted house. Georgia doesn't really get mountain lions, maybe a bear, but it didn't feel that way at all. This happened years ago when I was around the age of 19 or 20 and worked retail part-time at the mall. I was the closing shift that night and left around 10.30 p.m. to head home. I often took the inside streets versus the freeway, which included a small stretch of back road that was usually pretty empty, especially during that time of night. This particular night, I noticed a car about 10 minutes into my 30-minute drive, going the same way as me, but I didn't think much of it. As we were approaching the stretch of back road that's usually deserted at that time, the driver behind me starts flashing their high beams and slowing down and speeding up while tailgating me. I remember feeling panic that they might hit my car. Eventually the car pulls up beside me and I can now see a middle-aged man who's pointing towards the back of my car and then motioning for me to roll down my window. I roll my window down about halfway and he says something about how my tire looks like it's flattening and I'm going to damage the rim if I don't pull over soon. I tell him I don't know how to change a tire, but I'm not too far from home so I should be fine. But he's pretty insistent about how it will only take a few minutes, and he's happy to help. I know something is off, because my car seems to be driving fine. I politely say I'm fine, but thanks anyway, and I roll my window up. He drives next to me for what feels like forever, but it couldn't have been more than a minute or two. At this point, something feels so off that I'm afraid to even physically look in his direction. I focus on the road the best I can, and eventually he slows down and moves behind me again. After a few minutes, we reach a more populated, well-lit part of town, and I see him make a U-turn. I get home and take a look, and my tire is perfectly fine. I have no idea if he followed me from the mall, or what that man's intentions were, but I think it's safe to say they weren't anything good. I even had my dad check all my tires the next morning, and the tire pressure on them was in the normal range. I still think of this night from time to time, and it makes me nauseous to think about how differently things might be today, 
if I had decided to pull over that night. I was working night shift in a gas station slash truck stop in Tucumcari, New Mexico back in the mid-90s. I had another guy working with me who ran the diesel side while I worked the gas side. We had a guy come in around 1 or 2 a.m. and just looked at stuff in the aisles for a while before he left. I didn't really think twice about him. Later, at about 6 a.m., when I got off, I drove home past a convenience store named Alsuf's. They're big in the southwest. There had to have been 30 cop cars in the parking lot. There aren't even 30 cop cars in Tucumcari, so where they came from I have no idea. I come to find out that sometime during the night, the Allsups had been robbed and the clerk had been taken into the cooler, tied up, and beheaded. I found that out when I was awoken by the state police a few hours later and asked if I'd seen anything suspicious during the night. That guy who came in and left was the only thing I could think of. The police took a copy of our security footage, which led them to a suspect who was later convicted for the murder. I can't even begin to tell you how hard it was to go to work the next day. We kind of assumed that the guy was going to rob us first, but didn't want to deal with two clerks. So he left and hid all subs instead. One of my friends knew about this disused cabin in the woods. It was built on the edge of a river on a kind of sandbank. There was a decline in the popularity of hiking and outdoor activities in the area due to a tragedy. It was practically deserted. So me and four other friends seized the opportunity. We planned to go and hike in that area and thought that we could use it if no one else was. When night fell, it was truly pitch black out there. You couldn't see your surroundings. It was a great night to be out in the wild. I loved the natural ambience. There was the constant trickle of the river mixed with the trail of insects. We heard what we thought was the sound of fingers drumming in the window pane. There was a nearby willow tree, so we assumed it must be the sound of a branch being dragged by the wind against the window. The lights were off early that night. We were all tired from the hike. Most of us were asleep in our own spot inside the cabin. It creaked now and then. There was the noise of people rolling over in their sleep. And of course, with five men in there, there was definitely some snoring. But other than those noises, it was a quiet night. We were miles from any city, town, or main roads. I couldn't sleep though. I was tossing and turning all night. We hiked and slept outdoors all the time. I don't know why I couldn't get to sleep that night. I had this unpleasant feeling in the pit of my stomach. I constantly felt like something was about to happen. I quickly found out what was causing my unease. The sound of the willow tree colliding with the window was getting louder. I listened closely and focused on the sound. It sounded to me like it was hitting different parts of the window. Then it sounded like it was coming from the other window. There were two windows in the cabin and they were at opposite ends to one another. I didn't remember there being trees outside of each window. I felt my stomach tighten with that realization. There was a regularity to the sound as well. It didn't match the gusts of wind anymore. It was a steady tapping sound now. It was no longer the sound of branches dragging. It sounded deliberate. It was circling. The sounds of those taps and knocks was circling the cabin. I sat up to try and identify the source of the sound. I couldn't place it because the cabin wasn't at ground level. I couldn't look out the window from my sleeping bag to see. I needed to open the door. I knew that I wouldn't be able to sleep unless I checked. I tiptoed over to not wake the others. I was still thinking I was being paranoid at this point, and I didn't see the sense in waking my friends up with nothing confirmed. I slowly opened the cabin door with impeccably bad timing, for as soon as I opened the door, I came into contact with the source of the circling tapping sound. There was a young woman with long, messy, dark hair grinning at me. 
She was barefoot and wearing a nightgown. She was covered in mud. I screamed and my friends woke up. She had been tapping the window. She just stood there smiling at me. I instinctively shut the door and we had little other choice but to wait until morning. We had no cell phone reception in the cabin. We couldn't call the police. We later found out that the young woman was the daughter of the owner of the land we were trespassing on and she'd done this before. I started to think back to the tragedy that happened around here. I think it was a missing person case or something. I wondered if she had something to do with it. I think we had a close call that night. She didn't know how she got there apparently. Her feet were so cut up that there was blood in the mud puddles she'd created by circling the cabin. I don't know how long she'd been circling us and what might have happened if I didn't get up to check. This happened when I was in the second year of college. Seven guys including myself went camping, and I want to share with you what happened. We had this friend in the group who came from the countryside. He said to us that he knew of some little known place out in the mountains where we could all hang out during our summer vacation. He said we could go camping out by a mountain stream, so we all piled in two cars and headed out to the place he recommended. We drove for three hours. Our countryside friend told us that once we got on the highway, it would only take about an hour, and then when we got off the roads, we had to hike a mountain trail. It took about 30 minutes, but it felt like forever after that long drive. Some of those mountain roads were so narrow and overgrown that I was praying no one was coming in the opposite direction. One of the friends in my car remarked on how overgrown it was, to which my countryside friend replied, Yeah. No one knows about this place. It felt good, you know, like we were on an adventure. After a while, the mountain stream our friend promised came into view. It was amazing. It was surrounded by mountains, and it felt like we owned it. I don't know if that sounds a little arrogant, but that's how it felt. There was even a waterfall, and it wasn't a small stream. Maybe I should call it a river. It was wide in parts. We were alone. I mean that in the sense that we felt completely off the grid. I liked the idea, until I noticed a building jutting out of the mountains on the west. It looked like a school. We settled in after pitching our tents and had some lunch. We played around in the river, and when the sun began to set, we lit a campfire and drank. However, the snacks and the booze ran out quicker than we anticipated, so we split up. One team went on a booze recon mission, and the others minded our campsite. This happened at around 10pm. I didn't volunteer to go to the store. I was fine with just sitting around. We had no torches. We watched as our friends headed off under the watchful light of the moon in one of the cars. We turned on the headlights of the other car so we would have some light. The stars were beautiful, and the night was filled with the chirp of insects and the steady flow of the mountain stream. One of my pals broke the silence and said, What's that? I looked in the direction he was facing. He was looking at the school, and I saw that there was some kind of light coming from over there. It looked to me like someone was walking around with a flashlight. We spoke amongst ourselves. Someone said that they thought that there was some people out there doing some urban exploration. Someone else said that there was only one flashlight, so they doubted it. For the briefest of moments, it felt like the flashlight landed on us. We weren't far away enough to not be seen. Then, the light went out. I figured that it was probably just a security guard or janitor, but my countryside friend said that the school was closed. We were all in high spirits, but now our enthusiasm was ebbing away. We all fell silent. It was already past midnight, and our friends hadn't come back from the store yet, so two others from our group said that they would go in search of them in the other car. Without the headlights, we could only rely on the campfire for light. My friend and I were the only ones left at the campsite, and after a few moments, he turned to me and asked, Sorry, but can I go to sleep before you? 
I'm so tired, man. He didn't wait for my reply. He just went into one of the tents nearby and settled down for the night. It sounded like he fell asleep almost instantly. I was alone. I watched the campfire. It was getting pretty creepy out there in the middle of nowhere. Our gang of seven, now down to just one, me. After a few moments, I noticed something. I saw a light coming from the direction of where we entered in our cars. I didn't see headlights though. The light looked like it was about a hundred meters away. I realized that it was coming from the woodland trail. It looked like it could be a flashlight. I started to get a little worried. I kicked dirt over the fire and then climbed into the closest tent. Unfortunately, it wasn't the one my friend went to sleep in. I put a sleeping bag around me. I had a bad feeling about whatever was approaching, but I kept my eyes on that light. I hoped that whoever it was wouldn't notice our campsite. I could see it move as if it was handheld. I started to wonder if it was the janitor or the urban explorer we saw earlier at the school. I wondered why the hell someone would be out here in the middle of the mountainous forest at this time of night. I piled some bags around me to create a little barrier, and then I stayed as still as I possibly could. I was sure whoever was out there wouldn't approach the tent that was zipped up. Surely they'd realize that someone was asleep or camping. I was wrong. I heard footsteps approach the front of the tent, followed by the chilling sound of someone unzipping the tent door. Then an old raspy voice spoke. You're not here either. I had goosebumps. I realized that it wasn't some janitor from the school. The voice belonged to an old woman. The old woman left my tent and then approached the tent that my friend was sleeping in. I didn't dare open my eyes, but I could hear her muttering something as she passed by. I knew that I wouldn't be able to catch a wink of sleep that night after this mysterious old woman decided to visit our tents. I lay there with my sweat amassing my brow. Listening to the distant flow of the stream and the steady chirp of the night insects, praying for morning, praying for light. It was a long night, but when the first rays of the morning light illuminated my tent, I got up and went to see if my friend was alright. Thankfully, there was no one out there. I looked into the tent and saw that he was sleeping. I decided not to wake him. Neither of my friend's cars had come back that night. I started to get very worried for them, but after about 10 minutes, I saw them both return to our campsite. I asked them what happened, and they said that the first car got a puncture, and the second car, which went to look for them, got lost on the mountain roads. I told them all what happened last night, and no one believed me. We were set to camp out again that night, and they all thought I was just trying to scare them. I didn't want to stay there for another night, but I had no choice. I didn't drive out there, I got a ride, and it wasn't like I could walk back home by myself. I reluctantly spent another night out there. It was an uneventful night, and the following morning we all piled into the cars and headed back home. I purposely sat next to my friend who went to sleep early the night the old lady came to our campsite. He hadn't mentioned anything about it, and I wanted to know if he slept through it, or if he didn't want to tell the others because they hadn't believed me. I said to him something like, Did you hear what I said happened on the first night? I bet you're glad you went to sleep early, huh? I wasn't asleep, he replied. He said that, like me. He decided to stay as silent as possible. He said that the old woman actually went inside his tent, grabbed him and shook him. He opened his eyes a bit and saw that he wasn't dreaming and terror gripped him. He saw the old woman looming over him and attempting to shake him awake. He was so scared, but he said that he couldn't do much else but pretend to be asleep. She was mumbling the whole time. He said that he couldn't make out many words but he said he will always remember one sentence. The old woman said, I don't know where my children have gone. Many years have passed since that summer, but I wonder if she's still out there. Even though I don't know if her intentions were either good or bad, I somehow feel for the old lady.
That poor woman sounded as if she'd been out in the woods for a while. I always think about that night whenever summer rolls around. This happened during summer vacation, when I was at school. Back then there was an abandoned hotel in our neighborhood. I invited two of my closest friends to go urban exploring with me in that hotel one day. Let's just call my friends A and B. We first tried the front door, but it was locked, so we went around the back and found that that door was open. It wasn't like we were on a dare or we were ghost hunting or anything like that. It just felt like a good day for exploring and we were all free at the same time. As you might expect, the place was pretty trashed. We started in the lobby, looking around for anything interesting. Most of the rooms were locked, but we found a room on the fourth floor, which was open, so we decided to make a base there. In the room, the smell of dust and mold wasn't that overpowering. The bed was pretty gross, so we pulled some chairs in from the lobby. Night crept in, and since there wasn't any electricity, We called it a night, but the next day we came back prepared. We all brought flashlights and we headed to the hotel around lunchtime. We brought candles and snacks and drinks too. We were well prepared. We put all that stuff in our base room on the fourth floor and decided to check out the basement as we hadn't done the day before. Us three descended into the basement with our flashlights in hand. Now this basement was huge and there were rooms down there too, a lot of them. We were looking for a rope or something we could hold on to to make sure we stayed together and didn't get lost because it was pitch black down there. It was so dark, I felt trapped down there. Even though it was lunchtime during summer, it was very creepy and my friends seemed to feel pretty carefree so I tried my best to hide my apprehension. We then found another room. In this room there was a box. In the box... There were keys. We left the basement with the box of keys to see if they would work on any of the locked doors upstairs. The keys had room numbers on them, but they wouldn't work on the doors that matched the number on the key. We couldn't work it out. Maybe there was some auto lock in place or a deadbolt or something. We were just glad that our room on the fourth floor was open. We decided to look for a key that wasn't a guest room key and we found a key that said, waiting room, written in pen. Now this key was different to the other keys and it did not look that official. What I mean by that is, it's not the kind of key you would get from the front desk. It looked like some kind of janitor key. We noticed a locked door in the basement, which had a sign and that sign read, waiting room. So we headed back down there again. We tried the key in the lock and the door to the waiting room unlocked with a click. The door opened a crack and we were confronted by a terrible stench. We asked one another about what that smell could be. Was it something rotten or dead? I was really freaked out now. Down there in the dark basement with this new terrible smell, I said, come on guys, let's go back. And A said to me, what? You don't want to know what's in here? And I just replied, no man, it's dangerous. Let's, let's just go. And then B said, oh, come on, just hold your nose. We'll all take a quick peek. A carelessly pushed the door open and shone his flashlight inside. The flashlight revealed a mannequin, what looked like it had blood all over its clothes. There were dead animals in the room too, strewn all over the place. Knives were stabbed into the mannequin. We all began shivering. I could tell A was because his flashlight was shivering as it scanned the room to reveal scratches in the wall and on the door. I felt my blood turn ice cold. I couldn't take any more. I just ran and my friends ran with me. We ran through the lobby and out the back door and continued running up the street for about a hundred meters. We were all clamoring, screaming, and going crazy about what we had just witnessed. Why were there so many dead animals? And and the blood? And the mannequin? 
B was pale and we looked at him, and he said in a quiet voice, Don't you think that thing on the floor, just to the right of the mannequin, looked like a human foot? It was that point we found his breaking point. He started to cry, and we all went home. I didn't even want to leave the house for about three days. It was around this point that I remembered I had left my bag in there. I didn't want someone to find it and then find me. I was too scared to go back to the hotel by myself, so I called my friends again, and they reluctantly agreed to go with me. We approached the back door with fear, weighing heavily in our hearts. I reached out a shaking hand, and I tried the door, but it was locked. This was about eight years ago. I often tremble in my bed at night when the lights are off, remembering that event. That hotel has now been renovated into retirement homes. But I can still see the waiting room in my head. This happened to me when I went on a fishing trip with my dad. My dad absolutely loves to fish, and he would always invite me. I like fishing, sure, but I guess I wasn't as passionate about it as he was. He loved mountain stream fishing, and I will be honest, that was probably my favorite too. So on the first day mountain fishing was an opportunity to do, we were ready to go. This all happened when I was in elementary school, by the way, and I think I was about six. I remember it very well, not only for the reasons that will become clear shortly, but because it was the first time we ever went deeper into the mountainous woods. We never went in that far before, but I think that the year prior yielded a fruitless fishing hole, so my dad wanted to go in search of a new fishing spot. The stream we used wasn't a secret amongst anglers, and there would always be a bunch around dotted either side of the length of the stream. It was common to see tents along the side of the streams. These numbers grew less and less the further you went into the darker woods. The mountain provided that darkness. The much needed shade was welcome, but with darkness came fear, especially for a boy my age. I knew that mountain stream fishing wasn't as peaceful as it seemed. There were dangers everywhere, and I thank my dad for making me aware of them. You could fall get lost, get an injury, wind up in distress, and you could also encounter a wild animal such as bears. My dad and I had a radio for these instances and bear repellent. My dad actually used to bring fireworks out too, you know, like firecrackers or something. He believed that this would frighten off something or alert someone to our position should we need it. He took all manners of precaution on our fishing trips, and I'm so glad he did. So that day, we were in search of the perfect fishing spot, and it seemed as if we'd found it. We could see that the stream was teeming with life. There were fish everywhere. We approached it from above, and all we had to do was descend the mountain a bit. So that's just what we did. We headed down with big grins on our faces. On the way down, I noticed something. There was a tent. There was a smell in the air, too. It wasn't great, it was pretty awful. Food containers, clothes, and other personal items were scattered around the tent. The tent was ripped too. Something was wrong, and even to my young mind, I knew what had happened. This was the work of a bear. We had no idea if the bear was still nearby. With that thought at the forefront of my mind, I began to tremble. My dad had kept walking although he had stopped speaking. He was approaching the tent. I thought he was going to see if the man in the tent was okay. I was certain that the man in the tent must be dead. There was so much destruction around. It was a harrowing scene. My dad stopped, turned to me, and said, Don't touch anything. Nothing at all. The bear will be back. We have to go. I can't describe how I felt on the way back to the car but it felt like I wasn't living, just existing, like the life in me was on pause. I'm not sure if that means anything to anyone, but hey, that's how it felt. I had never been conscious of death until that day. Death was so cruel. Nature was so indifferent. 
we found out once we reported the tent to the mountain ranger that the man was indeed dead. They believed the bear was still out there. There's nothing much more I can say. Be careful when you're in the mountains and the woods. Keep your wits about you and survey your surroundings. This happened about five years ago, and back then I was really interested in photography. Whatever time I could take off work, I used to go traveling to take photos. It was autumn, and I planned to visit a rural village that lied in the shadow of the mountains. I could already imagine the colors of the leaves, and I was really looking forward to it. The area was very traditional, and that I mean it was like looking into a picture from the past. It was a proper rural agricultural village, and my eyes bulged at its beauty. My head was brimming with the ideas for photos. When I say it was a rural village, I'm not talking about a couple of fields. The mountains that stood over it were truly beautiful. There was some kind of eccentricity to this village I couldn't put my finger on. I tend to look for beauty in unusual places. I remember that there were some flat lands where beautiful yellow flowers I hadn't ever seen before were growing. They hadn't been leveled or cut, they were just there in their own patch. I loved it. The forest floor was littered with fallen autumn leaves. I was fascinated with my surroundings, I wanted to immerse myself in nature. I sat down on the forest floor for a while. On my first day in the village, I decided to stroll through the forest and shoot some photos. I got a little away from the village and I found a natural path in the forest which led to the mountains. The path twisted left and right and there were these huge boulders littering the way, like buttons on a giant's coat. I went up the path and there was a clear barrier between me and the trail to the mountains. It was a rope tied at waist height. Here in Japan, they're called Shimanawa and you might have seen this kind of rope at shrines as it's usually at an entrance to mark its sacred nature. The thing is, in public places like shrines, they aren't tied at waist height. They're usually high up, allowing people to pass underneath them. This was intentionally either stopping people from going any further, or stopping something else from coming any further, depending which way you looked at it, or what side of the rope you were on. I found it very interesting, and I really wanted to push on and climb over, but since the sun was setting, I decided not to brave the unknown and head back to my inn. Later that night, I asked the innkeeper about the path I found in the mountains. He told me not to go back up there. He said it wouldn't be a good idea to cross over that rope and head further up the mountain, as many people have been known to disappear on that path. I thought about it, and maybe the innkeeper was just saying that to keep me out of there that he heard many stories from the villagers which made him believe that the mountain path was off limits. I thought that there wasn't much to his story, so the next day I decided to head back up there again without telling anyone. I headed up there early, but everyone was already up. I had to wait for the villagers to stop watching me that morning before I could make my move. Word travels fast out there, I guess. I was heading back up the path and I was thinking... Nothing happens when you go past that rope. It's fine. It's just a mountain. Once I passed the rope, the mountain path and its surroundings seemed to double in its beauty. Yet the path remained the same, like it had been walked many times before. It seemed quite a depressing path. I was walking along as if I were in a dream. The scenery was the same either side of the path. I grew a bit nervous. I was most worried about getting lost. After a short while, I found a body of water. It was like a swamp kind of stream, so I started heading up the path, keeping parallel with that. That way, I could always follow it back down. After a while, the path gave way to the natural barrier that was the mountain. I was kind of disappointed, to be honest. I figured that there wasn't much else worth checking out, and I almost decided to head back. But that's when I noticed it. Alongside the steep mountain was a hollow indent, and there was a house built into the mountain face. Well, it wasn't a modern house. Maybe a hut or lodge would be a more accurate description of it. The walls were white with a tiled roof, 
and it looked like it was in pretty decent condition too. I felt someone could have come out of the house at any moment, and I didn't want to get caught on what I guessed was their property since I passed through the rope, so I turned on my heels and went to get out of there. I headed back down towards the village. Halfway back to the inn, I was suddenly stopped by a person calling out to me. Ah, shit. I felt guilty. I'd just been caught doing something I shouldn't, so I climbed up and didn't say a word. I turned around to see what kind of trouble I was in. I saw an old guy I recognized. There was the guy who lived across from the inn. I said hello to him a couple of times. He was sat on top of a big rock. He told me off and I deserved it. He said there were bears out there. I apologized a bunch of times and told him I would head right back. He said he would take me back. He shouted at me at how lucky I was that I didn't go any further. He said there were things out there worse than bears too. That's when I noticed he was holding a gun in his hand. I asked what the gun was for. He smiled and said, just self-defense. He was a trapper and he said he never once used the gun, but knowing what he knew about the area, he said it would be a stupid idea not to bring it each time he went past the rope because of the bears. He said the bears have always been there. People who did what I did are the people who go missing. Sometimes it's not a cryptid, insane person in the woods, or a missing 411 story. Sometimes it's people like me who willfully ignore the rules. And if it wasn't for that guy, I might not be here sharing this. It seems like a miracle I got out of there alive. This happened back in my university days, when a friend and I were on our way back from a trip. On the way back, I guess I must have misread the map or we took some kind of shortcut because we got lost somewhere on the mountain roads. My friend was driving, and I was supposed to be the navigator. It was the one job I had. It was around 8pm, but it was already really dark since we were in the shadow of the mountains. I noticed a white truck up ahead, and I said to my friend, if we followed the truck, we would probably get back to a main road in no time. I thought it was a pretty sweet plan, because I didn't have a clue where the hell we were, let alone what mountain we were on. We were tailing the truck for a while and then we realized we were going further and further from the main road, and further into the desolate mountain roads. We started to worry as the roads turned to dirt roads, one lane roads. The truck, more suited to these roads, sped up, and we lost sight of it. It was weird and kind of unlikely for the truck to disappear all of a sudden. There was nothing ahead of us apart from dark, dirt mountain roads. It was playing on my mind, but our priority was getting back on a main road. I was flipping through a map, with a torch held in my mouth. There was no cell phone coverage. We were going further down the road when I noticed some lights behind our car. I looked in the wing mirror and noticed a white truck behind us. It was the white truck we had been tailing. I told my pal what I'd just seen and we both watched the truck in the mirrors. We began to get a little creeped out by this. The truck then turned its lights off is it even possible to navigate these winding mountain roads with the lights off? I wondered. It was getting really freaky now. I was nervous and I could tell that my friend was nervous too. I stated the obvious at this point. I think that truck from before is behind us, man. It's following us now. As soon as I said that, I began to sweat. My friend shifted nervously in his seat too. He sped up to test my theory and the truck behind sped up to catch us. Still, with its lights out, we didn't know what to do. We began to argue about it. It was incredibly tense. Then suddenly, the truck behind us seemed to disappear. It felt totally hopeless. Whoever was in the truck clearly knew the roads. I really wish we didn't decide to follow that guy. We kept going forward on the one lane road, keeping an eye out for a chance to turn back, sending snappy bitey remarks to each other about how we could get out of this mess. Then seemingly out of nowhere, the truck swerved into our lane again and slammed on its brakes. My friend reacted in time and once again we were behind the white truck. He said, if we don't do something, it's gonna end bad mate. 
This was the worst. I've never felt so stressed out. A moment or two later, we reached a point where the road got wider and my friend took his chance. We span into a U-turn. There wasn't too much space to turn, so my friend's car kissed the guardrail. On our escape, we noticed points in the road where the truck could have disappeared and appeared in front of us. That answered the question of how it was possible, but we still had the unanswered question of why. Why was this guy doing this to us? We knew that we were on our way back to civilization, so my friend floored it while I kept nervously glancing over my shoulder to see if the truck was following us. I kept asking him to speed up, but I knew that he couldn't. That truck could pop out of nowhere again at any moment. So we kept heading down those dirt roads until eventually they became concrete again. I saw the lights, lights of people's homes, and before long we came across a non-franchised gas station. My friend immediately pulled in and we skidded to a halt. My friend ran in and grabbed the clerk by his arm and frantically explained the situation. He asked the guy to call the cops and for directions to get off of these mountain roads. The clerk didn't seem that interested in our plea for help, so we got him to go outside. My friend then said, You have to believe us, there's some guy chasing us. Okay then, if a white truck with all its lights off turns up at any second, then will you believe us? And just as he finished saying that, the truck arrived with its lights still off. It screeched to a stop a few meters away from the gas station. Then, it slowly turned around and headed back into the darkness. We weren't able to get a look at the driver, but we noticed something. There was some sort of logo and some text on the side of the truck. The clerk at the gas station said, Oh, oh, <laughs> now I get you. The guy's from the church, huh? What? Oh, I say church, maybe cult's a better word. I pressed him for more information, and it turns out that apparently the entire mountain is their territory. They own a village, and the leaders and the followers all live there together. I understand that there are cults in Japan, but I didn't understand why that truck was following us. So I asked, and according to the old fellow at the gas station, there are frequent attempts to escape by followers of the cult who changed their mind. So the cult are very wary of cars getting anywhere near their village. Their reckless driving and relentless pursuits of anyone who gets close to the village is said to be the cause of numerous accidents up here in the mountains. I remember that the cult featured quite heavily on the news and in the media a few years after, but it seems to have gone radio silent since. I guess that guy who followed us was a lookout for escapees, or for families trying to rescue their loved ones or something. It was a very creepy experience. I live with my wife, daughter, and son in an apartment. We live out in the countryside in a suburban area. It's a really quiet place and rarely any crime occurs here. With it being so peaceful and pleasant out here, I often left the front door to our apartment open on hot days to allow the air to circulate through our apartment. This experience happened a few mornings ago. I was looking after my daughter and son while my wife went out to run some errands. I'm thirsty my five-year-old son said as he rushed into the kitchen. If I'm in the living room, I can see the fridge, so I kept an eye on him. Something was different that day, though. My son was looking at something. After he got his drink, he dropped it in the hole. He was looking in the direction of our front door. I looked at him and asked him what he was doing. He didn't reply. He just stood there staring at the front door. I saw a look of concern pass his face. He was stood completely still. I didn't like this, so I got up and headed towards him, and I looked in the direction he was staring in. There was a man in our hallway that I'd never seen before. He looked to be in his twenties. He was dressed for summer, but there was something off about him. He gave off a strange vibe. It's kind of hard to describe. I mean, of course he gave off a weird vibe. He was stood in my house, but there was something else up with him. He appeared to be out of breath. He was just looking around our place with these quick little side glances. For a moment, I was literally unable to move. 
I was as still as a statue. Then I snapped out of it. I had children to protect, and when that thought came to the forefront of my mind, the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. It was fight or flight time. I raced over and grabbed my boy. I shouted at the intruder, What the hell are you doing in here? I'm just tired. I'm basically outside. Just give me a second here. He replied, No, what the hell are you doing here? Answer me. He just stood there smiling, not saying a word. To me, it looked like he was considering his options or he was scheming. I guess that my daughter had heard what was going on as I saw her head peeking out of the living room doorway. No matter what I said to the guy, he gave me nothing but nonsensical answers. He was utterly incomprehensible, and that troubled me. Was he buying time? We stood there in silence, two men, two strangers facing one another, both of us seemingly unable to understand one another. My mind was racing. I clearly had to consider other options, so I thought to myself, do I get a knife from the kitchen? Do I have to hit the guy? Obviously, I didn't want to do anything like that in front of my kids. Why didn't this guy just leave? If he wanted something, why couldn't he ask? All these questions were going around in my head. He stood there with his eyes darting about my home, and then would come back to mine. While I was considering my options, a young man dashed out of my house. I then heard a voice shout. Hey, you, wait, at the man. A uniformed police officer was rushing towards my place. I was really confused, but I was relieved, glad that he left. But how did the police know to come here? My daughter came up to me from the lounge and told me that she called the cops. She's a smart kid. I made a report with them. Afterwards, I heard from the officer that the young man had been going around that day exposing himself to residents. I found that disturbing. The reason the police were able to respond so quickly to my daughter's call was because they were already en route. They were in the area. A neighbor had placed a call complaining about a man in the area running around being gross. You know, like I said, the officer said that the intruder must have felt like he'd been backed into a corner, and that's why we had that weird standoff in my home. The officer then said something that stayed with me. We're fairly certain that he was doing this. He was out of his mind, and with that, he gestured a syringe to his forearm. I don't know. I guess I had a tear in my eye when he said that. He was so young. Even though he terrorized my family, in those brief moments we stood eye to eye with one another, and he'd done other stuff. I just thought, what a waste. Anyway, don't leave your door open in the summer. You never know who might turn up. I'm just glad that I didn't decide to run those errands that morning. I cannot imagine what might have happened if he found my wife and kids home alone. I might be telling a different story. I was hiking in the Olympic National Forest a few years ago, by myself and my two dogs. We were four days in, around twenty miles at least, as a crow flies from even a known mountain road. I was camping at around seven thousand feet that night, or right where the tree line started thinning out. So, when we got to the campsite, a big open meadow on top of a secondary mountain, it was just about an hour from sunset. My big dog usually runs around within proximity of the camp as I put up the tent and make dinner, but I noticed this time was a bit different. He kept staring up the steep, tree-filled mountainside, tail straight up and barking. Not the bark when he sees marmots, not the excited, oh you fucks are lucky because I'd rip you all apart if my master wasn't here, high-pitched barks, but unsure, concerned barks. Now. The day before, I'd found a note left under a rock at the last landmark, saying that there was a problem bear in the area that was harassing a party of campers a few days ago, and I myself had seen big cat tracks the day before, so I was rightfully concerned that this may be more than just ground squirrels. 
I decided to go climb some of the boulders at the foot of the hill while I took my time looking up the hillside for movement. Before I went to go hang my bear back up there, they were the only trees around to hang the bag from. I didn't see or hear anything, but my dog kept quietly whining like there was something up there. So, while still concerned, I start hiking up this steep hill to hang the bag. It was so steep, I had to use the trees to balance and lean against so I didn't go tumbling down. Before making another five to six step push to the next tree I could lean against, Anyway, I'm slowly making it up this hill, hopping from tree to tree to keep my balance. Then I get about a hundred feet up the hill, and I hear a whole lot of big movement about fifty feet in front of me. My dog immediately goes from a deep low growl to a savage, slobber flying everywhere type barking now. My heart starts pounding out of my chest, and I start to panic. A million thoughts go racing through my head in a matter of seconds because if this is a bear, my dog is going to try to save me, in which he will most likely die, and I'm stuck here. If I have to get off that hillside fast, I almost 100% am going to trip and fall off the 12 to 15 foot cliff onto the boulders below, so I'm feeling pretty screwed about now. Then I hear my other little dog start barking and freaking out down at my campsite, which was just out of sight. I had zipped her in my tent so she didn't wander off while I was away. So yeah, I'm absolutely panicking at this point. A few seconds after, I kind of snap back to it, and I take another few seconds to start to put my survival priorities in order, and I call my dog back to me. He gets to me and sits at my feet, as my back is against a tree, so I'm kind of pinned and stuck there for the moment but my dog was seemingly trying to separate me from something up there, so I let him lean against me while I tried to collect myself. This is when I realized I'd completely forgot that I had my headlamp on. I reach up so fast to turn my lamp on, I basically punch myself in the face. I'm having serious adrenaline dumps going on right now, so much so that my knees are starting to shake. I get my lamp on and peer up the hillside. I figure I'll at least get a reflection off the eyes of whatever's up there. Peering. Peering. Nothing. But I just heard something. We both did. And whatever it was, it didn't get away or sound like it had made it too far. I knew something was there, so I'm kind of just steadfast at this point. I need to know what is up there because I have to sleep here tonight. And you know, I'm out in the middle of nowhere alone. Better to face it than wait like a sitting duck all night is my thought process. So yeah, as I'm looking up this hill, and at one point my dog lunges forward, unpinning me, he does a bluff charge up the hill about 15 feet, and I mean he's snarling and foaming at the mouth at this point. As he does this, I finally see movement. Something moving up and breaking the line of the horizon my dog's bluff made whatever it was blow its cover, so I'm zeroed in. I call my dog back and silently watch, and what I made out made my heart completely drop. There was a man crouched about 75 feet directly in front of me, wearing not camo clothes, but some raggedy shit with a hood that blended into the environment perfectly. Actually, it was almost like a makeshift ghillie suit, but with his face exposed. I couldn't see his eyes, and his face was covered in dirt or something, but I knew we were staring right at each other at that moment. So, I stare, for what seems like minutes. No words. I felt like I was trying to subconsciously convey that I was going to stand my ground. I wanted him to know I saw him, but I guess I was just too shaken to speak. As I'm staring, my little dog at the backside started to bark her head off again, like she was scared, and I also had to get off that hill before total dark, or I could be seriously hurt or risk dying trying to get back down. So, carefully, I start heading down the hill with my dog, who doesn't want to leave but listens. Periodically, I would stop with my back against a tree holding me up, and look in that direction again just to make it even more clear I saw him, and eventually I make it down to the boulders at the bottom. 
by the time I finally jumped down and hit the boulders, my little dog had stopped barking. I could only see the top of my tent from the bottom of the boulders. I thought she was barking just to bark, or just barking back at my dog, but when I get there, my little dog had somehow made it out of the tent and was walking around the campground growling, with her tail sticking straight out. Still trying to hold it together, I thought, okay, maybe she just got her nose between the zippers and worked her way out but I was positive I'd zipped it so that the zipper was at the very top of the tent door, out of reach. So, in a mixture of being terrified, pissed off, and a feeling of needing to do something, I reached into my day bag and pulled out my 40 caliber. I fire a single shot into the air as the sun was setting. I climb into my tent without eating, and I lay my gun next to me until first light. As soon as the sun came up, I was packing up my shit and leaving, heading back down the mountains. It sucks. It was all downhill back, but I still couldn't cover the ground to get back to my car in one day. It was dark by the time I made it to the last camp, about four miles from my vehicle, but thankfully there were other people there. We sat around a fire they made, and I felt pretty relieved and safe. They start to tell me they're planning to head the way where I was the night before in the morning, so I tell them my story in detail. Needless to say, we were both walking back to our cars in the morning. Screw all that. The thing that still creeps me out to this day, though, is when I got home and started reading reviews of the same hike I was on, other people had similar experiences like mine as well. Even a man found dead from a fall around the same boulder range two years ago. And a woman found murdered last year. I grew up in the Midwest. About ten years ago, I moved to a small coastal town in the Pacific Northwest where I would work for a company that runs cabin rentals and a water taxi service, transporting campers and hunters, and sometimes freight, to various locations, sometimes just 20 minutes away, sometimes hours away. During the winter a few years ago, we had a couple staying in one of our very basic cabins, like the kind of cabin you'd stay in at summer camp. My understanding was the guy was taking a class at the trade school in town, so he'd be gone all day while the woman, Jane, stayed at the cabin with their three dogs. We never saw her outside while he was away. One day, Jane burst into the office in tears, hysterical. She told us Richard had been beating her for days, starving her, that he'd been locking her in the cabin while he was away, that he even threatened her with his dogs. We immediately called the police to the office, and while we waited for them to arrive, she told us the details of their relationship. Jane was from South Africa and came from quite a wealthy family. Her father had recently passed away and she received quite a large inheritance. She met Richard on this social media site and he sold her on this bogus dream of building a remote lodge and it even convinced her to transfer all this money she just inherited to his bank account, which he spent on a remote piece of property, a new truck, and a boat, among other things. Jane was totally at Richard's mercy she'd voluntarily transferred the money to him. It was evident that she'd grown up wealthy. She didn't seem to have any idea how to take care of herself. By the time the police arrived, she reversed her story. She wouldn't tell them that he'd hit her, threatened her, or locked her in the cabin. I walked over to the cabin with the officer to talk to Richard, and of course he denied everything. The cop was very frustrated. It was clear Richard was mistreating her but he didn't have enough to make an arrest. I told Richard he needed to leave the property anyway. I didn't want him there, and the woman didn't want to go with him. Jane had managed to get in touch with a friend in the US who bought her a plane ticket, and another employee and I had offered to drive her to the airport in the city, about 200 miles away that very night. Richard left without issue, and the last thing I said to him was don't come back and if I ever saw his truck in our area again, I would assume he was there to cause trouble and would call the police without hesitation. I felt terrible for the woman. She basically made a bad investment 
and had little hope of recovering any of that money. Months pass, it was well into the summer, and I'd all but forgotten about this incident. I'd heard Jane had gone back to Richard, and they were back in town from another water taxi operator. He'd been transporting them to and from their remote property because Richard wrecked the boat that he bought with Jane's money on the rocky beach. One day I answered a phone call from a very distraught woman from the other side of the country. She was desperately trying to find her son, who had answered an ad Richard had posted online looking for help doing construction at the remote property. She'd just been calling the water taxi operators in the area, asking if anyone knew this guy Richard. Apparently her son Mike had called her from a satellite phone out at the property. He told her he was in danger. They weren't getting along and Richard finally ran him off. This property was out in the middle of nowhere, accessible only by sea or air. There were no roads. You can't just tell someone to leave. Where would they go? Mike's mother relayed to me that Richard wouldn't let him sleep in the cabin, that he wouldn't share food, and that he'd even chased him with a rifle when he realized Mike had the sat phone. It was lucky he managed to get the call out. Mike's mother called with the intention of hiring us to pick up her son. I told her, Miss, this is an emergency. We need to contact the police. I contacted the state police and coast guard immediately, and they jointly dispatched a boat and a helicopter to the area to rescue this guy. Mike was rescued safely, and Richard was arrested. Jane was there too, but she refused to come back with the police. She stayed at the cabin. Mike came out to the office a few days later to meet me. He gave me a big hug and thanked me. He was convinced I'd saved his life which was a nice sentiment, but in my opinion, the police and coast guard saved his life. He told me some more details of his experience, that Richard had actually taken several shots at him while he was chasing him through the woods. He told me when Richard caught up to him, he held him at gunpoint, ordered him to strip naked, and locked him in a shipping container that he had on the property. He was convinced he was going to die. He was still locked in the shipping container when the state police arrived, Mike didn't stay for long, but I was impressed that he took the time to come out and introduce himself, and I wished him luck. Richard was charged with attempted murder, but I believe those charges were ultimately dropped, and that Mike had ended up with a hefty settlement from the inheritance money Richard had swindled from Jane. I received a phone call later that summer from a reporter in the city, asking about what had happened. Mike's mother had given him my information. I agreed to tell him what I knew on the condition that he not mention my name or the name of the company I work for. The other night I was having a few beers with my neighbor Al, a young guy who moved to town last year. This story popped into my head and when I mentioned Richard's name, he perked up. They worked together at the shipyard. I can't believe it. This fuck is back in town. Without Jane this time working a minimum wage job. So Richard, you lord of the fly psychopath, let's not meet again. Growing up in the Appalachian Mountains, I could give you a million times as a kid and young adult that I felt scared or paranoid playing in the woods. It's a beautiful place, and I spent my entire childhood getting lost out there by myself or with friends. As kids, we never got too far out there, but you actually could see the progression of us venturing further and further out as we got older, due to the forts and carvings we would leave. This one particular time, like a thousand times before, my friend and I had just graduated high school. It was our last summer of freedom and we spent the entire summer camping and hiking out there. We had decided to try and find a new place to set up camp and walked for what felt like a few miles before we came to a nice clearing. The area was relatively new to both of us. We got the camp set up and fire going and the plan was to wait until nightfall, smoke some weed and play some Monopoly. For sake of backstory on my friend and I, my buddy is a smaller, real goofy guy but he comes from a family of foresters and always had a deep understanding of all the trees and different plants you came across. 
He had no fear of going and camping out by himself. If I spent 10,000 hours in the woods, he probably spent 50,000. As for me, I'm a taller, sturdier guy, and as we got older, I spent more time worried about women and sports, and the woods became a place for small parties. Also, I never had the balls to camp out alone. In fact, older me wouldn't go far at all when I was alone, because I could never shake the feeling of being watched, which was just paranoia, but it was still an uneasy feeling. Anyway, camp is set, fire is going, but it's getting lower and needs wood. Sun is down and we're both cutting up and having a good time. My friend is sitting on this little chair he always brought and loading up the makeshift bong, and I was crouched, breaking some excess limbs off some of the logs we gathered for the fire. All of a sudden, this strong breeze cuts through the clearing. I couldn't tell you if it was the suddenness of it or what, but my friend and I both stopped immediately and looked at each other. The breeze went just long enough to flicker our fire down to a small flame. We both sat still in almost total darkness. Neither of us said a word. Across from us on the other side of the fire, we could hear footsteps. They sounded like someone was running and would slow down to a walk and then run again, definitely on two legs. By the sound of it, they were pacing back and forth over the same spot. Then, just like it had started, it stopped with a softer crunch on the underbrush. I knew by the sound of it they'd taken a crouch. I was crouched still and knew I was staring right at it in the dark. My friend grabbed my shoulder and said, Buddy. And when he did, I felt this surge of fear come over me. I could feel it and hear it in him. I'd been so fixed on the footsteps and rationalizing what I'd heard that I hadn't even considered being afraid. But this was true fear. It was raw and made me feel helpless. I could hear my friend after a while grab some leaves and he dropped them on the fire. For the split second the leaves covered the fire, we were in pure darkness. Then the fire sprang to life. We both quickly grabbed more leaves and brush and threw it onto the fire. I got some sticks and logs on there and neither of us took our eyes off the spot or moved much for over an hour. Finally, the leaves crunched and it slowly walked off. Whatever it was had sat crouched watching us without moving for far longer than any animal would. It wasn't until after those footsteps disappeared that I realized the smell had disappeared as well. It smelled like a paper mill, spoiled eggs almost. For the rest of the night, besides whispered remarks, neither of us really moved or stopped looking at that spot. Nobody went into the tent, and I had very short light sleep sitting on the ground with my head rested on my hands. My friend never went to sleep. In the morning we packed up and silently walked home. To this day we talk about it. In the seven to eight years since it happened, my forester friend has not camped out there by himself since. So, I live in a country that was pretty rural until the last 10 to 15 years. The biggest town in our country is pretty crowded now, overcrowded and I hate it. I moved from there to the countryside. I like where I live, except it can be really creepy at night, because for miles and miles it's dark with no street lights. One thing about this country is that the main roads always get backed up really quick, or there's an accident, or whatever so it pays to go the back roads. The back roads, like any other rural place, are less populated, dark, has lots of trees. There are no sidewalks. Anyway, a few years ago, something happened that almost made me stop using them. I was driving home kind of late one night. I decided to take one particular back road that shaved off 10 minutes from my commute home. I was tired and had to get up early, so I was going fast trying to get home soon. This road is a little more populated than some, but it's really spooky in some stretches because huge trees are along the side of the road and their branches and leaves make a tunnel of sorts. So, I'm zipping through and round a curve. Up ahead, I see what I thought was a giant garden flag. 
You know the flax that people put up in spring in their yards? Well, I thought it was a weird flag because it seemed like it was very tall and large, and it was in the middle of the road. As I got closer, my headlights hit it, and it's not a flag. It's a person. A lady. She was wearing a red fez, a long flowy white dress, and an orange reflective sash across her chest. A little strange because she's in the middle of the street. As I drove past her, it got weirder. As dark as it was, as I drove by, I could see she was about 60. She had glasses, and I could see her bright blue eyes. She looked in my passenger window, and she started doing this weird bounce thing. I thought she was going to try and get into my car. Mind you, I'm going pretty fast. I don't know what it was about her, but she freaked me the fuck out. I didn't think she would rob me. I really thought she was a soul snatcher or skinwalker. I honestly didn't think she was human. I can't adequately describe how creepy she was. I sped past her as fast as I could. I kept glancing into my back seat to make sure she'd not materialized in my car. I prayed, recited scripture, and kept watch in my rearview mirror. It was spring so it was a little warm, but I felt bone-chillingly cold. I finally made it home and I run to tell my mom the story. I got in just as my brother was telling my mom about this weird lady he saw while he was driving. It was the same lady, but he saw her at the inspection from the highway and the back road whereas I saw her further down the road. We both had the same reaction. She also tried looking in his car. She was also bouncing around when he saw her. He said there was a car in front of him that sped off so fast when they drove past the lady. My brother was so freaked out that he won't travel that road anymore, even during the day. Eventually I found out that the lady lives in the woods. Apparently at one time, her family lived on that road. Her father was ill and she tried to take him to the hospital. He died on the way there and she drove around with his body in her car for hours. I guess she has mental health issues and I think she lost the house or got kicked out. I have friends that live off of that street, so when I was talking about it, they knew exactly who it was. I still go on that road, but I haven't seen her since. I do hope she's okay, but I really do not want to run into her again. So this encounter happened many years ago and I was very young. It was in 2001 or 2002 and I was 11 to 12 at the time. My uncle was interested in purchasing some land near Red Oak, Oklahoma. I don't know exactly where but it was several acres in a very remote area. My father, mother and myself decided to accompany him one Saturday to scope out the property. From our home it was a little more than a three hour drive but we all love riding in the car. So while it was not going to be the most eventful road trip, we just went to get out of the house. Upon arrival, I remember being very underwhelmed by the place. No houses anywhere near, and hardly even any signs of life at all apart from a few birds. And the wooded area wasn't exactly what I would call picturesque. Still, we parked our car off the road to go explore the woods a little, my uncle was talking about buying the land for hunting, not really my cup of tea. As we walked through the woods, it was a very nice day, but still, something felt off. Everyone in our group remarked about the eerie feeling, but my dad and uncle seemed to laugh it off. My mom had goosebumps and kept looking over her shoulder, which made me on edge too. She was very insistent that it was weird and she wanted to leave saying it felt like she was being watched. After a bit of hiking, I noticed that there was a small red building. I've seen bigger storage sheds in the suburbs, but it looked well built. My uncle said there was nothing about it on the listing, so we went to peek inside. The door was open, and inside there were open cans of food, a ratty blanket on the floor, and it stunk unlike anything I'd ever smelled before. Following this discovery, we all agreed it would be best to get back to the car if there was some crazy hermit living in the woods that we didn't want to be around to find. 
The only issue is, we'd walked pretty far into the woods and now weren't exactly sure which direction was correct. The eerie feeling really ebbed up and we were all on edge. We ended up trekking another mile before we finally found the road, but we were further down from where we'd parked the car, but at least we could just follow the road now. Walking along the road, we came across a truly unsettling sight. Right in the middle of the asphalt was a dark grey cat on fire. I have no idea why a cat was out in the middle of nowhere or how it came to be killed and set alight. Obviously this had just happened, but there was no one in sight. Naturally we ran the rest of the way to the car. There was a huge scratch in the paint all down the side of it from the hood to the trunk. Thankfully that was the only damage and my dad was able to start it without any trouble and we drove away as fast as we possibly could. My heart is speeding up just recounting this moment. It's definitely one of the scariest in my life. Needless to say, my uncle did not buy the land, and I'll always remember this terrifying encounter, but like anything over time, I sort of pushed it to the back of my mind, and it just became one of those moments you occasionally retell at family get-togethers years later so much that it's almost just a funny story. The reason I'm sharing this is because I was reminded of it last night while binge watching some episodes of BuzzFeed Unsolved on YouTube when they shared the story of a family that disappeared in the same area while also looking at some land for sale. The Disappearance of the Jameson Family is the name of the video if you're interested. The family died in the same area we were searching, roughly seven years after we made our trip there. There are many theories about their deaths, including the allegations of some sort of cult in the area, complete with something about dead cats. Coincidence, probably, but the whole story gave me chills. So if my family narrowly avoided being killed by some witches or a cult or whatever, or if we just stumbled upon a hermit who didn't want us in his woods, This is a story that my mother and aunts told me when I was in high school. I'm 21 now, and it has never left me. I think about it constantly and ponder over what happened. My grandfather passed close to a year ago in June of 2020. He was 96 when he died, and it caused some issues in my family. They don't really pertain to the story, but there are some things about him that I have to share in order to explain the story in the best way. My grandfather... John was a man who was extremely calloused and old-fashioned. He was bitter, abusive, and a complete macho man. My mother was raised on never showing emotion or pain due to his abuse and lack of compassion for others. He was also an extreme racist. He had many secrets in my family that are now coming to light after his death. Everything that happened around him was brushed off and forgotten because he had more important things to do like drinking and having affairs. Just an overall intense and very no-nonsense type of man. He was also not religious at all and found things like faith and hope stupid. This story takes place sometime in the 70s, most likely early to mid-70s. My mom was born in 1965 and remembers this story clearly. My aunt as well remembered this happening, but no one knows exactly what year. One summer day, John decided to take his family on a small outing with the intent to have a picnic in the woods. My mother, her three sisters, and her mother were all there and very excited about this. Where we are from, my family is more than accustomed to the woods and has lived in this area for generations. Going into the woods for a fun family activity was nothing out of the ordinary and seemed to be just another normal day. They made their way down a dirt backwoods road and stopped once they found a clearing large enough to accommodate them. As all the kids started jumping out of the car and messing around as kids do after being stuffed together, my grandmother began unloading their food and picnic supplies. John began surveying the area and deciding where to set up. As he was doing that, something in the woods past the clearing caught his eye. Before going to see what was out there, he yelled to the family and said he would be right back. 
The kids and my grandmother didn't think much of this since they're used to the woods, and these woods, in particular, were very familiar to them. They continued unloading and setting up the stuff they brought. One of the girls pointed out something in the clearing that caused a sudden shift from a normal day to something far worse. It was a dirt mound that looked like something was buried under it. This mound was about the size of a small person, maybe even child-sized. It was too big to simply be any animal in these woods. There was nothing but squirrels and raccoons in the area. Scattered amongst the mound were large river rocks. There was no pattern, but they were definitely placed on the mound intentionally. Also, the dirt seemed to be freshly disturbed, as though something was just buried. It was loose and slightly darker than the area around it. The mood immediately shifted from an average day in the woods to something much darker. My grandmother became concerned and told the girls to stay away from it. She was clearly upset and worried about it, but she did her best to ignore it. The girls, all being children, didn't have the same amount of worry and continued playing while just avoiding the mound. They tried to return to their picnic and the girls were already chasing each other in circles again. It was supposed to be a joyous, sunny day, and my grandmother wanted to keep it that way. Things seemed to return to normal for a beat. The trees around them created a dense wall of foliage, blocking their view from anything else inside the forest. One of the girls again took notice of something strange. It was immediately clear what it was. Along one of the long branches of the tree hung a noose, it was tied with a rope and hung high above their heads. A lump of dirt can be explained away by nature, but someone had to have placed the noose there. My grandmother stopped dead in her tracks when she first saw it. Something was wrong. Very, very wrong. They couldn't just pack up and leave. John was still out in the woods. Even children can recognize a noose as a symbol of death. The children started to become very anxious. Whatever innocence was keeping them from worrying about the mound had completely vanished. My grandmother, the resilient woman she is, soothed her children and told them it was just left by deer hunters, but she knew in her heart that they needed to leave. No deer hunter would hang a deer and then bury it, at least no sane deer hunter. It wasn't until they started hearing something in the woods that they began to really panic. My grandmother, as well as the children, began hearing a rhythmic chanting from deep in the woods. It sounded as though there were a group of people all singing in deep voices to a beat of a drum. It went in a quick pattern, three steady beats followed by a pause, and then it would repeat. It sounded far away, but immediately fear began to take hold of each of them. They each listened and gathered together. As the seconds passed, it began to increase in volume. It was getting not just louder, but closer. What started out as a distant echo soon began to engulf the entire clearing. My grandmother was terrified and wanted desperately to leave, but John had yet to return. They waited, fear-ridden, as the sound began to fill their chests. It felt like they were at a concert as the deep bass began to vibrate in their chest. It was everywhere and constant, as though the sound was being made by the trees themselves, surrounding the family in every direction. Suddenly, the sound of yelling broke through the constant drone of chanting. John's voice was yelling out to them from the trees. Go, he yelled. Get in the car. He came running out of the woods, yelling that they needed to leave. They had never seen terror on this man. He was a man afraid of nothing, unbothered by the world around him. This was the most emotion any of them had ever seen from him. He saw something in those woods, something that shook his very being to the core. My grandmother began throwing everything back in the car as the kids got in as well. John and my grandmother picked up their things as quickly as possible and threw them all into the car. They had no care for the things they were packing up due to their fear. Food was all over the trunk, and items were broken. After everything was tossed in, they both got in the car and drove away. This is where the main grunt of the story ends, but one fact from this story is what really has caused me to wonder all these years.
My grandfather has refused to ever speak of what he saw. He never told any of the children or my grandmother. Every time this was brought up, he quickly rebuffed it and angrily told them not to ask again. He never went to the police or told someone outside of the family. My grandfather is the only person who knows what happened that day. When I first heard the story, I swore to myself I would ask him one day. Now I can't, and I regret it greatly. By the time I was in high school, he had moved out of the state with other family members, and I mostly lost contact with him outside of the occasional happy birthday calls or letters. This story doesn't have an answer to go with it. When he died, the only thing I was sad about was never knowing what happened that day. We weren't close when I got older, and once I learned of all the abuse he caused, I separated myself from him. His death looms over me, and this story still haunts me to this day. My mother and aunts just look back on it as a spooky memory from their childhood. Nothing more than a story to spook the little ones at Thanksgiving with. I'm one of the only people in the family who is still curious about what happened. I've always been interested in mysteries, the occult, horror, and conspiracy theories. This story piqued my interest more than any others in the family. Which, by the way, this isn't the only strange story from my family, but it is definitely the most strange. I wish I had answers. I hope you all find this story as fascinating as I do. I've spent my life in Georgia and love hiking all over, but I must admit, North Carolina has the best mountains. For this reason, I frequently drive up there and hike and camp. This time, I went up with my family in an RV and stayed with them in Maggie Valley. The next day, however, I had them drop me off about 10 miles away at the Cold Mountain Trailhead, and I planned to hike up and spend the night and be back down in the morning. I was by no means inexperienced at hiking or camping, but I had never camped alone. On top of that, I didn't bring a pistol. On the way up, the trail was surprisingly strenuous, not necessarily steep. I've hiked some steep stuff out in the west, but more like a ton of ups and downs and feeling like it wouldn't end. Eventually, it began to get darker, and I realized I needed to stop and set up while I still had light so I stopped about a half a mile short of the summit and figured I would continue in the morning. Nothing eventful happened. I set up camp in a really good spot, ate my food, and went into the tent. At this point, I realized I hadn't run into a single other person my entire way up. This wasn't eerie at the time, but soon would be. I have trouble sleeping and usually lay awake for up to an hour trying to sleep. I thought I heard someone lightly walking around the general area because of the rhythm of the steps. I brushed it off as my mind running wild, but I did pull my big old knife out of my bag and put it next to me in the sleeping bag. That morning, I woke up and ate oatmeal. As I ate, I looked over my tent and noticed a strange bundle of dried twigs and berries tied with green cord propped against my tent. Internally, I was pissing myself but I packed my stuff up and took off within five minutes. And no way I bothered going to the summit. I headed straight down. On the way down, I realized there was a pretty heavy fog, and I ended up on a side trail that eventually ended and I was lost. I used a compass to eventually reorient myself, and I found the trail again. I made it out with no other incident. However, I come to find out the same morning a 27-year-old died on the same section of trail as me, and it's possible I would have run into him had I not gotten lost and rejoined the trail later. His family seemed to have scrubbed the internet of several articles on him. The scariest part was knowing that someone knew where I was and watched me, and I had no clue about them. Also, the circumstances surrounding the guy's death are weird. You can find articles about him. He supposedly fell trying to climb out of a ravine, but he was away from his backpack and it called 911, but he didn't get to speak to anyone on the line.
This is a true story, and I've been kind of obsessing over what the fuck happened out there. I'll try to keep it as brief as possible without leaving out key details. I grew up deep in the mountains of Shishon County, an hour from a grocery store. The wilderness is my peace and my home, but these woods, they are evil, and I never should have come to Washington. My wife's uncle bought some land just north of Spokane, Washington, with a friend of the family. They got it at a significant discount because a nearby aluminum smelter had polluted the ground and it was impossible to use the water beneath it. They had set up two plots and each had a camper to live in. Jay had been progressively getting paranoid and saying people were stalking him and watching him in the trees. About three months into living there, a man wandering through the woods there had an interaction with Jay and ended up attacking him and breaking his jaw. Upon being arrested, the man said he was overcome with a desire to see if he could kill him with a single punch. Two months later, my wife's uncle Jay was murdered in his sleep on the couch in his camper. His friend Kay found him and immediately ran as far away until he stopped to call the police. There was sufficient evidence of who did it and they quickly caught the killer who was a 19 year old boy who said he simply wanted his bike. He beat him to death with a power tool that was lying on the floor nearby, completely bashed his brains in. Kay was completely terrified at all times to be there alone. He had moved in with a family member until eight months later. He ended up with nowhere else to go and he had to return. In constant fear, he finally convinced my pregnant wife and I to come stay with him. The second I turned off the highway onto the property, I was overcome with dread. There were at least 250 crows covering the dirt road up to the property. I didn't sleep whatsoever the first night. I stared into the forest, searching for the cause of my intense fear. The energy of this place was so uncomfortable, and I assumed it was simply just knowing that my wife's uncle Jay was killed here. Even the days were eerie. Never did I have a moment where I didn't feel watched here. My wife and I always had a sense of fear especially after dark. Things sort of normalized for a while, until one day, Kay began puking and feeling very lightheaded all the time. I took him to the hospital and they said he was fine, probably a flu. At this point, it was the anniversary of Jay's murder. Three days after the date of Jay's death, Kay comes running out of his camper screaming, I can't breathe, waking my wife and I up and we run out to see what's wrong. Kay had gotten into his car and floored it, crashing into a nearby tree. I run up and peer through the window to see the most intense and most primal fear I have ever seen in someone's eyes. He was gasping and clutching his chest. Moments later, he breathed out one last time, and he was dead. We gave him CPR for 30 minutes until EMS arrived. On July 10th, one year and three days after moving there with Jay, and they both were dead. Now it's only the wife and I alone on the property. Every moment living in fear and not understanding what had happened here. I don't know why we didn't leave right away. One day I come out to get fresh water from a drum we kept and I smell the worst thing I'd ever smelled. The water container had a one inch opening on top and inside the water were bits and pieces of chipmunks, like spines and heads. They didn't fall in. Something ripped them apart before putting them inside. The nights were getting worse and worse. I never saw anything other than shadows messing with my eyes. I was nearly always filled with unease and intense fear Fear in the woods, even at night, is new for me. We all get a little spooked in the thick of the wilderness and pure darkness, but compared to my home, this wasn't even a wilderness. The snapping of branches and pine needles crunching underfoot haunted my every night. The screeching owls loved to chime in right at the height of anxiety. My nights were spent peering into the pines, watching always waiting for whatever evil to present itself. I knew it was out there, and it wanted me to know it too. 
One night, my wife and I return home to having the worst feeling I've ever felt. Every second driving up the long dirt road increased my anxiety tenfold. Something bad was ahead, and it was clear. The thick fog shrouded the pines. If it wasn't for the glimmer of the full moon, it would have been pitch black. Everything looked different, although it was right where we left it. Nothing seemed out of place. Looking around, I suddenly see this orange, long-haired, manged cat sitting on a stump. The cat's eyes were so intense, fiery, almost glowing but not quite. The cat, in my mind, was the embodiment of pure evil. I saw darkness in its soul. We started hearing branches snapping, pine needles crunching, seemingly from every direction. The brush was swaying back and forth clearly indicating something was running within. Here I am, still staring at this cat, almost frozen in fear. Suddenly a voice breaks out, echoing throughout the forest. Hello, is anyone out here? A little girl, I thought, but something was off. My gaze finally breaks with the cat, and my eyes start towards the road. My wife yells back, Hello, are you okay? Anybody. The voice had changed. Help. Help me. It was the same person or thing yelling, but as if it was trying to disguise its voice. We yelled back several times without response. Somebody fucking help me. The most intense, shrieking, evil-sounding voice of a woman called out. It cut deep into my body. I'm filled with more intense fear than I can ever describe. But my wife, she's overcome with the need to find this person, and she started to head off into the forest without a word. I grabbed her by the arm, telling her something isn't right. Why won't she respond? She tries to break free from me to go off alone. I tell her to get in the truck and I'll grab the spotlights, but we aren't going on foot. We roll the windows down, and I shine my intensely bright LED lights throughout the forest. We slowly creep down the road, yelling back. As we get further down the road, the voice strikes out. Please, why won't anyone fucking help me? The sounds are difficult to pin down in the woods, but this one was very close. I hit the brakes and stopped immediately. We shine the lights and yell back, searching. There's no sign of anyone when suddenly the voice explodes into the cabin of the vehicle, as if they were standing right outside my window. Help me. Somebody fucking help me. Leaving my ears hurting and ringing. I hit the gas and didn't look back. We called the police when I hit the highway, and afterwards they said there was nobody around. I picked up our stuff the next day, and my wife gave birth the following day. We never stayed there again after the baby was born. What the hell could do these things? I have never even believed in paranormal things before, but I don't know what else happened. I went camping with my girlfriend about four-ish years ago in the mountains, just east of where we live. We're both a little hippie, so we brought some toys, juggling bags, Diablo, Poi, whatnot, and we thought it might be fun to bring out our recently acquired brass singing bowls. We have three different sizes that produce different tones, with the middle-sized green bowl being our favorite, in both appearance and tone. If you've ever played a singing bowl before, you know they don't just make the tone by themselves, and it can take a little effort to get the tone out cleanly and clearly. In my opinion, that's kind of the fun of the bowls and coaxing the sound out of it. It adds a little bit of necessary skill and makes the singing bowls an instrument with a little exclusivity. The second night out there, after bedding down for the night, I wake up suddenly to hear the green bowl unmistakably singing. My girlfriend was in the tent with me, so it definitely wasn't her. Again, they don't sing by themselves. They have to be plain so of course both of us were rightly surprised, perplexed, and admittedly freaked out by the fact that this bowl was singing. 
Seemingly of its own accord, she nudged me to see if I was experiencing the same thing as she was, looked at me wide-eyed and said, Are you hearing this too? I nodded for fear that my speech would cause the bowl to stop. After staring at each other for what felt like an eternity, we quietly resolved to make our way over to the zipper flap of the tent and open it just enough to see what was playing our bowl. However, as soon as we started to move, the bowl stopped. And not just like someone stopped playing it and walked away. No, it stopped. The bowl muted. No resonating tone whatsoever. It was like someone had grabbed the edge of the bowl, like you would a cymbal on a drum kit, and silenced it instantly. After the muting, we rushed ourselves out of the tent in the hopes that maybe we would catch sight or sound of whatever it was that decided to stop by and play with our singing bowl. But alas, nothing was there. No footprints, no trail, no indication that anything at all had been anywhere near the bowl. We still cannot explain what happened that night, and it's one of those stories that even now sends a bit of shiver down my spine and makes my hair stand a little on end. Whatever played our bowl that night didn't feel hostile or angry, maybe curious and playful, but it definitely didn't want us to know what it was. I was camping out in the desert with four friends, three females and my older buddy. He's a bit weird but cool. We're all on drugs, it's one of the girls' birthdays, and while they're all sleeping in a camper, we're sleeping in our individual tents. It starts to rain pretty heavy, night falls, and everyone returns to their designated spaces. The girls are loud, but still I'm starting to fall asleep when I hear one of them call my name directly. I wake up. They're now yelling at me to come to the camper. Well, alright. I get dressed, unzip the tent, slosh through some mud, knock on the camper door and they let me inside. They all look pale-faced and shook. I ask them what's wrong and they tell me something is outside of the camper. I look around and the party stayed at the van, rolled my eyes and told them there was nothing out there. But they insisted and made me wait with them until they heard another sound. I remind them that they're on drugs, so it was probably just auditory hallucinations, but they swear it isn't, and I finally relent and sit down and wait. Minutes pass, nothing but the pitter-patter of raindrops, and then suddenly a scratching sound. It sounded just outside the camper. I tell them it's probably a tree branch, but they say it's something else and to go look. I sigh. I grab a flashlight and head out into the rain to do a circle of the camper. Nothing there. No footprints in the mud. No tree branches anywhere close by either. Weird. But there's nothing there. So I go back in and tell them the coast is clear. They're shook and still unsure. So I offer to just sleep there on the floor for a bit. I'm starting to doze off again when I hear a voice whisper. Can you hear me? Yes, I say, and start to wake up. What's up? And the girls are all silent. One of them finally stirs and says, You heard that too. It wasn't me. I sit up and look around. The other two girls are asleep. We're staring into each other's eyes when suddenly, we both, clear as day, hear a child laughing in the other corner of the van. What the fuck was that? I exclaim, and the girl who was awake says that she's heard the laughing before, and that's what scared her. So we wake up the other two to see if they were messing with us. They weren't. They were annoyed. So now I'm thinking, maybe it's someone's phone. We find all the phones and out them together as well as any other electronic devices. Suddenly there's a loud creaking sound just outside the front door. Christ, I yell out thinking maybe it was my guy friend. No response. I grab a broom and slowly open the door and peer outside, but there's no light and I can't see shit. I close the door and I'm freaking out. 
Now I'm wondering if some local townies or other campers were fucking with us. More scratching on the side of the camper. Suddenly I remember my friend is all alone. So I start to yell at him to wake up and to bring his guns over because I think there might be people fucking with us. After yelling for him loudly for 10 minutes, he finally wakes up and yells back that he'll be right over. He gets there and immediately I feel more secure. Two grown ass men, we can handle this. I catch him up to speed and he just mocks us and reminds us we're on drugs and imagining it, but I swear it's something real and he agrees to stay in the camper on the floor with me, ready to charge into the night if need be. We go quiet. We wait five minutes. Ten. Fifteen. We're falling asleep. And then the giggles. The damn child laughter returns from just outside the van. My friend thinks it's one of the girls messing with us and tells us to just go to sleep. They swear it's not them but he doesn't believe them and just lays back down. Not ten seconds later, there's a loud creak sound again and scratching, and it sounds like someone is just outside. He sits up alert, looks at our horrified faces with the same expression, we told you so, and he rushes out of the camper into the darkness and rain, and we hear him fly around the van yelling, but he comes back and reports. No one was there. We start to talk about the campground being haunted. Old burying ground maybe. We don't know. At this point we're jabbering on just to hear our own voices. We all agree to just stay awake until the morning. The sun rises. The rain dries up. We pack up and leave. I'm getting gas in a local town when suddenly the thoughts hit me. I google. Psst, can you hear me? And this is when I discover the Evil Tron. Yes, friends. A small, sadistic, sinister electronic device that emits creepy sounds and can be attached to any metal surface. It was my weird friend. He had hid it underneath the girl's whipping canister. In fact, it wasn't theirs. It was his canister, and they lifted it from his tent while he slept. But he knew. He knew what they tried and he tricked them, like a Trojan horse, into bringing the device into their camper. I was collateral damage, and he just went with it, silently chuckling to himself. The mastermind. The damn mastermind. The fallout was bad between him and the girls, but I thought it was the best prank I'd ever seen pulled off. To this day, bravo. I was far up north, far north British Columbia, Canada, working in an oil rig camp out in the woods. I was working as a cook. I went out one afternoon for a smoke on the back deck. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon. It was a very quiet, still winter day. It was snowing those kind of big snowflakes that make it look like the world's moving in slow motion. So, as I was standing there smoking, just staring off in the distance, not looking at anything in particular. You know, looking left, right, up and down, and at my feet, whatever. I felt something looking at me. Then I looked straight ahead. About thirty feet or less in front of me was the tree line in the forest, and directly in front of me, in between two trees, I see the most gigantic wolf I've ever seen. This thing sitting, looked like it was the size of a man standing. It was massive, sitting there and just staring right at me. We locked eyes, then I looked away for a split second and then looked back and it was gone. I don't know, it just gave me the weirdest feeling. It was definitely like, hey, I see you, I could eat you, but I won't. Okay, bye. It's something I will always remember. Two or three times a year, we vacation in a cabin in the wilderness. Me, my wife, and our three young children and two dogs. 
I'm no stranger to the wild, and have made a lot of multiple day and week solo trips in national parks, and even in the Arctic Circle. Yesterday, I went for a 10 mile solo hike. At the farthest point, after two hours, I heard my children arguing, playing, crying, laughing, and calling me from the forest. I was totally alone and my first instinct was to run through the thick brush and trees to where the sound was coming from, but then I realized that it couldn't be my kids, and that I should just walk on and ignore it. I decided to walk back to the cabin. The whole family was there and never left. I know how my children sound, and I swear it was them. Later I realized the combination of all the sounds, laughing, crying, and playing and whatnot, made no sense. What was this experience? What did I hear? My brother is two years older, and we've probably spent tens of thousands of hours and then some in the woods together. Whether it was building forts or BMX tracks to LARPing and hunting, We've traveled across the US exploring caves, canyons, cliff diving, mountain biking, camping, hunting whitetail, mule deer, wild boar, and whatever else. Since 2016 when we get the time off, I feel like adding this is important because there's genuinely nothing I wouldn't do or fear when I have him by my side, but this time was different and we both felt it. We've had our fair share of adventures and stories to tell of all sorts, but this one has felt like a lingering stain on my memory. We're both mid-twenties, and it was 2019. This was probably my fifth time hunting the area, and the first I brought my brother along. It's a large forest area of public land that has a few country roads which are basically two tracks that stretch miles throughout the area. We make the trip up in my truck with our tents three in total, one for each of us, and another to change in and keep our gear in. Without making this long-winded, we set up camp a couple of miles from the truck, which we drove for quite a few miles through the trails, basically the middle of nowhere. The nearest main road is probably eight to ten miles away. We arrived late in the night, set up camp, and quickly fell asleep after a long trip. We spent the next day scouting and tracking, then made back to camp for the night. We cooked, then ate, had some beers and bullshitted. The night was still early, but we had a long day and decided to head off for the night. Everything up until this point was normal. I suddenly awoke to something smacking my tent and hearing my brother's voice call my name. I knew something was off. I called back to him and he immediately unzipped my tent and made his way inside. I could tell that he was disturbed when I went to ask him what's wrong, and he immediately grabbed my shoulder and told me to shush. The sun wasn't up yet, so I think it was around 4.30 a.m. We sat in my tent, and what we heard still confuses me to this day. I can only explain it as whale sounds, different tones of extremely loud noise that I could feel throughout my body. It would come and go but there would only be a few seconds of silence in between the sounds. It would vary from high-pitched squeals and everything in between to very low sounds that had literal ground-shaking reverb. I regrettably didn't think to grab my phone or record anything that was going on because what I was hearing didn't seem real and in the moment I was awestruck. The sound went on until daylight started to break. I believe it was about an hour, but I'm not really sure. Neither of us spoke, and at the time, I felt like I could feel the energy around me, almost like my body was covered in white noise, if that makes any sense. It wasn't even minutes after the sound stopped it started to rain, and one of the craziest thunderstorms while I was camping happened. The forecast didn't predict or account for any rain the days we were going to be there prior to making the trip. All the stakes for the tent our gear was in completely ripped out of the ground, and both of our tents had multiple stakes ripped out as well. Those things we drove into the ground with an axe and would take some insane force to unearth every single one. 
My brother dismisses it and won't even talk about it, saying it was just machinery being dragged. But at the time, we both shared the same feeling of fear and dread. It just seems odd it was still the middle of the night and we were so far removed from any nearby communities or industry to hear and experience this occurrence. This happened circa 1971 or 1972, when my mother was about 14 or 15 years old. The incident occurred in a heavily wooded area near Montevallo, Alabama. My mother is the oldest of five children, and she has three sisters and a brother, who's the baby of the family. One weekend in the cooler months of the fall, my grandfather decided to take the whole family, my grandmother, my mother, and all my aunts and uncles, so seven people in total, into the woods for target practice with a rifle. My mother grew up quite poor, and they didn't always live in the best neighborhoods, so my grandfather wanted to teach the kids how to defend themselves with a rifle, if need be. Like I said, it was later in the fall, so the trees were bare and there were lots of leaves on the ground. The wooded area was just off a dirt road, so this was a fairly rural area they were in. Since it was so far off the beaten path, my grandfather became startled when he heard the roar of a car engine so deep in the woods. My mom remembered the car as being a blue Ford Galaxy. Despite the fact that my grandfather had a gun, he totally freaked out and told my grandma and the kids to hide under a pile of leaves in the woods. He hid with them. The man in the driver's seat got out dragged a woman's body out of the car and just dumped her there in the woods and drove away. After my grandfather was sure the man had gone, everyone came out of hiding and the woman sat up and stared them straight in the face. My grandfather asked the woman if she needed help. She said no, she would be fine. She didn't seem to be injured and obviously didn't want the help. She hadn't put up a fight with the man when he dragged her out of the car. So my father cut the shooting lesson short and decided to rush the kids home to safety. Well, on the trail back to the dirt road where my grandfather had parked their car, they passed the man in the blue Ford Galaxy driving out of the woods. My mom looked over and noticed that he had a huge machete laying across the front seat right beside him. My grandfather made sure that the man could see he was carrying a rifle, but everyone was careful not to give away what they'd just seen. The man struck up small talk with my grandfather, asked him how he was doing and what they were doing out in the woods. My grandfather explained that he'd just taken his family out for target practice with the rifle. The man told him to have a nice day and continue driving. The next day, my grandfather went back out to that spot in the woods. There was not a body there. However, he did find the woman's wig, her purse, some Kleenex, and a pair of eyeglasses. He collected the items and took them home. According to my grandfather, that area of the woods was known for having shallow graves and being a dumping site for bodies. My mother became hysterical when he walked in the door carrying that stuff. She started screaming. He killed that lady. He killed that lady. My grandfather ended up taking the items to the police station, but my mom doesn't think anything ever came of it. She never heard anything else about it after that. Well, she did hear one thing about it, I guess. Early the next morning, my grandmother called my mom when she arrived at work just before the kids left for school. She told them not to take the bus that day, that she would come home and pick them up and drive them to school. When my mom asked why, my grandmother said, because that car is waiting for you at the bus stop. I love going on late night drives. There's something about the empty road and the night air that just really chimes with me. 
I don't need to have a particular destination in mind. I just need gas in the tank. One night, not that long ago, I was out on one of my drives. I just come off the highway. I decided to drive up to a high point I knew of in the mountains. I figured that the view from up there would be pretty perfect. I planned on having a smoke and playing some tunes and then heading home. I live out in the sticks, by the way. It's not that uncommon for me to use mountain roads often. I was driving through some of these winding and narrow roads heading up the mountain, the type of roads which are sided by nothing but thick forest. I went over something. I don't know what it was, but shortly after I drove over it, my car started to make strange noises. There was like a hissing sound. I realized what had just happened. I must have driven over a nail or something because it sounded like I had a flat tire. There happened to be a little kind of rest area up ahead, so I decided to pull in and take a look. I was really annoyed. I loved my car and I threw most of my money into maintaining it. I had just upgraded my tires and now one had a puncture. The area wasn't big. I guess that it was primarily used as a rest area. You know, maybe for truck drivers with those long overnight drives. There was a restroom and a vending machine there. Since it was really late on a Sunday, no one was out. I had the place to myself. I parked my car and looked at my back tires. I could see the issue. There was a puncture. I was so annoyed. I lit up and just stood there, probably sighing and looking dejected. After the smoke, I decided that I might as well make use of the facilities, so I headed into the bathroom. Once out of there, I looked around. There was nothing but mountains everywhere. It was really quiet out, and I'll be honest, it was a little spooky to be there alone in the dark of night. My cell phone started ringing, and that made me jump out of my skin. I reached into my pocket and pulled it out, and I realized that it wasn't ringing. I was mistaken. Another phone was ringing, and it had the same generic ringtone mine did. It sounded as if the phone was coming from the other side of the little bathroom building. I was scared now. I didn't know if I was alone anymore. I loitered by my car for a while, expecting to see someone come out from behind the building, but no one did. Come to think of it, if there was someone out there, then they must have arrived on foot because there were no cars in the parking lot but mine. I decided to go check the back of the bathroom. I was half wondering if someone was hurt or something. Maybe someone lost their phone. I figured I might as well try and find out. I looked around the corner of the brick wall as stealthily as I could, and I couldn't believe what I saw. Lying on the ground were countless smashed cell phones. One of them was ringing. I thought about the chain of events which had led me to that parking lot, and then I ran back to my car as fast as I could. I didn't care about damaging my car. I just pulled out of there as fast as I could. I headed back down the mountain passes and back towards the safety of lights. I chose to drive off for a few reasons, and if they aren't obvious, I will break them down for you. So one, I believe that the flat tire was deliberate. I think that I drove over something that was probably placed in the road. It was placed strategically so that I would have to pull into the rest area to check my car. I think that the rest area is where something terrible happens. I think that the phones were smashed up and thrown there, but whoever had been doing whatever they had been doing with the phones failed to break at least one of them. So that's why there was one ringing. I wonder if one of the victims, and I say victims because I believe something sinister is going on, I wonder if it was one of the victim's friends or family members calling to see where they were. What makes me say this is because I can remember as clear as day that a lot of the phones seemed feminine. They had little stickers or gems. I could tell by some of their cases that they probably belonged to women. Now I think about it, maybe someone was calling to make me pick up the phone. Then when I was distracted, I would have been rushed. I'm not sure, but I'm very glad I got out of there without finding out. I reported this to my local police, and they said they would look into it, but I didn't hear back. I really wonder what might have happened if I answered the phone. I don't like thinking about what happened to all those owners of those phones. I have actually prayed once or twice 
that they just suffered a robbery. When I was in Afghanistan, we were in the mountains right on the Pakistani border. The first few months of deployment were pretty hairy, but as soon as winter rolled around, the fighting season dried up. Things got really quiet. Night shift went from, when are we going to get hit, to, what kind of weird shit am I going to witness tonight? I think it was February or so, and I was out on guard patrol in the north-facing machine gun shack. We all had night vision devices, so since it was pitch black, we always wore them on night shifts. Well, I was looking out into the mountains when I see what looks like a guy come crawling out from behind a boulder up the hill, about a hundred meters away. Being February, we hadn't gotten hit in almost a month because there was two feet of snow on the ground and the temperatures were hovering right around zero. So the Taliban chucked deuces back to Pakistan and left us alone for the cold months. Now, this guy was on all fours like an animal, just sitting there, half behind a boulder, seemingly staring into my soul. So I pointed the machine gun at him and turned on the visible laser. I put the laser right on his nose and didn't get a reaction. Nothing. The guy just stared at me. So at this point, I'm getting a bit freaked out. I'd been blown up, shot at, almost RPG'd, and now some local is playing fuck fuck games. I radioed into our tactical operations center that there was an unarmed local staring at me on the north post, and I either wanted someone to clear me to wax him, or come out and look at what I was seeing. E5 on the radio tells me he's sending a private out to babysit me. Fucking dick. The guy comes out, looks up at the hill at this guy, and promptly nopes out of there. He goes back to the tactical operations center and tells the E5 that there really was a guy just staring at us out on the mountain. So the E5 comes up to the shack, and I point this guy out. I shit you not, as soon as the E5 gets an eye on the local, the guy jumps up, hops up on the boulder, and starts screaming like somebody just dipped him in boiling water. Guard tower at the east corner can now also see the guy, and as soon as the crazy local started howling, East Shack loses about a 30 round burst of 762 out over his head. That shit is loud when it's dead quiet. The crazy guy jumps off the rock and runs down the mountain, screaming the whole way. It was dead quiet the rest of the night, but the commander upped security to 50% meaning half the guys on our outpost had to pull security for the rest of the night. The running joke for the rest of the winter was to be on the lookout for the mind-controlled experiment that the CIA lost track of. It freaked me out. Good for a story, though. I'm an ordinary single woman who will turn 30 this year. I've been thinking a lot about my life and I want to share this terrifying experience. It happened when I was young. When I was young, I lived in a quiet area of northern Kyushu. Ever since, I can remember my dad hasn't been in a picture. It's always just been me and my mom. She wasn't there as often as she could have been, I guess, because she had to work two jobs to keep a roof over our heads and food on the table. This happened in spring when I was in the early years of elementary school. I was on my way home from school. My mother did worry about me getting home by myself at first, but we didn't live all that far from the school. I came home from school as usual, headed into our building. We lived in a block of apartments. I took off my shoes and went inside. I put my school bag down, sat at the table, and started doing my homework. On top of the table was the dinner that my mom had prepared for me. In the morning, mom would head off to work at a nearby toy factory, and then on her lunch break she would come home and make something for my dinner. When she finished work at the factory, she would then head to her second job, working in a restaurant downtown. I was doing my homework. It was really tough. I wish I could have asked mom sometimes for help. It must have been about an hour after I came home from school when I heard something. I heard a man's voice call out. 
Hello, is someone in here? I looked up to see the dark silhouette of a man stood in our hallway. I always forgot to lock the door at that age. I say silhouette because of the way the sun in the west was behind the man. I couldn't see him clearly. I remember that the first thing that struck me about the man was the fact that he was wearing a white long coat, the kind that doctors wear. The man started speaking before I had the chance to think. Miss, terrible news, just terrible news. Your mother, she's collapsed in the factory and she's been taken to hospital. Oh my god, not mom I thought as I raced over to the doctor. I followed him out of the apartment. There was a big rusted black bicycle downstairs just outside of our apartment's lobby. He lifted me up and put me on the child's seat at the back and then climbed onto his seat and started pedaling. We rode off under twilight skies. I was looking off to the side, watching the city pass us by. I asked the man, is mom going to be okay? He didn't reply. I asked again, nothing. No matter how many times I asked him about mom, he didn't say a word. After a little while, I noticed something. Even though I was young, I thought that something was wrong. I realized that we were going the wrong way. We were heading towards the woods and the mountains, and the hospital was back in the other direction. Hey, mister, I don't think we're going the right way. He didn't say a word in response. I started to panic. I shouted at him. I tried pleading with him. I pretended I didn't care, but nothing I did could make the man talk. Then, a very basic but frightening question rose to the forefront of my mind, and that question was, where are we going? I was becoming more and more frightened by each passing second. All the town roads and sidewalks were behind us now. We were on trails and dirt roads. There were dense rows of trees either side of us. It was darker there too without the street lights. Why are we going down a dark forest road? The man just kept pedaling. We were not going to stop. I thought this man isn't a friendly man. He's going to hurt me. He wasn't behaving like any adults I knew. He wasn't like mom or my teachers. This guy was strange. In those moments of quiet contemplation, for the first time in my life ever, I thought about death or being killed. I was so scared that I just started to scream as loudly as I could. I wish I had the presence of mind to do it in the town where there were more people and more lights. My scream made the man talk. He spun his head around to me for a second and then said, We will be there soon. No need to scream. I'm a gentleman and I'm kind. He said that weird statement with a look of sheer frustration on his face. I knew that I needed to do something but it felt like I didn't have many available options. I decided to jump out of the bicycle seat. I then hit the ground really hard and scraped my knees. I staggered to my feet and then ran as fast as I could into the woods. I must have tripped and stumbled a couple of dozen times, but there was no way I was going to stop moving. From behind me, I heard the strange man yell out, Miss, where are you? Tell me and it will all be fine. Your mom is about to die. If you run away from me, then your mother will die. Do you understand? So hurry up and get out here now. He sounded angry at first, and then he went into a more friendly voice, as if he was calling a cat or something. Miss, come on out. It'll be fine. I'll take you to see your mom. Come on. I felt disgusted by him and his voice, but I didn't want mom to die. I wasn't sure if I should have gone back to the man or not. He was wearing a doctor's coat. I was wrestling with these thoughts in my mind. I was really torn. But then I reminded myself that there were no hospitals in the woods, and that made him a liar. And if he was comfortable enough to lie about the hospital, then he could have lied about mom too. I hid behind a really big tree, and I just waited until I couldn't hear the man anymore. Apparently. I was found the next morning in a cemetery at the foot of the mountain, which was about three kilometers from my home. I don't know how I managed to get there, but I was walking around in the dark. 
An old man who came to clean a grave found me hugging my knees to my chest beneath a big tree. I can't remember much of that. I found out that mom didn't collapse. She was fine. She came home from work and when she found that I wasn't home and that the door wasn't locked, she called the police and reported me missing. I have no idea what happened with the man, but my mom and I have our suspicions. We think that he must have known about my mom's workplace to feed me that lie of her collapsing in the factory. I don't know if there was an arrest. My mom tried to shelter me from replaying that night's events. We don't talk about it. There are a few questions that are left unanswered. What was the purpose of taking me out into the middle of nowhere? I'm not sure I want to know the answer to that one. Even today, when I try to remember that guy's face, I just can't. So you can imagine how much help I was to the police at the time. I cannot see his face. Everything is dark now. It was a traumatizing event, and one I am lucky to have survived. Back when I was in high school, I would go over to my friend's house and drink. She lived on the outskirts of town. I remember that I would have to walk down dark, unlit forest roads to get home from her place. It was usually fine in the summer, but in the darker months, it was too creepy. I say it was too creepy, but I still walked there and back at least twice a week. It was great to have a place to drink and chat without being disturbed. The walk home was always daunting but thanks to the wonderful power of alcohol, I managed to summon up the courage to hit the road, even when it was pitch black out. She lived down a dark and deserted road, which used to be a popular one. It ceased being popular when the soccer stadium in our town shut down. I think the team moved. It's not important. So I would walk home from my friend's house down this old, desolate road, which was always empty and quiet. One night, in one of the darker months, I heard some voices while I was walking home. I guess that there were about two or three men out there. Well, this is where you will have to forgive my teenage curiosity and stupidity. I wanted to see who those voices belonged to. The reason for this was because there were rumors around town that the forest area near the old stadium was a local haunt for gay people. I was dumb and drunk, so at the time I thought I would take a look to see if the rumors were true. Not the best move on my part, I know. I could blame the booze and say that my drunken state motivated me to go into the woods. I was always a little bolder whenever I was drinking. I knew the woods quite well, so I thought I would go unnoticed. I approached and saw some silhouettes through the gaps in the trees. It looked like one guy was surrounded by other men. The guy in the middle looked as if he was floating. It was the strangest thing. I could see this guy's legs dangling above the ground. Another guy was hugging the legs of this floating guy. I wanted to see what the hell was going on, so I decided to get a little closer. I got close enough for mumbled and half-whispered voices to be heard. I was watching where I was going. I stepped on a dead branch that I thought could take some of my weight, but I was wrong. It snapped. The mumbling voices stopped instantly. There was an awkward silence. I was feeling full of regret and now fear. Why did I have to come down here to see what they were doing? I should have known it was a bad idea. Next, something unexpected happened. I heard a snorting kind of laugh. A nasty laugh. I saw that there were three silhouettes facing towards me now. I prayed that I was hidden in the darkness of the trees. I stood there silently bracing myself to run at any moment. A muffled male voice then said, Oh, you want to be next, huh? That was enough for me. I ran as fast as I could, and I didn't stop until I saw streetlights. I got home without anything further happening, but it was really scary for me. I didn't really understand what one of those guys asked me. That's probably down to my naivety at the time, I guess. I know what it means nowadays, and by the end of this, you will know too. It's not what you're thinking it means though. When I got to class the following day, I noticed crowds of gathered students all chatting away. 
It didn't take long for me to find out what the topic of discussion was. In fact, several of my friends wanted to tell me the news. Apparently, someone had taken their life in the forest by the old stadium. There were cops all over town now asking people questions. They found a body hanging from a tree in the woods. So, what does that mean? Well, I think I saw the staging of a suicide out there in the woods that night. I think those other men had taken their life, and I saw them setting the scene when I went snooping. This was a long time ago, by the way, back probably when prejudices towards certain lifestyles were accepted. I wondered if the reason that man lost his life was down to the location he was in that night. If that is so, then the question I was asked by those men in the shadows is all the more terrifying. I reported what I saw that night anonymously from a phone booth, but I don't think anything was made of it. Why can I say that with confidence? Well, because five more men have taken their lives in those woods over a ten-year period. I wouldn't be surprised if those men all shared something in common. Thankfully, the old stadium was demolished and the forest area isn't there anymore. I hate to see nature get destroyed for more concrete constructions, but in this case, I feel kind of good about it. My friend and I were in the car ready to leave for a music festival when we got notice it was cancelled. We were all ready to go so we decided to just drive and find somewhere to camp for the weekend instead. We ended up in a sort of summer resort area upstate. It was the end of season, so the place was completely empty. But it was pretty, nice lake and scenery, so we figured we'd stay. There were no pesky families with kids to interfere with the partying we intended to do. The semi-creepy but friendly attendant assigned us to a site, so we drove down to it. We quickly noticed they'd put us in a site that was furthest away from everything, literally on the edge of the woods, surrounded by empty sites, completely isolated. We thought it was weird, but still, it's what we wanted, to just drink and smoke in the woods in peace. So we set up camp, then fucked around until it got dark. As soon as we settled down in the tent and put out the lantern, we heard an unmistakable sound off to the left of us, where there was nothing but empty campsites, maybe a hundred yards away. Someone was slowly and deliberately sharpening an axe or a knife against stone. Long, slow, metallic strokes, over and over and over. My friend was terrified, but I was laughing, thinking this attendant guy was obviously fucking with us city slickers. She insisted we would have heard him coming, and decided to call the check-in booth. He was still there. It was almost half a mile away. There was no way he could have gotten there in time, and we could still hear the sharpening sound, and the attendant guy confirmed there was no one else in the place except us. We ended the night locked in the car, holding a can of bear mace. My friend fell asleep, but I watched and listened all night. Shortly before sunrise, the noise stopped. The sun came up, and there was nobody around anywhere. I still can't explain it. This weekend, I went through the weirdest road trip of my life. So, for a bit of context, I work with my mom, and we fairly often go on long road trips for work. This weekend, we were coming back from a business fair about 14 hours away from where we live. After about one hour on the road, I noticed a blue SUV towing two bikes in front of me. I remember it stood out for me because the bikes were really nice ones. Eventually, this car overtook a truck and it got away from us. After about two more hours, I noticed a car overtaking us and it just happened to be the same blue SUV with the bikes from before. I even remember my mom asking if we'd seen this car before, and me answering, yeah, he probably stopped for gas or something and we passed him. The thing is, 
Along the next four hours, this happened at least two more times, even though we had stopped ourselves. At this point, I was already thinking it was weird, but this guy must make a lot of pee stops and likes to make back the time by speeding. We were about eight hours in when we got to a point where the road was completely blocked by other cars that had stopped. We assumed that there was some sort of accident in the road ahead, and that had stopped traffic. I didn't have internet to check, but I could still see a map of the area on my phone. So I started to check for alternative roads while my mom left the car to talk to the other drivers. I found out there was an exit from the main road about 200 meters from where we were and that I could use it to go through an alternative road that would take me back to the main one about 5 kilometers ahead. My mom got the same information from a truck driver who said it was a very narrow dirt road, too thin for his truck, but we could probably go through it and skip the accident. She also found out it had been a pretty bad one and that they probably would take a few hours to unblock the road. Knowing this, we decided to drive through the side road to the exit and try to find this alternative path. We also switched seats since I'm better with maps and my mom drives as well. It was already pretty dark at this point, but we had no problem finding this road. The thing is, it was a really bad dirt path so we had to go pretty slow. We even reached a small wooden bridge that I had to leave the car to check if it was stable, and it was totally deserted. A bit later, we reached a split in the road, and I look back at the map to see which way to take. I find out we should go left, but after taking a second look at the map, I noticed something that made me even more creeped out than I already was. The river we had just crossed was called Rio des Mortes, which is Portuguese for River of the Deaths, and it encountered the main road at the point we estimated the accident to be. I decided not to say anything, and we continued to follow the path until we got back to the main road, where we switched seats back again. At this point, the main road was deserted as well, probably because every single car going in this direction had stopped at the block in the road. After a short while, we started seeing a few ambulances go by in the opposite direction every now and then, which looked normal at first, but it eventually was looking like we'd seen way too many of them for a single accident. They also looked exactly the same, but that is what you expect of ambulances. The main road was also very dark at this point, and it went on without anywhere to stop for much longer than we remembered from our way back to the business fair. Eventually, a car starts to approach behind me, and after a little while, it overtakes us, and to make things even weirder, it just happened to be the exact same blue SUV with the bikes. We eventually pass by a big city, and I suggest we should stop somewhere to eat something a bit nicer, even though it would make the trip longer, and my mom agrees. All the weird stuff stopped happening after that, but I tried to google the incident when we stopped to eat, and then again a day later at home, and I couldn't find anything about it, which is pretty weird as well. As a crew guy on an off-road racing team in Baja, California, and Mexico, I got to test drive some rigs and trucks so technically a truck driver. We were driving down south along Sea of Cortez with a buddy at night at this four hour dirt road to Gonzaga, which is pretty much in the middle of fucking nowhere in the desert. And we see the lights of a car behind coming down fast and now effectively tailing us. And the bastard had bar mount headlights on top or what seemed like it, which are really bright. It's normal that locals and gringos get wasted in the nearest spring breaker town and then go down this road really fast to test their rigs since there's no police there. So I try waving him off to get the guy to keep his lights low since he's blinding us. But he isn't slowing down a bit nor does he turn the lights off and it's a really dangerous dark road. Finally, near a curb near the shore, I found a spot to bail off the road without crashing and we see the lights passing by us really fast and going straight to the curve. And we were like, that's it, 
he's going to crash down to the sea. But the lights didn't fall and kept going straight into the beach and the sea and then pitched up abruptly into the night sky and disappeared. We didn't say a word for a minute or so, and then my buddy says, Did you see it? And I say, The fucking flying truck. We didn't talk about it anymore, as it simply didn't make sense to talk about it, or with anyone else when we arrived. My friends and I were driving back from a rave in Denver. We take 287 from Fort Collins to Laramie because it's the quickest way home. 287 is a beautiful drive during the day, but empty and sketchy at night, especially during winter. I was in the back seat, so I missed this, but I asked my friend, who was in the passenger seat, to tell me the story again. Owl Canyon is a little two-lane detour that I think might have even been unpaved at the time. My friend said there was a car on the side of the road just after Owl Canyon, so rocky ass cliffs. It was pitch black either side of the road. There was a guy just chilling in the middle of the road in all black, trying to wave us down. We didn't see him till maybe like 20 to 30 feet, and we had to swerve to miss him. I don't know why he wanted us to stop, but I don't think it was for anything good. This would have been around 3 a.m. probably, and like I said, it would be empty out there at that hour. So this is weird. The helper in me is like, maybe he was in trouble, but I'm glad my friends have some street smarts, because if he had some bad intentions or some kind of weapon, we would have been fucked. We were all pretty young at the time too. This isn't as exciting as some other stories, but I wanted to give some Wyoming flavor to the sub. This state is so big and empty, there's no way there's not some backwards creepy stuff happening all the time. Every weekday, I would wake up early for a morning workout, then head to my job. Generally, I would leave my house around 5.30 because my morning drive took around 25 to 30 minutes, giving me enough time for two hours before I needed to leave before my shift started. Most of my drive was just putting loud music on, trying not to fall asleep, and it being a freeway before 6 a.m., almost everyone was going at least 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. I drive most of the time on a main interstate before turning off onto a smaller highway which I would only use for a mile or so. This highway was three lanes on each side. People also drive fast on here, but usually no more than 75 miles. And while you get some unsafe drivers in the morning, most people aren't swerving erratically. This highway runs north to south. An on-ramp from a main street becomes a lane. Then there are two entrances from the freeway I would take every day. One from the eastbound side, and one from the westbound side. I hope that makes sense, but basically, I got on from the eastbound side right as three cars were entering from the westbound side. One was some sort of orange sportyish car, and the other two were identical dark gray sedans. I don't remember exactly what make and model they were, but I remember them being fairly uncommon models, not a sedan you'd see a hundred times a day. One was in the front of this orange car, one behind. These guys were going at least 80 miles per hour. The orange car would change lanes and the car in front would cut him off while the one behind would change lanes to remain behind him. They kept this up the entire time I was on the highway near them, weaving in and out of cars, not slowing down before I pulled off at my exit. This could be a complete coincidence and some asshole drivers, but I definitely got the vibe that the driver of the orange car was trying to get away from the gray cars. Maybe it was extreme road rage, or maybe something more sinister. Regardless, I'll never know. I took my dog out for a hike on the Appalachian Trail, 
I keep her off leash so she can run around and sniff like crazy, but call her back when I see other people. She's incredibly friendly, has never barked or shown her teeth to anyone. She doesn't jump, so it's not a big deal to me if she says hello to someone. So, walking down the trail, I see a guy walking toward us. I call her back, put the leash on, move to the side to let this guy pass. My dog goes nuts. Her hair stands up and she shows her teeth. She growls and barks like never before or since. I've always wondered what she saw in this guy to do that. I assume he's a murderer walking the trail, leaving dead women behind. I went on a mountain hike in Transylvania with a group of friends from school, and way up, after maybe 12 to 14 kilometers of trekking, we saw a house. It was in the middle of nowhere. It had a barn with a few animals, a couple cows, chickens, and whatever else. As we got closer, we see a few people, a guy and five to six women. I'm not sure if there were more inside. The guy comes to greet us, barely speaking the language. We had a hard time understanding what he was saying. They lived without electricity, gas, or anything. This is in the early 90s, so there's no internet or mobile phones to worry about, at least for most people. Anyway, they all looked weird, kind of dumb expressions on their faces. We can barely understand each other. They asked us who the president was then and if we wanted some milk. They look at our clothes and shoes weirdly and curiously. Who knows when the last time they had human contact was, or maybe there were more crazies around those parts, but I don't know. I'm not sure to this day what was going on. It's not typical in the region, so we kind of freaked out, especially because this guy looked a bit disturbed and we were too young. We were looking around to see if there were more of them, Paranoia was getting to us, thinking there must be a village nearby. What was also weird is that all the women kept their distance and never got close to us. It was like he was guarding them or checking us out if it was safe for them. One of my friends kept saying we don't want their milk and we just need to go because it's getting dark. We walked calmly for a while and when we thought we were out of their sight, we bolted out of there like crazy. Needless to say, we camped after a few hours, and we always had one person awake to keep watch. We told people that were living in the villages near that area about the mountain people, and they didn't believe us. They said nobody lives up there in the mountains. I have had a few unsettling experiences in the woods, but this is unquestionably the strangest one. I have been mulling it over for years and still can't come up with a rational explanation. In 2018, my partner and I drove up to a national forest in Oregon for a day hike in early summer. The area was somewhat remote, but nothing too isolated. Hiking is huge in the Pacific Northwest so there are plenty of other people on these trails at any given time, especially during peak season. Because of this, we chose a less popular trail in the hopes of getting some alone time. It was an approximately six mile out and back moderate difficulty hike with a waterfall at the end. It followed a river and didn't intersect with any other trails. Simple enough, right? We were both experienced hikers in good physical condition so we had no reason to think we needed anything but day packs with a couple liters of water and sandwiches. Getting back before dark should have been a piece of cake. We set out sometime after noon. At first, we took it slow and meandered around the riverbank for a few minutes. I found a cool animal bone and we mused over what it might be. It was clearly a vertebra from a large mammal, so we guessed it was probably a deer bone. Because I'm a little morbid and like collecting things of that nature, I put it in my pack. That might not have anything to do with what happened next, but I feel like I should mention it since it was out of the ordinary. 
The hike to the waterfall was beautiful. We passed a few of the people on their way back to the trailhead, but for the most part, we had the place to ourselves. We stopped a few times to look at wildlife or take photos of flowers. I was tracking our progress on my Fitbit, so I always knew how many miles we traveled and how much time we had before sunset. We reached the waterfall at about 3.2 miles, which matched up with what the map had said. I paused my watch and we settled on a large boulder to rest and eat our lunch. Another young couple was there with their dog. We said hello and then minded our own business. Here's where everything went wrong. As we packed up our stuff and prepared to leave, my partner, Michael, slipped off the boulder and twisted his ankle badly. The other couple heard his surprised scream as he splashed into the water, so they rushed over to help. The three of us hauled him back to dry land and assessed the injury. None of us were doctors, but we thought it was a sprain. The swelling had already begun, and Michael said the pain was serious. He could barely stand. Upon realizing this, the male half of the couple started backing away and seemed anxious to leave. I asked him if he could go get help, but he didn't respond. Neither did his wife. They both just turned around and started booking it up the trail with the dog trotting behind them. I called out to them in frustration, but they didn't look back. Needless to say, we didn't have cell service that deep into the woods, so we couldn't contact anyone else. We had to hike back. It'll be okay, I said to Michael. It's only three miles. You can do this. We shifted the water bottles and our modest amount of gear into my pack so he wouldn't have to carry anything and made decent progress. I was still tracking the hike on my Fitbit. After about two miles, Michael ran out of steam and we rested again. I told him to lean on me to take the weight off of his injured ankle. Even though I'm a head shorter than him, it seemed to help. We're almost there, I said. Just one more mile. Despite the setback, we were in pretty high spirits. The sun was still up and the woods were still beautiful. We made light of our predicament. Michael joked that he can't do anything without getting hurt or breaking something, and I comforted him. We both thought the ordeal was nearly over. Eventually I realized we'd been walking longer than expected. I assumed it only felt that way because we were moving at a slower pace, but when I checked my watch, and saw that we'd gone farther than a mile. I started to worry. We were at 6.6 .6 miles total. That meant the way back to the trailhead was longer than the walk to the waterfall. That couldn't be right, but I figured I must have made a mistake at some point. Maybe I hadn't started the tracker until we'd already traveled a ways at the beginning. Regardless, the parking lot had to be around the next curve in the trail, but it wasn't. We went another half mile or so before stopping to assess the situation. Over seven total miles and we still weren't back. What the hell? I checked the map of our hike on the Fitbit app and saw that there weren't any gaps. It was a straight line from beginning to end, with the line doubled back on itself, indicating that we were on the same route. But where was the trailhead? We talked it over and concluded that it had to be a glitch. Michael was adamant that we hadn't passed the trailhead, and we couldn't have taken a wrong turn because there were no other trails. Plus, the scenery was all familiar. We saw things we remembered passing on our way to the waterfall. It was definitely the same trail and well-maintained too. A big, white dirt track that followed the river and didn't veer off into the undergrowth. Losing the trail was impossible. At that point, we started to feel demoralized, but what could we do except keep going? Our phone still didn't have service. Michael was in a lot of pain and struggled to put weight on his sprained ankle. It was twice the size of his other ankle. He was sweating. I was sweating. The whole thing started to feel like a nightmare. When we went another mile and still didn't reach the trailhead, we panicked. Night falls quickly in the forest, and we had little daylight left. We were almost out of water, had no rain gear or other food, and the only flashlights were the ones on our phones. Of course we cursed ourselves for not bringing more supplies, 
but we were only supposed to be out there for a few hours. It was just a short day hike, and we had no idea how it could have gone so wrong. Out of desperation, I yelled for help. We'd seen no people since that strange couple had abandoned us near the waterfall, but I was sure that we had to be close to the parking lot. That didn't mean there was anyone there, but we were both so freaked out, I was willing to make a fool of myself if it meant rescue. To our dismay, nobody answered. We were alone. In an attempt to get a grip, we reasoned that maybe we really had passed the trailhead we started at. Maybe we were so focused on keeping Michael off of his bad foot that we'd simply missed it and were hiking toward the next trailhead. We were pretty sure that wasn't the case, but it was also the only explanation that made sense. We were definitely still on the same trail, and though we couldn't be certain, it seemed like the landscape had changed. We no longer recognized any of the landmarks, and that seemed to support our theory that we'd gone too far. We knew we weren't walking in circles. That wasn't possible. Should we turn back? We mulled that over for a few minutes. If we were wrong, backtracking would guarantee spending a night in the woods. Michael couldn't deal with that ankle forever. We decided to press onward. I'm not crazy, right? I asked. That initial hike was only three miles. We went three miles to the waterfall. Yes, Michael agreed. The entire hike was supposed to be a little over six miles out and back. We've walked a lot farther than that. We should have gotten back a long time ago. I don't understand what's happening. When night fell, we picked up the pace. Michael stopped leaning on me and limped down the trail as fast as he could. He later said adrenaline dulled the pain of his injury and gave him the motivation to continue. That part of Oregon is mountain lion country and I just read about a lion attack a few weeks prior to our hike. Being caught out there in the dark was the absolute last thing we wanted, but there was nothing we could do about it. We were scared. Michael shone his phone light on the path ahead to make sure we didn't lose our footing, and I shone mine at the trees, scanning for cat eyes. I was crying. Fitbit said we'd hiked nine total miles. After 9.5 miles, we finally saw the sign for the trailhead and scrambled toward it. Relief didn't completely wash over me though, because I expected we'd have to either hitchhike back to where we started, or trudge along the side of the road for a few more miles. There was simply no way this could be THE trailhead. It was three miles past where we should have been. As we climbed the short set of steps up to the parking lot, sweaty, thirsty, exhausted, and completely unnerved, I hoped to see a car. My prayers were answered, but it was my car. We were at the same trailhead. For a moment, Michael and I stared in shock. Our fear and misery were replaced by sheer confusion, and we just stood there. Then a twig snapped somewhere in the woods behind us and broke the spell. We hurried across the parking lot towards the car, and in those few seconds, I felt an intense dread. The best way I can describe it is the feeling you get in a nightmare when something is pursuing you and you're trying to run away, but you're moving in slow motion, like your legs just won't cooperate, and you know the thing chasing you is going to catch up. This is the only time in my life I've ever felt that way outside of a dream. We managed to pile into the vehicle and peel out of the lot. I was shaking. Michael was rambling about time distortion and dehydration and how we must have lost our bearings somehow. We got out of the national forest and onto the highway, and it was a while before we encountered any other cars. I didn't fully relax until we made it back to civilization. Neither of us can figure out exactly what we'd experienced. Michael was on crutches for months following that incident and his ankle has never been the same. I still have the bone I found, but I keep it in a box because it gives me bad vibes. When we go hiking these days, we stick to the crowded trails. Whatever happened that day, we do not want it to ever happen again.
My name is Luke, and I'm 20 years old now. This story happened to me when I was 17. This experience still gives me chills to this day. In May 2017, I found myself going out a lot more on my mountain bike. I was getting bored of cruising around the streets, so I wanted to go for a trail-slash-woodland bike ride. I've never been to Lay Woods before then. Personally, I don't think I'll be going alone again. After some research into a few different areas, Lay Woods seemed to be my best bet. Living only a couple miles away, it was a nice bike ride. On arriving, it looked very peaceful, and I was almost in a dreamlike state by my first look at the place. For a woodland area in England, let alone Bristol, it was amazing. On going into the woods, I remembered seeing different colors at the start of each trail, signifying difficulty for bikers and length for walkers. So I decided to go down a colored trail to see how it was there. Finding it exciting, I decided to go down the harder trail, and now here's where it starts to get weird. I began having this weird sort of vision looking around, as if I'm being swallowed by the woodland. Everything felt like it was getting bigger and further away. I brushed it off, but it turns out I actually lost track of time. I got lost on the trail. Now, bear in mind I'm very observant and aware of my surroundings before this trail. I then came to a strange opening. I could go left in the rough direction of the way out, or right deeper into the woods. Me being me, I decided to go deeper into the woods. I came to a weird little trail that just had dodgy written all over it, metaphorically speaking. I went against my gut feeling of turning back, and I went down there. I came to a point of which the trail continued, but it was getting dangerous. The trail being too bumpy for me to even walk down, I then turned back. But for a few minutes before turning back, I don't know why but I was just stood still, staring down the trail. I felt like I was being watched from all angles, even though it would be near impossible to have that many eyes surrounding me in that area. I got nervous, and I began walking back up the hill as I was too tired to ride at this point. Keep in mind, my bike tires are completely solid. No punctures, slow punctures, or even anything wrong at all. Upon getting back to the spot where I originally went to the trail, that weird loss of time thing happened. It felt as if the whole path had stretched by half a mile, as if the woodland was moving. I began walking up the path, feeling that same eerie sensation of being watched as I did beforehand. This time, it felt a bit more sinister. It felt as if something was about to happen. Bearing in mind, I hadn't seen a single person at this point in time since I went down that first trail. I'll explain the scenery before continuing. It's a long path, a slight steep hill to my left, a very narrow river to my right, maybe four feet deep and four feet wide. Bushes are on the other side of the river with the odd tree every now and then. Upon getting a quarter of the way up the slowly inclining path, I hear a woman crying behind a tree up ahead. I start slowing down my pace to try and get a good look behind the tree, but the whole time I'm thinking to myself, why would someone jump across to cry behind a tree? So I edge closer to the river to look behind to see if this person is okay. Also, because many people go to lay woods to end themselves, so I was hoping to maybe help this person, but you guessed it, there's no one there and the crying stops. A bit weirded out, I just slowly turn away and start walking again, a bit quicker as I was unnerved at the time. I've had paranormal experiences before, but not usually in a place like the woods, usually in a house or some sort of building, so this was new to me. I had this sudden shiver as I was walking, and maybe a minute or so later, only a couple meters away from where I heard the crying, it started again. But this time, it was right opposite me across the river. I didn't bother looking. I started to go into a bit of a jog, and as I got faster, I heard the bushes rustling as if they or it was following me. 
Upon hearing this, I sped up, and the crying became more and more hysterical. Bear in mind, my bike was fine before this moment in time. I thought to myself, fuck this, I'm gone. I went to hop on my bike with the adrenaline that was rushing through me, and I came to almost a sudden stop. My back tire on my bike had become completely flat, so I had no other choice but to sprint with my bike and pray for the best that I don't trip up, or end up having to throw it to run faster. With the crying person still close to me and keeping up, I'm running faster and faster, praying I just get off this path that I was on. I had that feeling of wanting to cry, because I couldn't actually do anything to help the situation or get out of it faster. And after what felt like an hour, but in reality was probably only 5 or 10 minutes, I could see the car park. The crying had stopped following me and getting closer, and it started moving back down to where I first heard it. I sprinted out into the car park. I must have been white as a sheet of paper and hysterical with my breathing and wheezing, as multiple people in the car park turned and looked at me like I was crazy. I saw the exit sign out of the car park and ran towards it, and while doing so, I noticed my bike to be moving a lot smoother on approaching the car park exit. I couldn't believe that my bike tire had suddenly regained all of its air. It was solid again, as if it was before the unnerving crying person shenanigans. I jumped on my bike and got away from Lay Woods as fast as I could, and I haven't gone back there since, as every person I tell this story to becomes reluctant to go there with me, or any extra people. The thing that makes this scary is that I have Irish heritage. In Irish folklore, there's a demon woman called the Banshee. She's seen in the woodlands next to rivers and lakes washing blood off of clothes. It's said that if you see her washing blood off of clothes, the person who owns those clothes will die. Alternatively, if you hear her crying, it means death. I can't remember the meanings exactly of the deaths, but it means either you or a loved one will die. In 2017, I lost my aunt, two of my best friends, and a dog. Lay Woods is no joke. There are many stories to have come out of Lay Woods too. You can read online about them. Search up Lay Woods Bristol Haunting. It's rated 87th most haunted place in the UK, according to Higgy Pop. It's a popular spot for people in Bristol to end themselves, or it was at least. Even the ghost of Isambard Kingdom Brunel has been spotted there, looking over the suspension bridge, which he designed. I must clarify, this didn't happen only to me, but my uncle too. This was after a Christmas Eve party when everyone went home. I decided to stay because my cousin and I were watching a movie. My uncle, who used to walk his dogs in the wood next to a park, went off to take them out. Before this, my aunt told him to not do it because it was too dark out there. He didn't care much and he went off anyway. My aunt was still worried, so I went along with them. Once there, anything wrong seemed to happen. Everything was quiet. My uncle and his dogs were having a relaxing walk, as usual, and I wasn't really paying attention to the surroundings, when suddenly, the dogs went still. This wasn't that strange. They always stopped their way to stare and bark at other animals they noticed, like rats, birds, insects, or other dogs. However, this time was different. When the dogs got still, my uncle and I noticed something was going wrong. The dogs weren't angry or curious. They were kind of nervous, anxious, and afraid. One of the dogs, the largest one, was growling and shaking. As my uncle started to get worried about the situation, we heard it people in the woods. We didn't see how many because of the darkness, but they were saying something. We made out. We all gather here by blood of. We. 
and thee and I. As my uncle and I heard that, he yelled for his dogs to follow him out of the woods. As we left, he turned his head back and he saw a slight movement of branches and shrubs, perhaps because these peoples were trying to hide. After all that happened, he hasn't walked his dogs near those woods or even when it gets dark out. So me, my boyfriend, his best friend and his girlfriend drove up to Big Bear. Then a day later, another friend of ours drove up. He was supposed to sleep downstairs and couples sleep upstairs, since there's only two bedrooms. The first night we stayed there, it was kind of creepy because the cabin was pretty remote. And of course, there's absolutely no lights outside. It's the woods with coyotes howling and bears but nonetheless completely normal activity. On the night that our friend drove up at around 12 a.m., my boyfriend and I were in bed when suddenly our friend sleeping downstairs comes banging on the door, freaking out, saying he saw shadows in the woods and that the motion light came on and that there was thumping outside. We got a little freaked out, but my boyfriend gets out of bed and checks the entire cabin. He even goes outside nothing. We go up to the other couple's room where there's a porch with a sliding glass door that looks out into the woods. It's important to note that I'm a naturally very anxious and scared person while my boyfriend is a rock. He's calm and logical while I tend to jump to the worst case scenario. My boyfriend goes over to check the last place in the cabin so he pulls the curtain and jumps and yells, oh my god. At this point, I'm terrified. My boyfriend is a 180 pound CrossFit coach, and to see a big guy like that scared is nauseating. He locked the door and backed away slowly. He quietly says, There's a large man standing outside staring at us. He's just standing in the woods looking at us. At this point, I'm thinking he's messing with me. He looks at me and says, Go lock the door. That's when I knew he was serious. Everyone is freaking out. I run and lock the door behind us, and we all decide to stay in the room to keep an eye out. It's the middle of summer, and it's really hot, but we refuse to open a window. I'm so scared, but trying not to show it, as everyone else seemed to have calmed down. About 30 minutes go by, nothing happens. I get annoyed with the heat and the fact that there's five people in a tiny room and three of them are men, so my boyfriend and I go back to our room. I'm still pretty spooked, so my boyfriend tries to cheer me up. At this point, it's about 1.30 a.m. I told him I was too scared to sleep with the lights off. He tells me that it's totally fine and he understands, so we just lay with the lights completely on. Finally, I start drifting to sleep when I hear a thud. I sit up and look at my boyfriend. He looks at me. And then the power cuts. I immediately start sobbing. I'm trembling and I can't see anything because it's pitch black. I try to get out of bed and run, but my legs get tangled in the sheets and I fall. My boyfriend picks me up and we grab our phone and run to the other room where everyone else was staying. I'm hysterical at this point. I try to contact our host, but nothing will go through. I try to call my dad, but all of our phones say no service. We are alone out there. Thank God the friend who drove up after us had a different carrier, because his phone had one bar. So he calls the local sheriff. He's on the phone with them, and they transfer us to the utilities company. We give the address, and they tell us we're too far in the woods, and they... Don't cover that area. At this point, we're wondering if the entire area has no power, or if the man outside had just cut our power. I cry more and we call 911 to report suspicious activity and a power outage. They send the fire department. A few hours go by and it's 3am and suddenly the power comes back on. We fall asleep and the next day we talk to some of the locals of the area. 
We told him our power went out, and he said that was strange and shouldn't have happened. He told us the only reason that happens out there is because of a snowstorm. He said he couldn't explain it. So, to the man in the woods who might have got our power, let's not meet. This was very recent, 11 days ago to be exact. I'm a fan of hiking or just simply taking walks in the woods. The only time I go alone is when I'm in the woods I live near. This day I was not. I was with my friend Lars in a walk about 3 hours from my house. We were planning on traveling around and staying at motels in the meantime. That day we decided to take a walk in a popular area for people who like to walk in the woods like me. The catch was that these woods were huge. Not really bad to us though, we were thrilled. We escaped the crowd but every now and then we would see someone walking by. We walked for a while until we got to this spot, not too different from the rest, except for one thing, nobody else was around in this section. That's why me and Lars took this turn. After a while of walking down this path, we spotted a man, a naked man. We gave each other the look and turned around. The man was slightly off path, bent over and looking at something. As me and Lars were walking back, talking about the strange man, I heard a voice behind me. I turned to see the man. He was talking to us about the bug he picked up. I got a good look at him. He was a bit tall, nothing crazy, bald with a bit of brown hair beginning to grow, but completely naked. I flashed the man a smile and sped up. We got out of that place as fast as we could. Once we got to the car, we kind of laughed. Yes, it was creepy, but more weirdly funny. The car ride was nothing, so skip to the motel. As we're checking in the motel, we see the man walk in. He was a bit hard to recognize considering the fact that now he had clothes on, but they were torn up. He waited behind us in line. Good thing we were almost done checking in because as soon as we did, we went right to our room and locked it with no thought. Now it was definitely creepy. Was he following us or was it a coincidence? We both decided we weren't going to stay at this hotel for more than a night. Hell, I didn't want to stay one night if it weren't for Lars telling me it's okay. That night, Lars wanted to go outside for a cigarette. I don't smoke, but no way was I going to stay in this room alone. I followed him outside and we chatted for a bit. After a few minutes, I see the guy walk out the doors. Lars put out his cigarette and began to walk inside, but before we got in, the guy pulled out what was probably a knife or something else sharp, and he started carving through his sleeve and right at his arm. I saw liquid trickling to the ground, and I immediately knew it was blood. I rushed into the lobby and Lars got the idea and followed. We alerted the staff, but by the time they got someone to come out, he was gone. To this day, I still have so many questions. Did he follow us? Why was he naked? Why was he doing that to himself? I will probably never know the answer, but honestly, I'm still spooked. I don't know what to do if I see him again, but I hope I don't have to think about that. My childhood best friend, Marie and I, were around 11 and 12 years old at the time. Marie's family had their own campsite in a provincial park about two hours from our hometown. We would spend the entire summer each year living in the camper out there. This particular summer, I was able to go and stay with them for a week. We were excited to spend our time adventuring around the forest. On the last night I was there, we decided we wanted to hurry down to the ice cream shop by the lake before it closed. 
It was early evening at this point, still pretty bright out but beginning to lose light. The path we took was down a short slope right next to the main road with maybe 10 feet of thick brush and trees in between. On the other side was the forest with more tall, thick brush. So we were walking along, not seeing another person on the path in front or behind us. We hear a sudden rustling and snapping of branches, similar to the sound of maybe a deer moving through the woods. I wouldn't have thought anything of it, but then the sound of running footsteps follows. Marie glances back and suddenly grabs my arm, urging me under her breath not to look back. At the same time, the running stops. I don't know why I didn't ignore her and get a look myself. I guess I could sense the very real fear in her voice and chose to listen. We both start to panic, getting that feeling like when you're running up the stairs after turning the basement light off. We pick up speed as much as we can without breaking into a sprint, knowing that the ice cream shop is only about a minute walk away at this point. The path soon breaks and we're in the parking lot. Suddenly Marie steers me hard to the left, heading towards the lake in the boat rental instead of continuing straight to the ice cream shop. I go along with it silently. Understanding ice cream is no longer an interest right now. Marie is clearly panicking at this point. We're both looking around, but it seems whatever scared her is nowhere in sight at this point. Marie walks up to the boat rental and gets us a kayak. We climb in and begin to paddle out into the middle of the lake. As we paddle, she tells me that there was a man behind us and that the man had stopped running at us very abruptly upon making eye contact with her. He'd been wearing a long black coat with a hood up, despite it being the middle of July. He had a terrible smirk on his face, and she swore that as he stopped running, she saw him put something shiny away in his coat. He appeared to have just emerged out of the bushes after we walked past, given the sounds we heard right before he came running onto the path. We reached the center of the lake, and stop paddling. I pull out my Nokia brick phone that my parents had given me, thank God, just in case. I hand it to Marie and tell her to call her parents to come pick us up. As the phone rings, I see her look out past me to the shore, and she goes pale, lifting a hand to point out to what she's seeing. I turn, and there was a man stalking his way around the path that circled the edge of the lake, staring out at us. We sat in the middle of the lake and watched him do two full laps, never looking away from us before finally disappearing. It took us a few times to get a hold of her family. We were freaking out the whole time as the sun got lower and lower. We did manage to have someone come with the truck, but by the time we reached the shore, it was pretty dark out. I don't know what we would have done if we hadn't been able to call for a ride. Looking back, I don't know why we just didn't go up to the ice cream shop, inform an adult there, and ask her parents to come get us then. But it worked. We got back safe, and we thankfully never saw the man again. I'll preface this by saying we were 12 to 13 at the time, and my friend and I often snuck out of either of our houses during sleepovers for late night walks. This was the basis of this terrifying encounter, and it stopped us from ever sneaking out after dark again. My friend lived opposite a huge forest, so her house was the preferred choice to sneak out for us to roam around at night and we always took flashlights, food, and blankets so we could camp out for a couple of hours before going back home again. Well, on this fateful night, we inadvertently fell asleep instead of staying awake. 
so when my friend suddenly jolted me from sleep, it was past 3 a.m., a lot later than we usually snuck out. We grabbed our essentials and creeped out of the back door into the cold and dark night. Frost crunched underfoot as we crossed the deserted road, and as we reached the entrance to the forest, we noticed how pitch black and completely silent it was, unnervingly so. We turned on our torches and stepped onto the uneven path into the forest, the light illuminating the trees swaying in the icy wind. We stepped on fallen sodden leaves and bark as we made an unsteady but familiar way into our favorite part of the forest. Our cold breath, the only noise to invade the deafening silence. We reached the small hut we constructed one afternoon, made entirely of sticks purely for the purposes of having some shelter for our campouts. There were times that vandals or other kids damaged our hut, but for the most part it stayed intact. But on this occasion, it was completely destroyed, like a harbinger of worse to come. We were deciding just to call it a night and come back later on that day to repair the hut when we heard it. This loud, shrieking giggle that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. My friend and I jumped in shock and looked at each other like, what the fuck? We were completely freaked out. The eerie and unnatural giggle rang out again, contradicting the silence and making my body break out in goosebumps. Someone is in here, my friend whispered to me, looking utterly terrified. We have to go now. Her voice of rationale made it even more scary and unnerving to me that someone was in the forest with us at three o'clock in the morning. We just looked at each other in assent and took off running in unison, our footsteps navigating the path as naturally as we could from muscle memory our uneven gasps of air punctuating the giggling that seemed to be following us, getting closer and closer. Our torch's light went up and down with our fast movements, illuminating random patches of the trees and bushes as we finally saw a small sliver of light as we came to the forest entrance. Running out of the forest, we didn't stop until we reached the back door of my friend's house and almost collapsed in a breathless heap of relief to be safe. Then my friend's eyes went wide, and she nudged me, pointing a shaky finger across the road. A haggard woman of indeterminate age was standing at the forest entrance, giggling that awful, horrifying giggle, and was waving over at us. We screamed and ran inside, and looked out of my friend's bedroom window through the smallest gap in the curtain and we could still see the woman standing there. Worse yet, she was staring right at us, as if she knew we were there. We could tell she was still giggling that hideous, appalling laugh. She turned very slowly and walked back into the forest again. We never went back to that forest, nor went out after dark again. This happened to me when I was a teenager. I think it was the spring of 1998 when I was 14. My Boy Scout troop went hiking in the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas. I grew up in a very small town in Tennessee, and the boys in my troop were people I'd known my whole life, and we were all very close and knew each other very well and trusted each other. We'd been hiking for five days or so, and it was miserable. It rained every day, and we were all exhausted and sore and hungry and covered with blisters. The adults realized we'd bitten off more than we could chew in trying to hike a 60-mile trail, especially with the awful weather. So we changed course and gotten off the trail to spend a night in a drive-in campground. It was in a very remote area, far from a town or house. There may have been a few other small groups there, but if there were, we never interacted with them or saw any of them. We were all filthy and wet, and thus very excited about taking a hot shower. It was dark and we'd finished dinner. A group of five of my friends, including my friend Jeremy, 
headed up to the bathhouse, which was maybe a quarter mile walk through the pitch dark woods or up a worn down gravel walking trail. I stayed behind to clean up and after 10 or 15 minutes, followed them by myself. I had a weak little flashlight. I remember the woods were totally silent. When I got about halfway to the bathhouse, I heard a noise to my left and I looked over and saw my friend Jeremy standing by an old school manual water pump about 20 feet off of the trail. There was a strange light around him, like the moon had come out from behind the clouds. I was startled to see him there by himself in the woods off the trail. I asked him if he was already done with his shower. He seemed kind of sad and he said, yeah, it's all yours. And I said okay and didn't think much of it until I got to the bathhouse. When I walked in through the door, my friends were all in there and I heard Jeremy talking from in the shower. All the blood drained out of my head and all the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I had to sit down before I passed out. My friends were freaked out and wanted to know what was wrong. I told them what had happened. They nervously made jokes about how I must have been smoking pot, but I could tell they believed me. Like I said, we'd known each other forever and knew when one of us was exaggerating or playing a joke. We all waited together until everyone finished showering and brushing teeth and whatnot, and then walked back together in total silence. When we got to the spot I'd seen, whoever, he was gone without a trace. The water pump was there though. No one had noticed it before because it was a ways off the trail and obviously not in use. We got back to our campsite and went to bed freaked out. I remember not sleeping much that night. In all the years since then, I've never been able to figure out what happened. Was there a random teenage boy in the woods who looked just like my friend? Unlikely. Did I hallucinate it? Also unlikely. Who's to say? My friend from college told me a harrowing story that happened to her and her friends in high school. She's from Buffalo, New York, and often went on camping trips to local upstate campgrounds. When she was a senior, her and four of her friends went to a campsite fitted with rows of cabins on the water that people could rent. As the sun went down, the girls noticed that their neighbors a few cabins down were playing music and grooving around the campfire drinking beers. One of the guys asked them all if they wanted to join. When they got over there and started hanging with the guys, everything seemed completely normal and they were having a fun time. As the night progressed, one of the guys started to get blackout drunk and eventually pulled out a revolver that he said belonged to his dad. He started waving it around and playing with it. This obviously freaked everyone out, his own friends included. Eventually, he started pointing the gun to his head and laughing while his friends were yelling at him to put it away and how that wasn't funny. The girls at this point were fairly disturbed and told the guys that they should get back to their cabin and said their goodbyes. When they got back to the cabin, they all talked about how freaky that was and expressed concern for the drunk guy. They then moved on to other topics of conversation and forgot about it for the time being. A few hours later, Sometime in the middle of the night, they heard a loud bang coming from the direction of their neighbor's cabin. Shortly after this, a brigade of cop cars showed up to the scene. An officer went to my friend's cabin and started asking them questions about the cabin they visited earlier that night. When my friend asked the officer what happened, he explained that the kid had shot himself in the head in front of his friends. They weren't able to discern if he'd done it purposely or it was an accident. My friend to this day still has PTSD over this incident and explained that she rarely goes camping anymore.
My parents got divorced when I was 12, and my mum moved us into a small town in the Pennsylvania mountains. After a few months of living there, I went back to live with my dad in Texas. Ever since then though, I have heard these voices of people I know calling me into the woods. It's been almost eight years now. It's only when I'm alone, but not every time I'm alone, and it seems to only happen in Texas. It's weird, but I never even considered this was maybe something to be concerned about until recently. It was just something that happened. I even followed the voice once and only thought it was kind of weird that I had heard my dad screaming for me if he didn't actually call me because I got home later and asked him about it. I don't know if this is related or not, but remembering it is what sparked this post. A few years ago, I was about a mile out in the woods in Pennsylvania when I zoned out for a minute. When I zoned back in, I heard a stick snap and looked over to see a white tail doe staring at me from about 10-ish feet away. It looked almost as if it had been trying to sneak closer to me when I looked at it. I just sort of backed away from it and went back down the mountain. I'm not entirely sure what to make of this now that I'm looking back on all the times. I just sort of brushed it off as normal. This was about four or five-ish years ago. Back then I lived with my mother in a shed on a farm surrounded by woodland. Our farmland was part of a larger piece of farmland that was split up and sold off, so we did have neighbors although they were roughly half a kilometer away each. We loved that because of the privacy. It wasn't like there was nobody nearby I couldn't go to if I needed help. That thought is what had me fearlessly walking alone at night between the hours of 7 to 8 p.m., sometimes fluctuating from earlier to later depending on the day. Sometimes I even went out on a walk at 2 a.m. in the morning because I was restless and couldn't sleep. Looking back, this was incredibly stupid, and after this incident, I never walked after 6pm ever again, always making sure there was at least some sunlight when I set out. The route I always took was a road circuit. The first part was out in the open in front of all the other farms, including my own. If anything had happened, at least one person would have noticed, and reception was pretty good, so I would also have been able to call someone. The second half, on the other hand, was concealed by about 200 meters of woods between the farms and the back road, stretching the full two kilometers at the back of the farm, and it was during that part of the walk when I had this creepy encounter. It was late at night, I can't remember what time exactly, but it was pitch black with the exception of my torchlight. I was about to approach the turn in the loop that would bring me out into the open again when I heard it. Hell. It was this monotone voice that repeatedly asked for help. It didn't seem panicked in the least. I took my earphones out and turned my music off to make sure I was hearing correctly, but it didn't stop. Help. Help. A very stupid part of me almost responded because for some reason my first instinct was, oh no, someone's in trouble. Like a naive kid, even though I would have been like 16 or 17 at the time, of course then my brain kicked in, and I realized that approaching that voice was just about the stupidest thing I could do, so I started quietly backing away. Unfortunately, my cat had followed me on the walk and wasn't backing away with me. No, she was walking towards the voice, softly hissing. I remember desperately trying to get her to come back towards me without alerting the voice to my presence, just in case they hadn't noticed me yet. But I was getting scared and didn't want to stay there a moment more, so I ran towards my cat and grabbed her. I then turned around and bolted back towards my house. I don't know if it was stupid of me to turn my back to the voice as I was making so much noise while running that there was no way they didn't know I was there and I had no way of knowing if they were giving chase. I was so fucking terrified the whole time. The image of someone cloaked in the shadows chasing me entered my mind, 
and even though I couldn't hear anyone behind me, I never once slowed down until I was back safe and sound within my house. It doesn't end there though. Despite how terrifying it was, there was still a part of me that was concerned about whoever it was, because what if they really had needed help? So I asked my mother to drive us to the location. Another very stupid decision considering what we found. That being nothing. We called out and called out, but nobody answered. We didn't get out of the car though. Luckily, neither of us were that stupid. We drove home having seen nothing and no one. But it still bothered me in the morning, so I had my mother drive us over again and we searched the immediate area. Nothing. No indication that anyone had been there. There was no body, which admittedly was a drastic thing to search for. But I know shock can leave you eerily calm, which could have explained the monotone voice and lack of response afterwards. It made me fear that we'd been too late, and that we'd find a body in the morning. I don't know if I would have preferred this outcome, because at least I would have had a face to the voice. But no, we found absolutely nothing, and to this day, I have no idea who that voice belonged to and why they were monotonously calling out for help. My mind has naturally come to some chilling conclusions and theories that leave me unable to sleep at night. Maybe a kidnapper, serial killer, all the classic horror stories. But I guess I'll never really know for sure. Okay, so this happened when I was 17. My now fiancé and I lived in the mountains and used to smoke up green often at this point. We decided to go up our favorite parkway to smoke a bit. The parkway was a long road up a mountain, with more pull-offs to look either at more mountains or down at the city. We went to our favorite pull-off, which is about 25 minutes up the mountain. We smoked and hung out for a while. Unfortunately, we didn't realize how fast it was getting dark and the cold front was moving in. At that moment in time, I felt confident that I was sober enough to be able to drive without a problem, so we started heading our way down. Long story short, I found out real fast that I was overconfident and was still too high for this drive, so I asked my fiancé if I could stop at a pull-off and sober up a bit more, which he was perfectly fine with. So this is where the story starts. I pull off at the next one I see, and a car is already parked. We park about 15 feet away, and it happens so fast, I couldn't even get a full breath in. My fiancé says, What are they doing? And when I look over, the guy in the car looks like he's on top of someone. My fiancé said there was a girl in the car as well that I didn't see. The guy was in the passenger seat. What was really weird is that it honestly looked like he was choking the girl, but we couldn't tell. I mean, no judgment. Maybe it was something they were into, but our high minds were like, fuck that. I told my fiancé I was going to start driving, but it was going to be slow, so just bear with me. Again, unfortunately life always has other fucking plans. The pull-off we went into had one exactly across on the other side of the road, where we didn't see a black truck sitting there. Well, right when I was about to pull out, the truck was weirdly already waiting to pull out with his headlights off. And right when I pull out onto the road, he turns his lights on and is immediately on my bumper. At this point, I'm high as fuck freaking out, trying to just get down the mountain. Anyways, he followed me all the way down, not even backing up a bit. I get onto the highway and this truck is pulling in front of us, trying to get us to slow down, and the person keeps flickering their turn signals back and forth to get me to pull over. That happened for about two minutes before my fiancé says, slow down to 10 miles per hour, which is dangerous on a road like that. He had his own reason why he thought it was a good idea, I just don't remember. But once I did, the truck quickly sped away really fast. It didn't make any sense, and we now think there's a chance people could have been messing with us. 
I have no idea if us seeing a guy choking someone and then being followed were related, but it was weird. I definitely don't smoke and drive anymore. So this is a story my dad recently told me about my grandpa and his father. My grandpa grew up in very rural southern Indiana, but moved to very rural southern Illinois in his youth. So this takes place in Illinois. One night, my grandpa and his dad were hanging out at his uncle's who lived a couple of miles away. Keep in mind, this is the 40s out in the country, so all roads are just dirt basically. Anyway. It was pretty late so they decided to head home and they hopped into one of their old cars. They were going about 15 miles per hour through the wooded roads. At some point, as they're just driving and talking, they pass something along the edge of the road standing upright. They both hunted and were very familiar with any animals or other local people that may be around. Neither one of them really said anything for a minute and they both looked at each other and said, what the hell was that? My grandpa asked his dad, Do you want to turn around? And his dad said, No. And they kept on driving. My grandpa said it resembled a big owl or small person just standing in the ditch. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on a camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection and jumped into my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot and head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon a nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice beautiful spot to settle down. I'm exhausted at this point, but set up the tent to the southernmost edge of the clearing, next to the tree line and manage to get a fire going. I roast some weenies and start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounds like an animal, most likely a deer with a lame leg as it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I feel bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go and put it out of its misery. I think nothing of it after that and go about eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and insert myself into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep so I pull out a book I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing towards my tent. It's really loud at this point and it sounds like the hooves are being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops and I hear nothing, no breathing. I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and look into the clearing. Nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing just crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then woman's laughter and sticks snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing or just a product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other different directions, all different, i.e. men, old women, even children, and confirm that it's real. 
The noises are closing in, and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire a warning shot off in the air, in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier, and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge already, but then I noticed the nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line, saw nothing, listened intensely to my surroundings. No laughing and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that scared whoever off, I sat down and in my exhausted state I fell asleep. I wake up in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not too far from my tent. Alert, grab my rifle and listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost, so I shout, Hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again, Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly, a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck with my head over my shoulder the entire way. Never heard anyone follow me, never saw anyone or anything the whole way, but couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me like I left all my gear in the woods that night. I feel I should preface this story with a statement that I'm usually a skeptic when it comes to paranormal stories, albeit an open-minded one. I'd never had an experience I would truly say was paranormal until this one. I've searched for hours on Google, attempting to find a similar story from someone else, and have had no luck. What really stands out for me is that there's an energy or feeling that accompanies the experience and even remembering it still gives me this feeling and goosebumps. This is not something I normally experience, and most people that know me would probably be surprised that I would be spooked by much of anything. I am a veteran, and I've spent years since leaving the military working in emergency rooms, specialized security, and doing other high adrenaline jobs, and I am not prone to being creeped out. I'm hoping to find someone else who may have had a similar experience, as I feel oddly compelled to relate to someone about this. With that, here goes. A couple of months ago, I was driving with my wife down a rural highway in Oregon, returning home from a road trip to Crater Lake. We live on the coast, and the highway we were taking to get back is very curvy as it winds through the Cascade Mountain Range. It was dark as ink and probably about 11 p.m. We were driving along and I was just watching the road going about 45 miles per hour. We round a bend which makes me slow down to about 45 and just as we get around it, my wife suddenly says, Look out, there's a person there. It takes me a second for some reason as I let off the gas. Then I notice it, crouched near the side of this two-lane highway. On my left side is a person wearing what looks like grey baggy sweats or clothes and a reflective vest. This is an easy 20 miles either direction for civilization and is heavily wooded. Think Oregon Coast Forest. I begin braking and instantly the figure stands up, faces us, and begins jogging directly to the car. It felt like electricity in the air as when she faced us. Her head was flopped to the side, like her neck was totally limp, and her mouth was wide open. She appeared to have grey hair, and her arms and hands were held up to her chest. Her wrists curled. Her legs didn't seem to be working right either, as she hobbled at us. 
think like severe progressed MS. Then it hit, this primal-like feeling of dread, like my subconscious knew something wasn't right. I couldn't fully focus on her as the car was still moving and I had to steer, but my wife was looking right at her. My first thought normally would have been to hit the brakes and see what was going on, as once again this is literally miles and miles from town. But there was just this dread feeling in the air, and time almost seemed to slow down. At that moment, I hear my wife say, Don't stop, just go. Instinctively, I accelerated. As we sped up, this lady was jogging right at us and must have come within a foot of running into the side of our car as we went past her. We rounded the next bend, and I looked at my wife and just said, What the hell was that? I should turn around. Who the hell jogs out here? What was wrong with her neck? My wife just looks at me and says, No, don't go back. I don't know what that was. I told her I couldn't look directly at her for long as I was focused on the road but I described what I saw, and she confirmed she saw the same. She said when she came up to the side of the car, she was staring right at us, and my wife looked into her eyes, but she didn't have any pupils, and her expression was frozen with her mouth open. We scoured news stories, and I even contacted authorities. They advised no one was reported missing or heard out there. I still get this strange, intense, electrified feeling any time I think about her, as does my wife. Any time I talk about her, I'm compelled to refer to the person as it. All I know is it wasn't right. We have now coined her the floppy-headed jogger. Has anyone else experienced something like this? A few years ago, I was a university student in eastern Washington, but dating a girl in western Washington. I was visiting her for the weekend during the summer when we got into a huge fight at around midnight, and I left, deciding to head back to my apartment. I mention this for context as to why I was driving through Snoqualmie Pass after one in the morning. I'd never gone through this pass so late before, and what is usually a very busy stretch of freeway on I-90 was completely empty. I went well over an hour without seeing a single vehicle going either way, so naturally I was driving way too fast. At the time I had a 73 Chevy Nova. It wasn't quite the classic, but it had power and a complete lack of AC. Even though it was late at night, the combination of a warm summer night and the large amount of heat that bleeds through from the engine meant that I had my windows down and was sweating. Not far into the east side of the mountains, around 1.30, I hit a long stretch of straight road that doesn't have an on-ramp or any way to get into the freeway, when suddenly a set of headlights appeared behind me, something like 200 feet back. I glanced back at the lights, puzzled as to where the vehicle could have possibly come from. I noticed that, despite the fact that I was absolutely hauling, the lights were gaining on me. I decided to switch lanes and slow down a bit so it could pass. After a moment, the vehicle, now only half that distance, moved over behind me into the same lane. This is when I began to panic. I'm in the middle of nowhere, hadn't seen another vehicle in over an hour, and now I've got some aggressive drunk running up on me. I watched as those lights got closer. 60 feet, 50 feet. 40 feet. In seconds, it was upon me. I braced against the steering wheel, expecting to get rear-ended by a vehicle going much faster than me now. I watched in my rearview mirror in horror as those headlights blasted right into the back of my vehicle, and suddenly everything froze, quite literally. Nothing physical hit me, but the whole vehicle frosted over and I could see my breath. I hit the brakes and did my best to pull over, despite not being able to see through the windshield. Every hair on my body was standing on end. 
I got out of my vehicle and paced back and forth, examining my car which was already starting to defrost as streams of water poured down it. There was no damage to my back bumper and absolutely no sign of whatever vehicle had hit me. Eventually I calmed down enough to get back in the car and drive the rest of the way back, wake my roommates, and explain what had just happened. The next time I drove through that area in the daylight, right about where I think the ghost car had hit me, there was a very old wooden cross, somewhat overgrown, on the side of the road. I hope this isn't too vague a question. A couple of years ago, I did a bicycle tour from Eugene, Oregon to Lagunitas, California, just north of San Francisco. To save money, I typically would drag my rig into the woods of a nearby national forest and do dispersed camping for free. I was on a shoestring budget, to say the least. If you know the basic geography of that part of Oregon, you know I had to bike west from Eugene through the coastal range and meet the Pacific coast, which I would then follow to my final destination. However, once I reached the coast, in order to keep finding free camping, I would eventually have to venture inland into the woods most nights, sometimes as far as 15 miles. Now, I've spent a significant amount of times outdoors in remote areas out west and in the upper Midwest, where I was raised. I'm familiar with the sometimes eerie silence the woods can take on when you're truly in the middle of nowhere, or the heightened vigilance that setting brings on. However, I had never before felt an oppressive, dark, dreadful energy in my environment like I did alone in the woods of Southwest Oregon. The feeling of wrongness was a common occurrence when I stopped somewhere to evaluate a campsite. I often felt a strong sense of claustrophobia in those woods, and often felt that I was not alone. A strong sense of paranoia became a nightly feature on that leg of the trip, and my sleep schedule suffered considerably. Keep in mind, I was stone cold sober on this tour. Somehow, I powered on, and I never saw any sort of creature or entity but I still can't shake the feeling that there's something evil in those forests. Once again, I emphasize that I'm well-traveled in the US, experienced in the outdoors, and have never once felt that way anywhere else I have been. Years ago, I moved from a very small town to a remote valley out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by national forest and not many neighbors. It was just what I had always wanted. At that point in my life, I'd been a paramedic for about four or five years, and being an outdoorsy, civic-minded sort, I decided to volunteer my services with a local search and rescue organization. For being such a tiny, poorly funded organization, we were surprisingly busy. In the nine years I was with them, we'd have at least one rescue every weekend, spring through fall. The source of the majority of these calls was the roughly 100 miles of poorly maintained fire trails that were very popular with dirt bike and quad riders. When they'd inevitably get lost or wreck and get injured, we'd head out, track them down, provide medical care, and fly them out on a helicopter or put them on a Stokes basket mounted to a janky-ass trailer thing we'd pull with a quad. About two weeks after joining, and zero training beyond what I'd learned as a Boy Scout and medic, I got my first call. A group of dirt bikers from the city had lost a member of their party. For some reason, they'd put their least experienced rider at the back of the group of a dozen or so riders and took off into the woods. When they returned to the trailhead, Four hours later, the inexperienced guy was missing. They set out again and looked for him for four or five hours, then they gave up and called 911. The time interval from the initial 911 call 
until we had a squad assembled at the trailhead was pretty impressive. No more than 20 minutes, but we were already 8 or 9 hours behind the ball. We did a very quick briefing, distributed maps, divided into teams, then set off. They put me on a squad with the most experienced guy, and we headed out. The plan was, for each 2-3 to three person team, to take one of the longer trails that ring the place, then after searching those, we'd systematically work our way into the shorter, maze-like trails that made up the interior. This was to be a hasty search, none of that grid search shit, just riding around looking for clues. I don't know what I'd expected exactly, maybe a few dirt roads through the woods or something, but these trails were an absolute nightmare. They were extremely rugged, technical trails, where you really had to know what the fuck you were doing and where you were going, or you'd never make it out. GPS rarely worked due to the rugged terrain and tree cover. Radios and cell phones were a shit shoot, and the maps didn't account for all the random trails riders would just sort of make. The only marked roads were fire breaks, and mileage-wise, those accounted for maybe 10% of the trails. Why this guy hadn't been partnered with someone or put in the front of the group is a mystery. Four hours into this, I'm caked with mud, bleeding from being hit with branches, exhausted and just fucking done. We take a water break and hear broken radio traffic that sounds like a bike has been found, but no rider. It's only a couple of miles from us, so we head that direction. When we get there, the bike is off to the side of the road, along with the quads of the other teams, but we can see them a few hundred feet in the woods. We walk over and find them looking down at the missing person, who is very dead. Lips blue, skin dusky, arms spread out like a cross. On first glance, his eyes look to be wide open and solid white, but when I examined him, I could see that his eyes were actually covered with fly eggs. The guy had been dead for a while. It didn't make much sense though. His bike still had gas in it. He had water and food, and he was a healthy guy in his late 20s. Why was he dead? It looked like he'd simply laid his bike down, then ran into the woods to die. Mission accomplished, I guess. We wrapped him in blankets, then put him on the stokes and took him to the trailhead where a coroner was waiting. About a week later, I ran into the coroner and asked what the cause of death had been. The pathologist's determination was cardiac dysthymia second to extreme anxiety. The guy literally died of fright, which up until that point, I had always assumed was Hollywood bullshit. I've always wondered what was going through his head. Was he just afraid of the woods or being lost? If so, why did he run blindly into the woods instead of continuing to follow the trail? There's a part of me that thinks he may have seen something out there. I've heard a lot of stories about weird shit in these woods, and I've seen a few strange things myself, so it wouldn't surprise me. I hope you enjoyed that, guys. I want to give a special mention to Jay Nightmares for sourcing and translating some of these stories from Japanese. Check out his channel for more stories you haven't heard before. I'll put the link to his channel in the description. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos, as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Mary Wright, Callie Townsend, M, Deshaun Edmondson, Kimmy Love, Wendy Maris, Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Stephen Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Matt is a Felter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malaise, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, 
Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdowski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel De Luna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Coro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Kami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasp Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lily Pan, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyera, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Lainey, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, Pie Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanitix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Draco, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.